Chapter 13 Wednesday, 11 p.m. Nine days, eight hours until grand reopening. Income lost, $1,500. Rachel arrived back at the bakery after 11. She was so grateful to be on home turf, she almost wept. Too nervous to eat all night, her stomach now growled as she moved into the kitchen to snag frozen cookie dough or day-old bread. Unable to face the silence of her apartment, she tossed her purse and keys on the counter and pushed through the saloon doors. Switching on the light, she cringed at the chaos. A week ago she could locate any pot, pan, or spoon in this room. The kitchen had been her friend and her companion. Demanding and difficult at times, it was always here, waiting for her. Now the place was as much a stranger to her as she was to herself. She stepped around boxes and a circular saw and opened the stainless steel fridge to see bottles of wine and exotic cheeses. Jean-Paul, the invader, the one that didn't belong. Unable to find the cookie dough, she grabbed the wine and cheese, scrounged a Union Street Bakery mug, and sat on a stool by the sawhorse work table. She filled the mug full of wine, and as she raised it to her lips, she heard footsteps. Turning, she saw Jean-Paul, unlit cigarette dangling from his mouth, staring at her. He wore a worn brown leather jacket, jeans, and a black T-shirt and in his hand he held a mesh sack filled with fruits and vegetables. What are you doing here? She drank from the mug, enjoying the wine all the more because she'd taken it from him. In her mind, he'd taken her kitchen, so turnabout was fair play. Jean-Paul came and went as he pleased, much like a stray cat. Whether it was eleven o'clock at night or two in the morning on his day off, if he needed something, he appeared. You are up late. He glanced at his bottle, which she'd left on the counter, and set his bags beside it before grabbing a second mug. He filled his to the halfway point. You like my wine? She smiled. It's very nice. Grunting, he took a sip and nodded his approval. Life is too short to drink bad wine. She stared into the depths of her cup. Life is too short. But yet there are times when it drags on endlessly. He arched a brow. It slows when you allow it to dictate. If you are in charge, it does not dawdle. She lifted the mug to her lips and paused. Is it that way for you? Are you always in charge? I do not worry about fast or slow, in charge or not. I enjoy. He sipped his wine, and then from the sack pulled out a square of cheese wrapped in wax paper. He unwrapped it and then broke off a piece, which he offered to her. Rachel took the cheese and bit into it, Creamy and buttery, it all but melted in her mouth. Life is also too short for bad cheese. He held up his glass to her. Of course. A smile teased her lips. So what are you doing here? I came to work. I'm used to working at this time of night. Each night I arrive before my shift and enjoy a cafe or a wine and a bit of cheese. I think about the dough, and then when it's time to cook, I am ready. Jean-Paul had been working at the Union Street Bakery for over a month. His uncle, Henri, had been a family friend and bakery employee for over twenty years, and when Henri recently retired, he'd sent Jean-Paul. That had been enough for Daisy, who'd been in desperate need of a baker, no resume necessary. Rachel had been grateful for his hire, and resentful. He was yet another change in a life with too many changes. The wine eased the tension in her muscles and wiped away some of the awkwardness. 
Her curiosity about him grew. Have you heard from Henri recently? Jean-Paul shrugged. From what my mother says, he is well. Visits the local bakeries in Nice and complains about the quality of the baking. Says bakers today don't understand tradition. Rachel missed the old Frenchman. He'd been silent and stoic while he'd been here, but there'd been a steadiness about him that she'd not really appreciated until Mike died. Sounds like Henri. Has he asked about us? We have not spoken. I would have to ask my mother. They talk weakly. Please tell your mother I miss Henri. He studied her with dark eyes filled with interest. You and Henri were good friends? I can't say I knew him all that well. My dad hired him, and he barely spoke to any of us. But Dad always said Henri was a master in the kitchen. No one baked better than Henri. He tore off a piece of cheese for himself and took a measured bite, as if he were analyzing it. So, what are you doing here? There is no work for you this time of night. The question had Rachel wondering who owned this kitchen. Perhaps at this time of night it was Jean-Paul's, and the space shifted back to her control at four in the morning. Can't sleep. Thought I'd eat and maybe bake. But I forgot the kitchen had been pulled apart. You bake to relax. You'd think I wouldn't, but it soothes me. He shrugged as if the idea made perfect sense. And why do you need soothing? A long story. He swept his hand before him, as if reminding her they were two cooks in a non-working kitchen. I believe we have time. The wine warmed her and allowed a smile. I'd rather talk about you. He arched a brow. He didn't tell her no, nor did he invite a question. So, Jean-Paul, so French. Rachel sipped more wine, feeling bolder and more relaxed. So what are you going to do tonight? There is no bread to mix. Fixing the cracks in the wall, making it smooth before we paint. Rachel glanced in his direction toward the drywall. You are sanding? Yes. Ah. There'd be no cooking here tonight, and she knew nothing of carpentry. It made sense for her to leave and go to her apartment. Tomorrow would be a long day, and she'd need all her sleep. But a restless energy churned her gut, and she sensed if she laid her head on her pillow, her mind would swirl with all the what-ifs birthed tonight with Simon. I think I will clean out the spices. No sense restocking what is old. He studied her as he sipped his wine. It is a job that can wait, don't you think? Not so good to have spices mixing with drywall dust. Rachel frowned. He made sense, of course, but she didn't want to go to her apartment. She could find Daisy, but her sister had looked exhausted and no doubt had fallen asleep. Without the kitchen, without Mike, and without the girls, what would she do with her time? I could help you sand. His gaze slid over her. You are dressed for the evening, not work. I could put on an apron. Again a sly smile quirked. You are so desperate to be with me. You will sand walls in the middle of the night? Heat rushed to her cheeks. I am not desperate to be with you. He set down his cup and shrugged off his jacket. Lean muscles rippled under a snug T-shirt as he walked toward the door and with great care hung his jacket on a hook. He moved like a cat that liked to be admired and petted. Rachel stared at his butt and broad shoulders, built by years of manual labor. Even as she imagined touching those shoulders, her mind scurried to a safe topic. Will the wall be ready to paint soon? Her voice cracked. She cleared her throat. The freezer arrives day after tomorrow. He turned as if sensing her gaze on him. 
For a moment, dark eyes held hers. In the mocha depths, she saw raw sexual energy. It will be dry by tomorrow, and I will paint tomorrow night, and then your new freezer will have its place. Her mouth grew as dry as stale flour. Ah, why are you so dressed up? Is it for me? Rachel straightened, embarrassed because she couldn't stop ogling. She reached for her wine, lifted it to her lips, and then thought better of having more. I had a date tonight. He arched a brow, curious now. Ah, a date. What man took you out? His proprietary tone thrilled and intrigued her. Simon Davenport. He folded those lean, muscled arms over his chest as if posturing. He is a client, no? A very good client. He did not seem impressed. So where did this Simon take you? She traced the rim of her cup. The wine festival. He studied her. And the date was not to your liking? A small shrug lifted her shoulders. It wasn't bad. A sudden memory flashed in her mind. No, it was bad. So very bad. Dark brows rose. Why? Was he terrible to you? Oh, no. God, no. He was the perfect gentleman. I, however, was a mess. I couldn't stop talking about the girls and Mike. She closed her eyes as if trying to will away a memory. I could hear myself talking about my dead husband, and the little voice in my head told me to shut up, but I couldn't. He leaned a fraction closer, his gaze settling on her mouth. And what did this Simon say? He barely spoke. He listened because I couldn't stop talking. I know I bored him to tears. I know he was so grateful to drop me off and run as far away from me as he could. He studied her a beat. Did he kiss you? What? Heat burned her cheeks. No. Jean-Paul grunted. Rachel leaned toward him. What does that mean? Is that bad or good? He shrugged. I would have kissed you. A laugh startled from her. You'd have kissed me, knowing I was a blathering idiot much like I am now. He unfolded his arms and picked up her hand. Slowly he traced her palm. You are a very beautiful idiot. She frowned, not sure if she should be mad or pleased. But as he continued to trace her palm with his calloused fingertip, her thoughts scattered and ran like frightened rabbits, leaving her alone with a forgotten sensation in the pit of her belly. It had been so long since Rachel had been kissed or been held by a man, so long since she'd lost herself in an embrace and given in to pure sensation. Simon had been utterly polite when all she'd wanted him to do was take charge of the conversation as Mike would have. But he hadn't. He'd simply listened as she dithered. Jean-Paul raised her hand to his lips, and he kissed her palm. As much as logic told her to pull away, she didn't. She liked being touched, liked the sexual need growing and the fact that in that moment she could melt into the floor from wanting. Jean-Paul kissed her palm again, and then he kissed her wrist and the crease at her elbow. She kept her gaze on him, not sure if she fully trusted herself or him. Of herself, she feared she'd lose her nerve and hide. Of him, she feared he'd stop. He shifted, tugged her arm until she stepped toward him and they were less than an inch apart. Their lips did not touch, but barely a whisper separated them. Kiss me, he said. She wasn't expecting words, and had to shift her brain back to conscious thought so she could speak. What? Kiss me. If he'd ordered her to alter a recipe, or change her menu, 
she'd have argued with great passion. But he wasn't asking about ingredients or baked goods. He wanted her to kiss him. Her heart thundered so hard in her chest she feared it would burst free. She was so scared, so unsure, and so wanting this moment. And he was Jean-Paul, confident, patient, and waiting. Finally, she moistened her lips, leaned in, and touched her lips to his. It was a feather-soft touch, maybe not an official kiss, but skin did touch skin. He put his hand at the base of her neck and pressed her close until her lips flattened against his. As they did so, he opened his mouth and teased the underside of her top lip with his tongue. She opened her mouth, awkward and unsure, as if she'd been transported back to high school, the last time she'd known such unexplained and terrifying wonder. Rachel leaned into the kiss, moved to deepen. She wrapped her arms around his neck. She didn't know where this was going, and she did not care. And that's when she heard the kitchen door open and Daisy say, Really? Really? What are you doing? Rachel froze, stiffened. She was mortified. Jean-Paul, relaxed as if he did not have a care in the world, looked at Daisy. Isn't it clear? I am kissing your sister. From Rachel's apartment refrigerator, I grabbed eggs and butter and set them on the counter. They really need to be room temperature, Rachel said as she sipped her mug of wine. I've never been good at waiting. I can cheat the butter a bit in the microwave, and the eggs will have to find a way to blend cold. Patience is a must. Mise en place. Everything in its place. It's a lesson Dad grilled into me since I could stand on a stool beside him in the kitchen. No matter how reckless or rushed, I took the time to line up the sugar, vanilla, salt, baking powder, and nuts. When I came down the stairs to ask Rachel about Simon, I'd have bet a paycheck I'd never have found her in an embrace with Jean-Paul. Their kiss was so not mise en place. You didn't look so patient when you were kissing the baker. What was that about? She stared into the depths of her mug. I'm not really sure. I unwrapped a pound of butter, dropped it in a ceramic dish, and popped it in the microwave. I pressed the 30-second button. This cheat required I pay attention. Too many times I'd walked away thinking the butter would simply soften, and when I returned it was a pure liquid. Still delicious, but unusable for cookies. And so I stood close, watching the butter turn in circles and soften. At 23 seconds I pulled it out. Seven seconds separated usable butter from liquid. Seven seconds standing between success and failure. But then, bakers lived their lives on the margin. Profits were slim, hard won, the difference found in scraps of dough or slivers of bread. Want to tell me about it? Her cheeks still glowed a light pink. Not much to tell. It just happened. I measured brown sugar and dumped it into the butter. How did the date with Simon go? Terrible. I paused as I reached for a wooden spoon. Was he rude? No, he was sweet. I kept rambling about Mike and the kids. I could hear the words coming out of my mouth, but I couldn't stop them. With the spoon, I mixed my cookie dough as Jenna might have. It didn't take long, mixing the dough by hand, before my arms started to ache. I'd grown strong since I'd returned to the bakery, but like everyone, I relied on the machines to do the heavy mixing and blending. So are you going to see him again? I said. Simon? I arched a brow. One man at a time. That coaxed a grin. I doubt Simon's interested. I creamed the batter faster. How can you be sure? I called him Mike. Twice. I winced. Okay. Well, you did break the ice. 
You wondered what it would be like to date, and now you know. Sometimes good, sometimes very awkward. That's good. Glancing at Jenna's careful handwriting, I measured out vanilla and cinnamon. After mixing more, I measured the dry ingredients and sifted them together into a separate bowl before spooning one-third into the wet ingredients. So, about Jean-Paul? I have no idea where that came from. He came up to me, asked me if Simon had kissed me, and the next thing I know I'm kissing him. She shook her head. It was a one-time event, never again. Feeling sorry for myself after my date. It's okay if it happens more than once, Rachel. You are a big girl. Her eyes widened. He's our baker. So was Mike. And you don't see the parallel? I think this is a little too close to the past to be right. Panic turned her normally calm voice shrill. Mike and Jean-Paul are night and day. I don't know Jean-Paul well enough to know. But he is a baker, and he works here. Rachel buried her face in her hands. Dating is so damn much work. Grinning, I nudged her arm. But you must admit, this day was pretty memorable. She shook her head. Many more days like today, and I'll have a nervous breakdown. The bakery's front doorbell buzzed. I glanced at the clock. It's midnight. Rachel's eyes widened. Do you think it's Simon? Could be. Groaning, she held up her hands. I am not here. I have moved to Africa. Chuckling, I wiped my hands. I'll check it out. Should I say you are in Kenya or the Sudan? Funny. She peered toward the window in her living room that overlooked Union Street. Who comes to the bakery at this hour? Jean-Paul is working in the kitchen. Someone must have seen the light. Still, she said as she rose, people do not visit the bakery at midnight. I tossed my rag on the counter. Suppliers? A customer? A neighbor? Could be an emergency. I'll go see. Not alone. I'll come with. What if it's Simon? Then I'll run. As we moved toward the first floor, I heard Jean-Paul speaking to another man. The voice was too clipped and deep to be Simon. As I rounded the corner and saw our visitor, my mouth dropped and my belly tightened. Gordon. When I didn't move, Rachel laid her hand on my shoulder. He is not here for me. Now it was my turn to worry and entertain thoughts of running. He might be. No. This drama is all yours. I'm happy to sit this one out. She pushed gently. Go talk to him. I descended the remaining stairs into the kitchen and pushed through the saloon doors. Jean-Paul had flipped on the lights, softening the buttery yellow on the walls. The soothing glow did little for my uneasy nerves. Jean-Paul glanced at Rachel, his gaze lingering just a split second and then he turned and disappeared back into his kitchen. Rachel scurried back up the stairs, leaving me alone with Gordon. Coward. The exterior light above the entrance shined on Gordon as he stood by the front door. His hands shoved in his jeans pockets. He wore a gray, short-sleeved T-shirt and sneakers. Despite a downcast gaze, I could see he looked exhausted. Why? Hadn't it ever been easy for us? I moistened my lips and pushed my hands through my hair. Hey. He looked up and I got a good look at the dark circles hanging under his eyes. Once again, I'd upended his life. I saw your light on and took a chance you were in the kitchen. Jean-Paul is working late. He frowned. Did I wake you? No. Rachel and I were trying out a recipe upstairs. We found a recipe box in one of the walls. Weird. It's turning out to be a very interesting story. I was blathering just as Rachel had done with Simon. His gaze sharpened. I didn't come here to talk about recipes, Daisy. 
smoothing hands over my pants, I shrugged. No, I suppose not. Can I come in? Sure. I stepped aside and led him into the shop and then locked the door behind him. He glanced around the shop. I like the color. A quip came to mind. So you came to talk about paint colors? But I forced myself to stay silent. Thanks. The place needed a little brightening. The construction in the back is nearly done, too. Soon as our electrical inspection gets done, we'll be installing the freezer, and the wine arrives early next week. No doubt we'll be stocking shelves and baking all week to be ready for the opening next Saturday. Is all that work good for... He stopped, flattening his lips into a grim line. The baby. Is it good for the baby? So far, so good with the kids. The doc says she's fine, and I'm on target for a Christmas due date. Might as well get the difficult details out of the way. The frown lines in his forehead deepened. For a moment, he didn't speak. So you know it's a girl? Girl? No. I don't know for sure one way or the other, but I've been saying her for the last few days. Makes sense, I guess. Christmas isn't the best time for a baker to have a baby. No, it is not. But first, I have to get the renovation finished before I freak out about that. I did hire a couple of kids to help in the afternoons. Good. More heavy silence settled between us. Each of us had so much emotion needing a voice, but neither of us could find the words. I don't know what you want me to say, Gordon. I'm sorry doesn't come close. This kid is so unexpected, but she's here to stay. I know that sucks for you. I do. If you'd knocked up another woman during our breakup, I'm not sure how charitable I'd be. He swallowed. I get you didn't intend this. I understand you didn't cheat. But it still hurts? Yeah, it hurts. His gaze lowered to my belly, hidden under the oversized T-shirt, and then back up to my face. I'm sorry. You deserve a much less complicated woman than me. You really do. He pulled his shoulders back. I expect complications from you. I might not like them, but I know they are part of the package. This complication is a whopper. It is. I care a lot about you, Gordon. I've even used the L word. A sigh shuddered through me. I understand we won't survive this as a couple, but I'd like us to at least be friends. He swept back his bangs with his hand. Have you told the baby's father about your pregnancy? No. One can of worms at a time. He rattled change in his pocket. Are you going to tell him? I nodded. I have to, Gordon. It wouldn't be fair to the kid not to. Roger isn't father material, Daisy. I know. But the kid has his DNA. And DNA is kind of important, especially when you don't have access to it. DNA doesn't make a parent. I know. But DNA is an important piece of the puzzle. I should know. How could I make him understand? He could trace his family back to the Revolutionary War. Terry has yet to return my emails or phone messages about my birth father. Whoever the guy is who got Terry pregnant, he is not your dad. I know. I have a great dad, the best, and a great mom. But this guy is a piece of my puzzle. I thought I could live with pieces missing, but since the kid, I want to know what's lurking in the genetic family tree. Whoever this dude is, he's part of the kid. So what are you going to do if Roger wants in your life? Jealousy had crept in between the words, and it pleased me. I wanted Gordon to want me. I wanted him to say the L word back. I wanted him to hold me and tell me it would all work out. That we would work out. 
Roger will not want back in my life. What if he does? I glimpsed the tenacity that had allowed him to rise in the financial world. It's irrelevant. I don't want Roger back in my life, period. End of story. He was an unfortunate waste of time that wouldn't have happened if I'd been remotely sober. He nodded. Okay. I press fingertips to my head. I'd been so full of energy a half hour ago, and now fatigue taxed heavily on my shoulders. The kid chose that moment to do a full somersault in my gut. The sudden move had my eyes widening and my hand slipping to my stomach. Concern widened his eyes. You all right? The kid moved. I'm not sure what made me reach for his hand, but I did. I unfurled his fisted fingers and laid his palm flat against my rounding belly. His touch warmed my skin and sent my heartbeat racing. For a moment we just stood there, both of us shocked to be so close and touching in such an intimate way. The kid had been touchy about moving on command, and I didn't expect her to jump to action now. She was difficult, like her old lady. But every so often I stepped up to the plate and helped out when no one expected it. I hoped the kid would take pity and do the same for me now. And she did. She kicked hard against my belly and the palm of his hand as if she wanted him to know she was also a part of this conversation. Did you feel that? He said, no missing the amazement in his voice. Oh, yeah. The kick caught me right in the ribs. His hand remained on my stomach. Has she been moving much? Just started today. I like the feel of his warm hand on my belly. It felt right, and so natural. Like this is what a million other couples had done millions of times before. I wanted him to kiss me, to celebrate the child, but I didn't dare. This sweet moment rested on a shaky foundation of surprise and politeness, not of a shared child or a bright future. As if reading my thoughts, Gordon pulled his hand back, curled his fingers into a fist at his side and straightened. I'm glad she's all right. Thanks. Silence settled between us, and for a moment the awkwardness rose up again. Gordon cleared his voice. So you are going to call Roger. More like email. And honestly, I'd rather deliver the news via the Internet, give him a chance to scream and rant, and then talk to him over the phone. He drew in a breath. You don't have to tell him, Daisy. I know Roger. He's a dick. That jostled free a laugh. You don't have to tell me. I know. But I need to tell him. Why? Like I said before, it's all about DNA. The kid has a right to know. He shook his head. The child has a right to a family. Parents who love her. My hackles rose. I intend to give her a family. How? You're barely making it now. A baker works long damn hours. Where's a kid going to fit into the mix? Raising my chin, I swallowed my doubts. There will be a space for her. Rachel said she'd help. Have you told your mom and dad? Not yet. They are out of town with the twins. I'm going to tell them when they get back. I'm surprised your mom didn't pick up on this. I've been living in large T-shirts and wearing aprons all the time, and she's been busy with Dad. He's been back and forth to the heart doctor. He doing all right? Yeah, he says he feels great. It takes more work to keep him on track health-wise. The baby is going to be a shock. Hey, you don't have to tell me. I can list all the ways I've effed up because I didn't control my reproductive system, but the problem is not going anywhere. He studied my face as if trying to peel back layers. You couldn't have done this two years ago. You'd have taken a different route an easier solution. I'd like to think I'd have gone through with the pregnancy even then, but you're right. I don't know if I could have done it. 
As much as it pains me to know Roger was the man to get you pregnant, I know you'll be a good mother, Daisy. Before I could think, tears welled, and I was swiping away tears. Thanks, Gordon. That really is sweet. He paled. I didn't mean to make you cry. My laugh sounded sloppy. I'm a bit emotional these days. Moody. He arched an amused brow. You? Moody? I can't believe that. Laughter made me cry more. Would you give me a hug? I know it's messed up between us, but I could use a hug. He hesitated a moment and then opened his arms wide. I stepped into his embrace and hugged my arms tight around his body. Carefully, as if I were made of china, he held me close. I inhaled his scent, savoring the subtle blend of soap and the faint aroma of bike oil. I'd not realized how deep my loneliness had burrowed. Having him hold me now tempted to make my knees buckle. God, I've missed you, he whispered. I've missed you. The words all but rushed past my lips, as if refusing to be stopped or censored. On the bike trip, when you didn't call? I could feel trouble. And then when you told me about the baby, I was so angry. I nestled my face close to his chest. I'm sorry. I'm not angry at you. I'm angry the baby's not mine. When we were together, you weren't ready for us to have a baby, but I was. I sniffed back tears. Our timing has been one disaster after another. He pulled back, cupped my face in his hands, and kissed me on the lips. He tasted sweet and salty and better than he'd tasted before. I wrapped my arms around his neck and kissed him hard on the lips. I can be ham-fisted with words and have a talent for messing up the right line. But I could pour all my unspoken feelings into a kiss. I hoped I could show him how I wanted him and not Roger. I pressed my body against his, knowing if he gave me the slightest hint he wanted me now, we'd end up in bed. Instead of pulling me deeper into his arms, he broke the embrace and looked me directly in the eye. Don't tell him, Daisy. For a moment I blinked. My lips left swollen and parted. A moment passed before my brain clicked back online. Don't tell Roger. His hand slid to my shoulders and his fingers tightened, as if he held on for courage. Don't tell Roger. I'll help you with the baby. I'll be the father. We'll pretend Roger never happened. I didn't pull free, also knowing I didn't have the courage in this moment to stand alone. What he was saying, the solution he offered, would fix all my problems. I'd have a partner. The kid would have a real dad. I'd have a safety net. The cost for this very perfect life would be to deny the kid its DNA. Sweep Roger and all his chromosomes under the rug and forget. Forget him. Tears welled in my eyes. I want to give you what you want right now. God, how I want to give this to you. He frowned. But you won't. Emotion clogged my throat. Why was love so hard? It's not about what I want. I need to think about the kid. Frustration deepened the frown lines on his forehead. That's who I'm thinking about. I know. But information like this doesn't stay buried forever. We might think we'd be fooling the kid, but it would come out. Somehow. Who else knows about Roger? Rachel knows the story. She'll keep the secret. Secret. Such a little secret now. Barely consequential. But it would grow with each passing year. The baby would notice she didn't look like Gordon. 
she might realize they didn't have the same sense of humor or their ears were shaped differently or her hair was too curly like Roger's. She'd eventually ask, Who do I look like? And then I'd have to look her in the eye and lie. That's no way to parent. I know your heart is in the right place, but one day the kid is going to put two and two together. She's mine, after all, and curiosity is buried deep in her DNA. I have to be honest with her about how she was made. Why? To lie about where she comes from is as good as saying she's not good enough. Daisy, that's bullshit. You are reading far more into this. I was the adopted kid. I know how it feels to be out of step. You were abandoned at age three. You suffered trauma. From day one, this kid will have real parents who love her. I traced his jawline with my thumb. I really believe you'd love her like she were flesh and blood. I would. I can't lie to her. I have to tell Roger. I can't keep secrets because they come home to roost. One day, the kid would put the pieces together and resent the hell out of me and you. He stepped back and rubbed a tense hand against the back of his neck. So, you are saying no to me. I'm saying yes to being honest with my kid. Your kid. She could be ours, with Pencil Dick Roger in the mix. His eyes narrowed. You know why the son of a bitch went to China. Yeah, he took the job over there because he's running from a hell of a lawsuit. The guy lied more times than I can count. I didn't know. Shit, Daisy. If your goal was to pick the biggest piece of slime to go down on, then you found him. Great job. His verbal sting had me racing past hurt and annoyance and straight to really pissed off. Why don't you stop while you're behind and leave? Sad eyes darkened with anger. That's always your solution, isn't it, Daisy? To kick someone out or run. You never stay and fight. Fight for what? More insults? My voice reverberated off sunny yellow walls. Stand your ground, and don't be such a coward. People do get mad at each other without running. You aren't mad, I said, my voice rising. You are being an ass. You insulted me, and yet it's my fault I want you to leave. He jabbed tense fingers through his hair. Look, I was over the line, but I have a right to be angry. You don't have a right to speak to me the way you did. The saloon doors slammed open, and Jean-Paul appeared in the doorway, casually holding a hammer in his hand. He looked at Gordon, his gaze fairly menacing. Is there a problem? I stepped back from Gordon, my hands trembling as I held them up. I'm fine. We were having a fight. Yes, I could hear, Jean-Paul said. I imagine you also upset your sister. Gordon shoved out a breath. Go back to your kitchen and let us finish. Jean-Paul didn't move. I think not. Daisy. Gordon ground out. I understood Gordon was hurt and upset. He'd offered what he saw as one hell of an olive branch, and I'd all but slapped it out of his hand. But I didn't take rejection well on a good, non-pregnant day and his reckless words still rattled painfully in my head. Go, Gordon. This is not the time to have this kind of conversation. When is the best time? I don't know if there is a best time. But I can't stand here and be insulted. Look, I am sorry. His brusque tone didn't help his case. So am I. We are two well-meaning people who can't seem to get it right. So you are giving up? Right now, yes. My life is eggshells, Gordon. I don't have the reserves to look after your emotions, the babies, and mine. I barely have enough for the kid and me. His lips flattened. Fine. Have it your way. 
and he turned, fists clenched, and stalked out of the shop. Chapter 14 Friday, 8 a.m. Eight days until grand reopening. Income lost, $1,700. Rachel and I had retreated to the basement, putting together the shelves that would stock our new wine collection. Jean-Paul had finished prepping the walls and was painting upstairs. The inspector, Mr. Fraser, had come early and inspected Jean-Paul's electrical work and given it the official thumbs up. The movers had yet to come and haul the baking equipment to the main floor, but Jean-Paul had assured me we'd have the basement cleared before the wine arrived. We were inching forward. I'm a linear thinker, and I like to tackle one task at a time. Multitasking had never been my strong suit, but I was learning if I didn't multitask, the bakery would close. It required someone who could keep juggling lots of balls. The shelves were black and sleek and had been on sale, but deciphering the instructions threatened to drive me to drink, swear, or scream. These don't make sense to me. I can see why these shelves were such a deal, Rachel muttered. She looked panicked as she stared at the collection of screws laid out on the white sheet. I'd insisted on the sheet knowing I'd crack if we lost a screw or a bolt. I choose to believe if we follow the steps correctly, we'll have shelves. Too bad life doesn't work that way. Smiling, I reread the third section. So, I think I have it. You hold boards A and B, and I will connect with bolt one. Which ones are board A and B? The farthest board on the right is A. We read from left to right, so I arrange from left to right. Rachel nodded and picked up the boards. If you ever really want to punish me, put me in a room with one of these to assemble. I'll remember that. She held the boards together so they formed a long L. Board B is backward, I said. Frowning, she studied the setup. How can you tell? Because the sign facing me says back, not front. She studied the instructions shook her head, and flipped the board around. Right. This went on for another hour. For the most part, it went smoothly. Once I attached a board backward and Rachel caught it, muttering words, I unscrewed the fastener and reattached it. When we finished the first set of shelves, both of us stood back to admire the work. The shelf was seven feet tall, black, and had vertical slots that held the wine. Against the basement's brick wall, it looked kind of cool, and for the first time in a couple of days I thought maybe all of this might really come together. Three to go, I said. Rachel groaned. Kill me. It should get easier. She brushed back a stray curl. From your lips to God's ears. And so we tackled the second set of shelves, which took half the time to assemble. More progress. At least this one small part of my life was under control. We've got this. Rachel offered a tentative smile. You have jinxed us. We'll be fine. I needed to master these shelves. I needed something to go really right. A little control, please? The third set of shelves was missing three screws, which I had to steal from the fourth set. When the third set was complete, I studied the fourth incomplete box. We know we're missing screws from the top section, so we know we can at least build two-thirds of the shelf. And then what? If Jean-Paul can't rig a fix, I'll have to make a run for the hardware store. Great. Rachel held boards A and B in an L shape, so how was your meeting with Gordon last night? She'd not asked, so I'd pretended it had never happened. Not too well. I screwed in the first fastener. Maybe if I could make the pieces of the shelves fit, I could reassemble my life without having to borrow pieces or rig joints. I didn't exactly listen at the door. 
she said. But I heard the tension in his voice, and yours. She held up the next set of boards, while I repeated with fasteners. Gaze on the screws, I maintained a steady tone of voice. I'm fairly sure I blew my life out of the water. Why? I focused on twisting the screw into place. My voice was barely a whisper. He said he'd be the baby's father. He said we didn't need to tell Roger, the bio dad, and we could raise the baby ourselves. Rachel paused. Daisy, do you realize what he was saying to you? Emotion choked my throat. Yes. She studied my face. So why did he sound mad? A sigh shuddered from my chest. I said I had to tell Roger about the baby. I couldn't keep a secret like that. She nodded slowly. We'd been together since we were three, and though we didn't always agree, we knew each other very well. He was pretty mad. He doesn't understand why I need to tell Roger. A bemused bark of a laugh escaped. I can't say I understand. Maybe if I knew who my biological father was, I could let this go. But I can't deny the kid what has been denied me. You've not heard from Terry. I arched a brow. She's playing games again. I shook my head. I don't think she means to be cruel. I think dealing with me and her past is hard. The admission stung deeper than I thought, and for a moment I stared at the screwdriver in my hand. Rachel put her arm around my shoulders and hugged me close. I shrugged off her embrace, pretty sure I'd cry if she hugged me. And this she understood, too. It wasn't the first time I'd run from comfort. We finished assembling the first section bringing the last set of shelves up to my hips. Do we still have that order with Simon? She arched a brow. He hasn't cancelled it, and cancelling would not be his style. He is a gentleman. So, you're going to have to see him when we make the delivery. No, you're making the delivery. I will bake, but I will not go see him. Not yet. Rachel. You cannot be a baby about this. You are going to have to go do the delivery. I can't do it alone. She pouted a little. I don't want to. I could give you a list of all the things I don't want to do, but I won't bore you. Running a bakery isn't for sissies. Her frown deepened. If Mike weren't dead, I think I'd kill him right now. He said we'd be together forever, and he lied. He didn't mean it, Rachel. Her blue eyes blazed with anger. I don't give a shit. He left, period, end of story. In the last 18 months, Rachel had kept a stiff upper lip. But that lip had quivered a lot lately, and frankly I was glad. No way you could take a hit like she did and not feel gutted. You are supposed to be angry, I said. Why the hell do I have to be angry? I don't like being angry, she shouted. Because you've got to get pissed to move forward. You've been angry all your life, Daisy. Where has it gotten you? I sat back, stunned. I wasn't sure if I should be hurt, amused, or angry. Rachel's eyes widened. I'm sorry, Daisy. I didn't mean it. I shook my head, deciding on amused. You are right. I've been angry for a long time. I sighed. I don't want you to end up like me, which is why venting emotion is good. Bottle it up like me, and the anger will burrow bone deep. She blinked. Are you that angry? Some days, yes. Some days, no. You aren't wired like I am. Happy is your style. Happy. I'm not sure what happy feels like anymore. It will return. When? 
No cute wisecrack came to mind. I don't know. We finished the shelves, a heavy silence hanging between us as we brooded over our own worries. Despite all the trouble, the black shelving looked very sharp against the ancient stone wall. Clear out the debris, add wine bottles to the shelves, we'd have our own wine room. Damn, I said. This is coming together, Rachel. She folded her arms over her chest, studied the arrangement, and shrugged. It looks pretty good. I nudged her with my elbow. And it's going to look great when the wine arrives. We will turn a nice profit on those wines. We are making this work. She stuck out her bottom lip. Maybe. Maybe my ass. This is happening, Rachel. The squeal of little voices and the thunder of excited feet had us both looking toward the stairs. Sounds like the girls, Rachel said. Yeah. I'd bet Mom and Dad would last three days. Rachel had bet two. They surprised us both by making it five. Hopefully they haven't killed Mom and Dad. I better go check. She bounded up the stairs, the spring returning to her step. She'd missed her girls. I rose and followed. We found Jean-Paul showing Mom, Dad, and the girls our progress. Mom and Dad both looked a little pale. Mom didn't wear any makeup, and her blue T-shirt was stained with something purple. Dad hadn't shaved in a couple of days, and his shirt was inside out. They both looked like a truck had hit them. But the girls were dressed in rumpled blue shorts and matching yellow T-shirts that read, Outer Banks Rocks, which were no doubt a souvenir from their gemstone rock adventure. Their ponytails were askew, but they were giggling and jumping with energy. Hey, Rachel said. Mom, the girls squealed as they ran to Rachel. She hugged them close, kissing one as they talked excitedly about their trip. Dad nodded in my direction as he scanned the new buttery yellow. Looking good, Daisy. Coming together. I like the yellow. His approval made me smile. We're getting there, Dad. Rachel removed Ellie's crooked ponytail, smoothed her hair with her fingers, and then refastened it with the hair tie. Wait until you see the kitchen. Jean-Paul's gaze flickered briefly to Rachel, but he gave no hint of what had happened last night. Rachel blushed ever so slightly. However, I sensed awareness between the two that made the air crackle. I will give you a tour, Monsieur McCray, Jean-Paul said. Please, follow me. Dad nodded, his gaze now alight with interest. He glanced toward me, and I nodded for them to continue. Lead the way. As Dad and Jean-Paul left for the kitchen, Mom crossed and gave me a tight hug. She pulled me close, and then for a split second her body stiffened. She pulled back, and her gaze dropped to my belly. Daisy Sheila McRae. I smiled, sheepish. She frowned. Her hand slid to my stomach, as if she needed to confirm her thought. Surprise? She closed her eyes for a moment. Why don't we have a chat in your room? No avoiding this conversation. I'd not really worried about telling Mom about the baby, but now that crunch time had arrived, I wasn't so sure of myself. Sure. Frank? Daisy and I are going to catch up. Rachel has the girls. No missing the relief in Dad's gaze as he nodded and headed into the kitchen. See you in a bit. Rachel glanced over the head of the girls at me. She raised a brow as if to offer help, but I waved her away as I followed Mom up to the third floor. When I closed my door, her gaze narrowed. You are pregnant. I shoved out a breath. Yeah. She rubbed her temple with the tips of her fingers. How did you manage this? Would you like a play-by-play? -play? Don't be smart, Daisy Sheila. I know how you managed it. Start with when, and then maybe who? The night before I returned to the bakery, 
Call it a memento of my going away party. Daisy, you are thirty-four years old, and I taught all you girls about the birds and the bees. Having this kind of lecture from my mom rankled, but I deserved it. Stuff happens. I didn't plan it, and believe me, I've been in a state of shock. She glanced at my belly. How long have you known? About a week. I didn't catch on right away, and chalk the difference up to stress. She sighed, clearly frustrated she'd missed it as well. Mom prided herself on keeping her finger on the pulse of the family. So, that flu you had the last couple of weeks? Delayed morning sickness. Seems morning sickness can come at any time in the pregnancy, and I'm here to say it doesn't occur only in the morning, but can linger all day long. Mom shook her head, a hint of sympathy softening her features. It was that way when I carried Margaret. She made me sick as a dog. Well, my kid is doing the same to me. I rubbed the back of my neck. How'd you get through it? I look back and wonder how I did do it all. Your dad and I had only been married months. I was still adjusting to working in the bakery, and your grandmother wasn't crazy about me. And then I found out I was pregnant. It didn't occur to me my pregnancy experience could mirror Mom's. So what did you do? A lot of ginger ale and crackers behind the counter. And I just kept putting one foot in front of the other. What did Dad say? I think he was terrified and excited. We were barely making it. And soon we'd have another mouth to feed. I groaned. I'm feeling the same way. Scared. Sick and worried. You are Dad and me rolled into one. She patted me on the shoulder. But you are the strongest of us all, Daisy. And you are not alone. You've the McRae clan, as imperfect as we are, behind you. Love and gratitude tightened my chest. The kid and I are going to need you. The kid? Her eyes softened. I didn't think you wanted children. I didn't. But I'm growing fond of this kid. Mom placed her hand on my belly. Round and hard. There was no missing the fact that it was a baby bump. When are you due? Christmas. She laughed. Oh, dear. That'll make for a hectic season. Unable to read her tone, I was suddenly unsure. I'm sorry about all this. I thought I had a handle on my life. She shook her head, an amused look in her eyes. Sometimes... Good luck comes disguised as disaster, Daisy. And then a smile brightened her eyes. I've missed having a baby in the house. It'll be nice. Tears filled my eyes. I'd not realized how much I needed to hear her say she was happy about the kid. You're not mad? Honey, I've been in your shoes. Granted, I was married, but I didn't plan on getting pregnant with Margaret so soon. But after Dad and I got over the shock, we felt more and more protective of her. After a week of knowing I was pregnant, I'd have been devastated if I lost her. That's how I feel. Mom grinned. Oh, you wait. She's going to take over your heart. You won't know what hit you when this child arrives. I swiped away a tear. Thanks. Mom frowned as she stared at my belly. Gordon is not the father. When my gaze turned from weepy to surprised, she arched a brow. I wasn't born yesterday, Daisy. I get you were having sex when you were in Washington. And from what you've told me, you and Gordon weren't seeing each other at all then. No, we were not. Have you told him? Gordon or the birth father? Both? Yes, to Gordon. She smoothed a stray lock of hair out of my eyes. How did it go? I shook my head. 
feeling the weight of Gordon's disappointment. About as badly as you can imagine. He told me to get out. Mom frowned. That doesn't sound like Gordon. If the shoe were on the other foot, I'd have thrown sharp metal objects at him. She patted my hand. That I would expect from you. A faltering smile faded quickly. He came by last night. He said he'd be the baby's father if I didn't contact the birth father. She didn't speak. Mom had navigated the emotional minefield of my adoption for over thirty years. Her gut reaction would have been to agree with Gordon. But, like Rachel, she knew me. Knew my old lingering frustrations about heritage. Judging by your red eyes, I'd say you said no. I understand his offer was made out of a generous love. I do. But I couldn't make that kind of promise. I couldn't lie to my kid for the rest of her life. Mom's eyes widened. Her? I keep saying her, but I don't know for sure. She smiled. I like the idea of another girl. Another me? A laugh burst from Mom. I'd never wish you away. I'm glad you were in my life. But I gave you a few gray hairs. One or two. And I think I now stutter sometimes. She teased. And now you're about to meet Daisy Part Two. The lightness in my voice did not match the tension in my gut. She squeezed my hands. We survived Daisy Part One. And seeing as I'm the grandmother of Daisy Two, I get to do the fun stuff. You get to do all the heavy lifting. The weight of that comment settled squarely on my shoulders. Mom, I don't want to fuck this up. Language, Daisy. Her gaze softened. And you aren't going to mess up. You are going to be a good mother. All my insecurities rushed up and tightened in my throat. Are you sure, Mom? I don't have a strong genetic history where motherhood is concerned. Terry abandoned me. Mom's lips flattened. I knew she didn't like Terry, but had kept her thoughts to herself for my benefit. Terry? was seventeen when you were born. She had a drug problem and no family. You can't compare yourself to her. Mom cleared her throat. And from what you've said, she's parenting her two younger children well enough. The comment had been meant to soothe, but it fueled my anxiety. Why wasn't I good enough to keep? Mom wrapped her arms around me. You were good enough. She just had too many problems. I've tried to hold my tongue where Terry is concerned, but you need to understand the flaw was in her, not you. Dark fears lurking in the back of my mind elbowed their way to the front. What if it's in me? What if I inherited it? Mom shook her head, frustrated I'd ask such a question. To her, the answer seemed obvious, but not to me. When Daddy got sick ten years ago, which of you three girls did the vigil at the hospital? We were all there. Mom shook her head. One of my girls barely left his side. Which one was that? Me. And when the bakery ran into trouble four years ago, who gave Daddy the money to give to Mike? I'd written one hell of a large check, which had about wiped out my savings. But it had been easy, because I was making a lot of money, and had thought the good times would go forever. Mom shook her head. A lot of kids would have shrugged and said, not my problem. You didn't, Daisy. And when I asked you to come back to the bakery, what happened? Was this when you got me drunk? Mom shrugged, no hint of apology. What happened? I came back with a terrible hangover. And when you sobered up, you could have backed out? She squeezed my hands. My point is, Daisy, you are not a runner or a quitter. You stay and fight. You have for this family, and you will for this baby. 
How can you be sure? She shoved out an exasperated breath. Daisy, your biggest weakness is your lack of confidence. I've done all I can to instill it in you, but there is a deep fear in you that I can't reach. You need to get to the root of it so you can find some peace. Yeah, I guess. Damn it, kid. You're going to drive me to drink. Have you called Terry? What has she said about you being pregnant? She hasn't said. I've sent her emails, but no response. I was mad the last time I sent mine and got a little bitchy. Good. She owes you answers, Daisy. I want to know who my birth father is, Mom. That's fair. Whoever he is, he is part of the equation. She sat back. And speaking of fathers, we need to tell your father. Butterflies gnawed at my gut. I worried about Mom's reaction, but Dad's really troubled me. He and I were wired alike. We thought alike. Got along well when we weren't clashing heads. And the thought of seeing the disappointment on his face upset me. I didn't want Dad to be disappointed in me. Why don't you tell him? You were really good at smoothing over the rough spots with Dad. Mom shook her head. Oh, no. This little gem is yours to share. But if you want me to be with you, I can sit by your side while you tell him. Crap. When was this pregnancy going to get easy? No. I can tell Dad by myself. Footsteps sounded as we heard Dad say, Tell Dad what? Chapter 15 Friday, 9 a.m. Eight days until grand reopening. Income lost, $1,750. Dad's gaze held no hint of worry as it moved between Mom and me. Mom rose. Frank, give Daisy a minute. Dad frowned as he studied me. What's wrong? I smiled but didn't rise feeling the need to camouflage my belly before I told him the news. Dad, meet me in the basement in fifteen minutes. He studied my face. This about the teenagers you hired? Rachel told me they start in a couple of days. I've got an item or two I want to run past you. He shook his head. Is this about the wine? Jean-Paul told me. Is there a problem with the renovation? I balanced my tone between perky and serious. Knowing too much in either direction would arouse more suspicion. Actually, it's going pretty well. He arched a brow. What's wrong? City inspector problems? No, we got our electrical inspections and I've applied for a liquor license. We are good. I can show you the numbers. He studied me a beat longer and then looked at my mother. She nodded her head toward the door. See you in fifteen minutes. I tossed him a thumbs up. Great. Mom and Dad left me alone and I rose, tugging the t-shirt over my belly. I washed my face, brushed my hair, and headed down the stairs. As I passed Rachel's apartment, I heard the girls giggling and Rachel talking to them with her calm, patient voice. I envied how soft and kind she sounded with them. All her words were wrapped in fur and cotton. No hard edges. Ellie was like her mother. She was the gentle one. Anna was more like me, always questioning, pushing. Anna's clear voice rose above her mother's and sister's. But I don't like blue icing. I like pink icing. Nobody eats blue icing. I eat blue icing, Ellie said. You are dumb, Anna shot back. Rachel's rebuff was quick, but so gently spoken I couldn't make it out. My sister had said more than once she wasn't perfect, but when it came to mothering, she was pretty darn flawless. I hoped I did as well. Heading to the first floor, I passed Jean-Paul, who had begun to paint the new wall a stark white, after my quick wave went unacknowledged by him, I moved down the stairs. 
In the basement, I took a moment to admire the shelves that had nearly driven me insane. Assembled and in place, it was hard to believe they'd been such a job. I smoothed my hand over a sleek black shelf, and in that moment the kid kicked me in the ribs. Smiling, I lowered my hand to my belly. An odd energy whooshed around me. My head swirled and my heart beat a little faster. Uneasy excitement hummed over my skin, and the world upstairs faded away. Can you go home? No, not like this. They wouldn't understand. And the baby's father? Can he help? I've written him. Soft weeping echoed. He wants to help, but he can't right now. And as quick as the energy came, it vanished. And I stood in the basement alone with the sounds of the ceiling above creaking as Jean-Paul moved around the kitchen. I glanced around the stone walls, half expecting to hear or feel a message. But as the seconds ticked by, I heard nothing. This bakery was old and had a vibe all its own. I'd grown up with its creaks and whispers and for the most part had ignored them. But since my return months ago, the place all but pulsated with energy. I wondered if the bakery had changed, or if pregnancy had changed my frequency and made me more susceptible. Find him. Was this some kind of haunting? I'd always thought a haunting came with a bit more fanfare. I figured chains rattled or curtains rustled, but all I was getting were whispers, just as easily imagined as heard. Find him. Find who? And then, without skipping a beat, Jenna's name came to mind. Again, was it my imagination? Or a real answer? I couldn't say. And yet, I knew. Find him. Jenna wanted my attention. She wanted me to find him. But who was him? I heard a creak on the stairs and straightened, thinking it was Dad. But as the seconds passed and Dad didn't show, I shoved out a tense breath. Dad wasn't stupid. He'd lived with Mom during two pregnancies. He'd figured it out, but didn't know how to talk to me. I could sit here and wait for him to gather his nerve, or I could go to him. If Mohammed won't come to the mountain, then the mountain would go to him. I found Dad in his workshop in the basement of the house. The dark room was crammed full of every kind of broken appliance you could imagine. Since his retirement, Dad had fancied himself a handyman who could fix any appliance. Why buy it new, when the old one worked well enough after a few tweaks? So far, the jury was still out on his newly acquired skills. He leaned over a toaster, looking as if it had been gutted of its wires and circuits. He picked up a screw, but it slipped out of his hand and fell between the ruts of his workbench. Damn it to hell. So this is not a good time, I said. He glanced sharply up at me. Daisy, Sheila McRae. He rarely used my entire name. This wasn't going to go well. Hey, Daddy. Don't you daddy me. You say daddy when you're in trouble. A tentative grin curled the edges of my lips. Well, that's about where I am right now. He looked at me, his expression a mixture of anger and frustration. How the heck did you manage it? We don't need a lesson in mechanics now. Not what I mean. He tossed his screwdriver on the bench. You are my smart one. You are the one who thinks through every move. I missed a couple of key details. You sure did, young lady. He glanced at my rounding belly, flushed, and looked back at his gutted toaster. What am I going to do with you? His tone triggered faint memories of when I'd been sixteen and dented the fender of the delivery van. Now, 
like then. I needed him not to be angry, but to tell me he loved me. Babies do at Christmas. Dad shook his head. Your mother told me. He sniffed and planted his hand on his hip. She says you think it's a girl. I do. Your mother was like that when she was pregnant with your sisters. Knew she had girls both times. Moving a step closer, I sighed. She told you about Gordon? Yeah. I shoved my hands through my hair. You must admit when I make a mistake, I don't do it halfway. He shook his head. Not funny, Daisy. If I'm not laughing, Dad, I'd be crying. This is so huge, I don't know how to wrap my brain around it. Shit, a baby. His scowl softened, and for a moment he stared at his toaster. Finally, he laid down his screwdriver, faced me, and held out his arms. I went quickly into his embrace and cried. All the emotions and fears swirling inside of me rose to the surface and wouldn't be ignored. I'm sorry, Dad. Don't be sorry, monkey. We'll figure this out, one way or another. I lingered another beat before I pushed away. I'll make this work. We all will. He handed me a tissue box he kept on the shelf. So, what about the father? In China, not father material. Don't hold out hope. Even if lightning struck him, and he had a sudden personality shift and offered to marry me, I wouldn't. Not much of a man. Man enough to get you into this mess. I coughed. Right. Well, beyond that, he's not worth much. He shook his head. You sure it's a girl? I don't have evidence. Just a feeling. So it could be a boy? Hope clung to each word. The lone man in a house of women held out hope for another male. Yeah, I suppose. I'm holding out for a boy. Could use a little more testosterone around this house. Well, we'll see what Mother Nature comes up with. I studied his well-lined face. So we are good? Yeah, we're good. He shook his head. I guess I'd best get up in that attic soon and find that old cradle that belonged to your grandmother. I don't remember a cradle. Margaret and Rachel slept in it. You were too big by the time you came along, and I didn't pull it out when the twins were born. Now I'll dust it off and fix it up for my grandson. Dad, I really think it's a girl. He waved me away. Let an old man dream. Leaving his house, my step was lighter. My clan was behind me, meaning the baby and I would be fine. When I arrived back at the bakery, Rachel met me at the front door. The delivery man is here with the wine. Gus's wine? She wiped her hands on her apron. One and the same. By the looks, there is a lot of it. Yeah, I bought them out. Is he parked in the alley? In the process of parking, and wants to know where you want the boxes. I glanced at the shelves, slid in the last piece still in my hands. Have him bring them. We'll put them on the shelves. Then we can clear out the boxes. Her eyes brightened, and I knew having the girls back had calmed her. Daisy, it's more progress. I smiled. I think you are right. By the way, I thought you were spending time with the girls. She held up a baby monitor. They fell asleep on the couch watching their Barbie princess video. Barbie is watching the girls. Rachel shrugged. She's done it before. She winked. Actually, I highly recommend her if you're ever in a pinch. She's reasonable, and the girls love her. Knowing Rachel needed Barbie every so often lifted my spirits. Even perfect moms had their tricks of the trade. Yeah, but she's so pretty, and her hip-to-waist ratio 
doesn't seem right. I'm hearing laughter and good humor in your voice. She cocked a brow. The parents gave you a stay of execution? I blew out a breath. They did. Her gaze bored into me. They take it okay? Nodding, I ran my fingers through my hair. Yeah. Very cool. She grinned, wide and bright. See? It's all going to be fine. I held up my hands. Don't jinx me. The delivery man arrived minutes later and studied the low ceiling, the bakery equipment pushed close to the brick oven. It would be a tight fit until we moved the equipment upstairs. Shaking his head, the delivery man turned and headed back up the stairs to get the boxes. Rachel and I broke into the first box. We quickly fell into a system where she pulled wine bottles out of the crate, handed them to me, and I loaded them on the shelves. Slow and deliberate progress, but we were making our way fast enough that when the delivery man returned, we gave him the empties to take upstairs on his return. Hey, I'm not here to take out the trash, he complained. I could have argued, but I didn't have the time or energy. Instead, I played the girl card and smoothed my hand over my rounding belly. Look, dude, I'm pregnant. Can you help me out? His frown softened. Yeah, sure. As he headed back up the stairs, I glanced at Rachel and whispered, Do pregnant bellies have a magic power? She giggled. Wait until you are really showing. People will be nice to you even when you act like, well, you. I laughed, not able to deny I could be one hell of a hard case when I was on a roll. Upstairs, Anna's giggles drifted through the floorboards. Rachel paused, held up a finger, and then a second later Ellie screamed, Stop it! Barbie is falling down on the job, I said. Rachel headed toward the stairs. She promised me forty-seven minutes of quiet. Better get your money back. No! Jean-Paul's voice was quick and sharp. In my kitchen. We act like grown-ups, or you will go to the basement with the women. Rachel glanced over her shoulder at me. I'm not sure I like the way he linked basement and women. Yeah like our fate is not one to be envied. A second later, there was silence. Rachel went upstairs to check on the three and came back within seconds. Jean-Paul has the girls polishing dishes with rags. And they are doing it? With smiles on their faces. Looks like Barbie has competition. We continued with the wine bottles. I nestled several bottles in an alcove, I thought I'd dig up info about Jenna. Rachel ripped open a new box, paused, and handed more boxes to the delivery man. She smiled at him. He smiled back, his gaze openly appreciative. When he was gone, I said, Really? Don't you have enough going on with Jean-Paul and Simon? Rachel laughed as she pulled out two wine bottles and handed them to me. I hope this tastes good. Jean-Paul says it does. And you trust him? I trust him not to drink bad wine. Nodding, she handed me the bottles. So, any luck with Jenna? Not so many answers as questions. I've been thinking about the newspaper article I read, survived by her infant son. What do you want to know about Jenna? For starters, where is she buried? And what happened to her infant son? And who was the baby's father? Tex Margaret. You'd think I could do this on my own without running to her each time. Rachel shrugged. Yeah, you could do it on your own, or you could beat your head against a wall. Might be more fun. I stuck my tongue out at her. Hilarious. Besides, if Margaret's on the job, we can bake those cookies for Simon's party, which is Monday. Do you think we'll have the oven to the first floor by tomorrow? The electrical is done. She nodded toward the stove, now shoved in the basement corner. 
Jean-Paul says he's called his friends, but no answer if they'll be here or when. They can't give a time. Daisy, it's free help. Beggars can't be choosers. She glanced toward the ceiling. Besides, he's done right by us so far. I'm sorry? Did I hear you correctly? I know, I didn't like him when I first met him, but he's growing on me. He's good with the girls, and he's kind of made this place his own. He kind of kissed you like he was a man starved for a woman's touch. She offered a goofy grin. Yeah, he did. Let me remind you, you've shared one kiss with him. I know. Remember how Mike slipped into the family without anyone really noticing? A frown furrowed her brow. He is not Mike. No, he is not. I'm not looking for a replacement for Mike, Rachel said. You sure? I mean, old Jean-Paul up there is kind of cute, can bake like a god, and he likes the girls. And you did kiss him like you were just as starved. It would be easy to fall for him. A wistful smile touched her face. I'm not falling for anyone. Not even Simon? Simon's from a different world, Daisy. He and I barely speak the same language. I doubt he remembers my name after the date from hell. I don't know. He could be worth a second chance. I'd be willing, but I'm not so sure about him. You'll never know if you don't ask. Instead of a quick no, Rachel nodded, as if she'd considered the idea herself. As we continued to work, and Rachel chattered about the girls, my mind wandered to finding Jenna. Before, I'd been vaguely curious, but now I had the sense time was running out. Tick-tock, find Jenna, find him, whoever he was. Irritated, I pulled my cell from my back pocket and texted Margaret the request. Asking Margaret? Rachel asked. Yes. Have you told her you're pregnant? Rachel said. Not yet. Why not? I don't want her to come back here. She needs to do her iron coffin adventure and find dead bodies. You mean she escaped the bakery and you don't want to pull her back? This place has a way of pulling us all back. I never mind it. It's different with Margaret. What about you? It sure was different with me at one time. Still could be again, I guess. But for now, this is where I belong. She smiled. Tell Margaret. You'll find a way to keep her away. And she hates being out of the loop, Daisy. I reached for my phone, and I texted... What did you say? I finished with BTW. I'm four months pregnant and you are still fired. Amusement danced in her gaze. That's it? I don't want her getting any warm, fuzzy feelings for me. She needs to stay where she is. Rachel giggled. Oh, Daisy, you do love Margaret. If you ever tell her I was looking out for her own good, I will bake you into a pie. I'd love to see her face when she reads the text. The rain started minutes after six. The wine bottles had been loaded and stocked, and the first level prepped and ready for the ovens and mixer, which would be moved upstairs tomorrow. Though it seemed we were at a stopping place, I knew I should be doing more. There was always more to be done at the bakery. But a weary fatigue had settled in my bones. My lower back hurt, my legs ached, and an exhaustion I'd never experienced had taken over. Six months ago, I could have done the work I'd accomplished today and be ready to go out partying. But the thought of going out and being around people made me shudder. The kid had drained me of all my reserves. As I moved toward the steps leading to my room, the front door of the bakery opened. My first thought was Rachel or someone had forgotten to lock the door and a customer had tried the door. Ready to give the, we will be open soon, speech, I turned to find Margaret standing there, 
rain glistening from her hair and tan jacket. She studied me from head to toe and shook her head. I thought, no effing way are you having a kid. But now that I look at you, damn, how come I didn't see it last week? I couldn't help but grin. It was good to see her. To know she'd come back from her dig to see me because of the baby. I thought I was getting fat, or had the flu, or both. I never figured baby. She closed the door behind her and locked it. Holy crap, Daisy. Yeah, that and more. I'm guessing unless Gordon has super sperm, the kid isn't his. Nope. You told him? Yep. She grimaced, as if sensing I didn't want to talk about it. Can I shack with you for a couple of days? What's with your place? Friend of a friend, renting it for five weeks. Thought I wouldn't be back and could make some cash. Yeah, come on upstairs. But I'll warn you, I'm beat. She glanced around the bakery as if seeing it for the first time. Like the yellow. How goes the other renovation? Going well. Jean-Paul's making it happen. Margaret chuckled. Good to know. He's a lot more laid back than Henri, and I was afraid it might not go as well. But you saw something in him, and you are a good judge of people. Is that a compliment? Maybe. As I climbed the steps, I gave her the short version. So, you are going to pull this off? You mean the reno? The baby. I pushed open the door to my apartment. Good question. I pushed open my bedroom door and eased into a chair and kicked off my shoes. My feet had swollen at least 50%, and I feared by the end of the pregnancy I would not be recognizable. Want a cup of tea? Margaret offered. Oh, God, yes. She shrugged off her jacket, hung it up, and dumped her purse on the floor as she kicked off her shoes. Moving to the microwave, she snagged a couple of mugs and tea bags and filled both mugs with water. She placed them in the microwave and hit four minutes. I wiggled my toes. So, you came all this way to see me? Partly. We knew we were going to get some big rain the next few days and couldn't work the site. I thought about going to New York, but then your explosive text arrived. Figured it best to touch base. I'm touched. She shrugged. The iron coffin isn't budging, and we're trying to figure out how to get him out. Might as well come home. As the tea brewed, Margaret dug milk out from the small fridge and sugar from a ceramic apple holder. When the timer dinged, she prepared the cups, handed me one, and then sat cross-legged on my bed with hers cradled in her hands. The last person to make me tea had been Gordon. It had been a month ago, and I wasn't feeling great. Again, I'd thought it was a bug, but it had been the kid all the time. Gordon really would have been a great dad. He loved kids, and he had a knack for taking care of people. Thinking about the kid and how its life would have been so different if it had shared Gordon's DNA triggered a pool of tears in my eyes. It's a cup of tea, Daisy, Margaret said. It's not like I gave you a kidney. I sipped the hot brew. Normally I took my tea black, but since the baby, I gravitated toward the sweeter tastes. I was thinking about Gordon. She raised a brow clearly surprised by my lack of sarcasm and honesty. He must be upset. Think how you'd feel if your boyfriend found out an ex was having his kid. She arched a brow, cradling her cup in her hands. Actually, that did happen. With Mark. I flipped through my memories of Margaret's ex-boyfriends. Mark? I met him in grad school. He was working on his thesis in ancient societies, and I was still working on my master's. Majorly hot and heavy, and I thought we had a shot at marriage. And he gets a call from the ex. She's pregnant. At first I was cool about it. 
It's not like he cheated on me. But then they spent more and more time together. Doctor's appointments, ultrasounds, baby furniture. I felt left out and realized I wasn't as cool as I thought. Dropping my gaze to the cup, I thought about Gordon's offer to make this work. Gordon said we could make a go of it if I didn't tell the baby's father. And? I glanced into the milky depths of the tea. Can't lie to the kid, Margaret. I'm so grateful Mom and Dad were always honest with me, but it still was an issue not knowing everything. Shit, I still don't know who my birth father is. And Terry? Traveling, and will get back to me. She sipped her tea. I could offer my opinion, but I'd hate to scar the baby. I hear they absorb a lot. So tell me about Jenna. Did Gigi send you the articles? Yeah, they were helpful. I relayed what I knew. I've been thinking about her a lot the last couple of days, and I really want to find out what happened to the baby and his father. Any clues on the dad? The dog tags and the picture I found in the recipe box. But I don't know if they belong to him. They are a good place to start. You think you could find out more? She arched a brow, her gaze now amused. Child's play. How? There's a dude in California I know. He's retired army, and he'll find service records for a low price. She dug her phone out of her back pocket, typed quickly for a few seconds, and then set it on the bed beside her. He texts? No. He thinks email is pretty space-age. I sent him an email. She glanced at her watch. It's still early out west, so we might hear from him tonight, at least to let us know he's got the ball rolling. Margaret, I am humbled by your mastery of history. She took the compliment as a matter of course. In some circles, they call me the Seeker. That brought a smile. Really? Absolutely. I can find people. I mean, dead people from the past. The living I'm not so good with but I am A-1 with the dead. We chatted about her project, the cute dude who was working the dig, and the time frame of the project. They'd secured more funding, and it looked like the project would be extended another six months. Of course, I'll bail at the end of the summer, she said. Why? The kid, of course. I sat up straight. No. You are not allowed to come back. I said in my text, you are still fired. A smile quirked the edge of her lips. Really? You are still canning me? Yep. No coming back. In case you can't add, Daisy Jr. arrives at the holidays. I know. We'll be fine. Really? Shoving aside a jolt of panic. I struggle to look relaxed. I have hired a couple of teens. They seem capable and should be able to fill in the afternoon gaps. Margaret studied me, searching. My shoes are too big to fill. Literally or figuratively? Hilarious. Her gaze narrowed. You look dead on your feet. I am. Then get into bed. I'll take the spare and make myself at home. Too tired to argue, I set my tea carefully on the small end table and rose. Groaning, I pushed my hand into my lower back. It's like this kid came out of nowhere. She helped me to the bed. Yeah, Daisy. I still can't figure how you missed the pregnancy. She's a sneaky kid. She grinned. She? So... It's a girl? Don't know. Just a guess. Margaret nodded. I like the idea of another girl toddling around the joint. The girls were a hoot when they were babies. If it's a girl, you should name her Margaret. Of course, we can't call her Margaret. That would get confusing. Big Margaret and little Margaret is awkward. But we could call her Maggie. All the muscles in my back groaned as I lay back against the pillow. 
Margaret covered me up with a blue and white quilt Mom had bought at a yard sale years ago. I've always wanted to call you Big Margaret. I'm not going to let you offend me. Baby Maggie needs her mom calm and cool. I laughed. Baby Maggie does have a ring. Of course it does. Now close your little eyes and go to sleep. And dream weird dreams. Yeah. Weird dreams? About Jenna. Guess the old subconscious is working overtime. She sat on the edge of the bed. I remember Rachel having weird dreams when she was pregnant. Really? Yeah. She could never pin them, but they bothered her. Drove Mike nuts. I rose up on my elbows. I never heard that. Six years ago, you were living in D.C. You'd started at that financial company and were busy. Yeah. That had been a hectic and exciting time. I'd been dazzled by the offer to be a vice president and thrilled by the salary. The work had been all-consuming, but I'd been happy with the full hectic days. However, as I looked back, I couldn't figure why I worried and fussed over my new job so much. Company deadlines and corporate meetings had seemed so important. The times I'd seen Rachel pregnant, she'd been radiant, but she'd also reminded me of Terry and what she'd looked like when she was pregnant with me. I didn't picture Terry glowing. I imagined her afraid and angry. So I used deadlines and meetings to avoid Rachel's rounding belly. Sorry now that I'd missed Rachel's pregnancy. It would have been nice to rub her belly and buy her ice cream and pickles instead of ordering baby items online and having them shipped to her with a computer-generated card. I was back in the thick of the family, and I was... glad. The kid needed to grow up around her cousins and her aunts and grandparents. I wanted her to live in this building and feel the sense of peace I could never manage. And maybe, if I were lucky, she could show me how to live here without always feeling like I had baggage to lug around. I'm not making the same mistake you did, Margaret said. What? Margaret rested her hand on my shoulder. I'm going to be here when you are pregnant. Warmth spread through me, and tears, which were appearing with an annoying frequency, formed. Margaret, it would break my heart to see you give up the job. Really. Feel free to come home on the weekends, but I don't want you to leave a job you love. She shook her head. It's going to be insane here this fall. I hope we are busy. We need to make money and grow, which I believe we will do. I'm good at growing business, Margaret. This is my wheelhouse. If I need more people, I'll hire them. So dig up your bones and let me run with the bakery. Margaret shook her head. When the archaeology site closes in December, I'll be back to the bakery to get us through the holiday rush. Us. Sounded good. Won't you be cataloging artifacts during the winter? My grant doesn't pay me that far, and my sublease will be finished by then. I will accept you back on one condition. Margaret folded her arms. What are your terms, boss? That if they extend your contract, you go back. Don't give up your dream. I know this job is everything. It's not everything to me. Please. I bet you are at the job site an hour before everyone else each morning. A half hour. You love it. I do. Then promise me. You will talk to me before you toss it away to sell cookies. She crossed her finger over her heart. I promise. I lay back. I'm going to hold you to that. Go to sleep before you pass out. She shut off the light. Where are you going? To Rachel's, to see if I can score wine. 
I can't be nice for long stretches unless I'm buzzed. I chuckled. Right. The door closed behind her, and instantly my eyes closed. Seconds or maybe hours might have passed. I didn't know, but the dream did come. Again, it was Jenna, and she was looking at me as if I'd disappointed her. She cradled her full belly with her hands and shook her head. You need to find them. Them. I thought it was him. Find my son and his father. Time is running out, and they need each other. Chapter 16 Saturday, 8 a.m. Seven days until grand reopening. Income lost. $2,000. When I woke the next morning, I braced as I sat up, waiting to feel the wave of nausea. Holding my breath, I pressed my hand to my stomach, trying to gauge whether I should run to the bathroom or not. My stomach was calm. I drew in a deep breath and waited. Nothing. Still calm. You'd think I'd be thrilled at the passing of the sickness, but immediately I worried— what if the baby was in trouble? My hand slid to my belly, still round and hard, and I waited for the kid to kick. I needed feedback from her, and again she was being coy. Come on, I whispered. A kick or a tap would be greatly appreciated. Nothing. Damn. Why are you cussing? Margaret's groggy voice rolled out from under the blue sheet on her bed. I'm not sick, I whispered. Why are you whispering? Because what if not being sick is a bad sign? Margaret peeked her head out from under the sheet. A riot of red curls framed a face lined from a pillow's crease. Are you cramping or bleeding? I glanced under the sheet. No, all clear. She sat up and yawned. Is the baby moving? No, but she goes dark for long stretches. She's a mind of her own. She reached for her thick, dark glasses on the nightstand and looked at me with now magnified green eyes. Imagine that. This could be serious. Drink a soda or eat a cookie. The sugar will juice her little ass into action. Really? I've known my share of pregnant women. She rose her bare feet curling as they hit the bare wood floor. Are there any cookies in this place right now? I have cookie dough in the freezer. Better be cooked, Salmonella. Right. There's a ginger ale in the back of my refrigerator. There was. I cut it with bourbon last night. You took my baby's ginger ale and mixed it with booze? Hey. I remember you taking a bottle of Rachel's breast milk and putting it in your coffee. I shrugged. It had been a late night. Exactly. Fine. I rose. I need to hook up with some sugar so I can make the kid move. Margaret sat up. When did you become such a girl, Daisy? I'm not sure when I crossed that dark line, but I'm there. I grabbed shorts from the edge of the bed and pulled them on. I reached to fasten the button, but discovered I couldn't. Crap. Ah, the tall and slim Daisy has joined the ranks of the mortals. I wasn't always slim. You have been for at least fifteen years, and that's a lifetime in my book. I tried to suck in my belly, but it wouldn't budge. I thought you weren't supposed to show for like five months. And you would be about at the four and a half month mark? Yeah. Five months is technically two weeks away. Tell it to the kid, Margaret laughed. Time to get some fat girl pants. Wonder if Rachel has any. If she does, they'll be too short. I dragged a hand through my hair. My life is out of control totally out of control. Chill, Diva Daisy. I'll get some clothes on and we'll hit the box store for some maternity clothes and some sugar. Maternity clothes? 
a groan rumbled in my throat. You might as well be talking about space aliens or alternate universes. As she chuckled, she dug a safety pin from her satchel and handed it to me. This will hold the drawers up until we can get supplies. I need to be back by nine. The new workers are showing and Jean-Paul's movers are coming. It shouldn't take long. It's not like we're looking for fancy clothes. A half hour later, I stood by the maternity sign in the Walmart. We'd stopped at Starbucks, and I'd bought a coffee and a couple of sugar cookies. The cookie had tasted so good. It seemed as if it had been years since I'd eaten food that wasn't a saltine. When the kid did not move after the first sugar cookie, I ate a second. This was an emergency, after all. Finally, as I sipped my coffee, the kid kicked. My hand slid to my belly. Do it again, I thought. One more time. And miracle of miracles, she kicked. Margaret stared at me over the rim of her coffee cup. She moving? Yes. I took her hand and placed it on my belly. Baby Maggie kicked again. Margaret grinned. Well, imagine that. The stress seeped from my body. Okay. Now that I know the baby is fine, I can think. Then let's hit the maternity section. Minutes later, staring at the shapeless clothes, a full-blown panic attack threatened. In my regular clothes, I could fool myself into believing the kid was abstract. Yeah, she'd moved, but I was still me. But in these clothes... I wasn't myself. Margaret handed me several pairs of black shorts with elastic waistbands and a pair of jeans with a full elastic front panel. The shorts will get you to mid-October, maybe early November, but the jeans will take you through the duration. I accepted the hangers. Right. Margaret pointed toward the changing rooms. Now... You have to go into the nice dressing room and try them on. Does it matter? It's all elastic. Margaret sipped her coffee. Try the damn clothes on, Daisy. Fine. Come back with me. Are you two years old? My maturity level has diminished in the last weeks. So, yeah, two about sums it up. We chose the handicap changing room for extra space. Margaret sat, and I handed her the garments before I unfastened my safety pin. The pants dropped to the floor, and I couldn't resist scratching my belly. That's sexy. I gave up on sexy when the nausea hit. It's all about what feels good now. Margaret rifled through my choices. They're all black. I accepted the first from her. Black is my favorite color. Yeah, but don't you think you should go for the lighter shades of tops or pants now that you are dressing for two? I'll do whatever I have to do to keep this kid safe, but I will not walk around in light-colored pants that make my ass look bigger. That's asking too much. I slid on the pants, which comfortably hugged my belly, my pants had been tightening for weeks, and I ignored it. Nice to have pants that don't squeeze the life out of me. I turned sideways in the mirror, inspected the pants and my growing belly, and then glanced at Margaret. She shrugged. Not a fashion statement, but it gets the job done. I've seen women who breeze through pregnancy and look so trendy. Rachel always looked cute and pulled together. Margaret said. I never thought much about it, but now I wonder how she did it. She is a goddess in my book. Margaret studied my Union Street Bakery t-shirt draping over the pants. Make peace with the fact you won't see fashionable for a while. How can you say that? You work in a bakery, which is manual labor in anybody's book. Not many knocked-up sexy bakers in the world— Rachel was the exception. I studied my image in the mirror. I'd not taken the time to remove my mascara last night, 
which left darkened smudges below my eyes. My hair was pulled into a wild ponytail, but wisps of hair had escaped to frame my face and make me look a little crazed. My boobs also spilled over the edges of my bra. This baby is going to tear me a new one. Margaret laughed. If it's any consolation. Rachel looked pretty wretched toward the very end. Fat ankles, puffy face, and her ass was big, too. That's supposed to make me feel better? I'm only at the halfway mark. Margaret shrugged. Cut yourself some slack. Your plate is full. And Rachel did get back her figure months after the girls arrived. Months after the delivery? I groaned. That means I'll look like hell for another seven or eight months? Her gaze softened. This isn't forever, Daisy. And it will be worth it in the end when baby Maggie arrives. Now try on the rest of the pants and the jeans. There's work to be done at the bakery. Twenty minutes later, I was $150 lighter, wearing a new pair of black shorts, a maternity bra under my T-shirt, and carrying a bag filled with more pants, bras, and panties. I was officially, for the world to know, pregnant. My stomach settled. My appetite returned with a vengeance, so Margaret stopped at a chain restaurant for a couple of egg bagels. The food tasted so good, and I gobbled the bagels. I toyed with going back for a third bagel, but Margaret reminded me baby Maggie was the size of my thumb and did not need the calories. When we arrived at the bakery, Jean-Paul was talking to three very burly-looking men who looked as if they'd tripped out of prison. Long hair, tattoos, stained t-shirts, faded jeans, and boots. As tempted as I was to ask where he found these guys, I didn't. I'd learned with Jean-Paul that knowing all the details wasn't always the best course of action. Margaret and I introduced ourselves, and I showed the men the equipment in the basement in need of being moved to the main floor. I couldn't imagine anyone being able to move any of the equipment. But the men didn't appear worried over the task. You must go upstairs, Jean-Paul said. It's not safe for the baby. A couple of the men glanced at me and then to my belly. One craggy-faced guy actually beamed. I'd heard tales of men giving up seats for pregnant women, opening doors and acting generally silly. The power of the bump. And so Margaret and I moved back to the first floor, to stand and direct the placement of the equipment. The first large standing mixer made it up the stairs in the arms of two men who barely appeared to be straining. Encouraged, this might not be so bad, and might actually go quickly, I made the mistake of mentally revising the schedule that had been set aside for moving. The second mixer, a good fifty percent larger, didn't cooperate as well as its smaller cousin. I heard a couple of bangs and crashes and curse words rise up from the basement. While the first mixer had taken fifteen minutes, the second took an hour of maneuvering, and when it arrived the movers were red-faced and breathless. Jean-Paul appeared and went straight to his toolbox. I must take out the back door for the ovens, he said. They must be moved to the alley around the corner and through the front door. But what about the front door? It will also have to be removed, but do not worry. It will all be fine. Margaret shrugged. It will be fine. Of course. And so we spent the rest of the day listening to Jean-Paul hammer away door frames, listening to the grunts of workmen as they struggled to get the oversized stove out of the basement, into the back of a truck, and then through the newly dismantled front door. All I could think about as I watched them push the monster machine through the front door was my new paint job, which Jean-Paul had already chipped when he removed the frame. Progress was slow, very slow at times, but finally the last piece of equipment was brought up to the first floor and positioned in the new, main floor bakery. I shook my head. 
think, Margaret. No more traveling endless flights of stairs. Granted, it was a pain, but it kept the size of my butt in check. This place, if you haven't noticed, is full of very delicious foods. I placed my hand on my expanding hip. At least I can chalk my fat rear up to the kid and not the cookies. Lucky you. Here's hoping when you deliver it goes away. My cell rang and I glanced at the number, which I did not recognize. Daisy McRae. This is Irene Adams. I'm Meg and Tim's mom. Meg said for me to call you. Yes. I moved away from the noise so I could hear better. Did Meg tell you I offered them a job? Yes. You're right across the street from my sister's place. That's right. I'm sorry I haven't called you sooner. I've been working double shifts this week. That's fine. Since Meg is under 18, I wanted to talk to you before she started work. She's the first teenager I've ever hired. Meg's a real good girl. Irene sounded tired. I couldn't manage Tim without her. And it won't be a problem with Tim? He's a good boy, and he listens to Meg. Just give him specific instructions, and he'll be fine. And it's okay they work here. I think it's great. A blessing, even. Meg could use spending money, and I don't have it to spare. I'm not paying her a fortune. She's a hard worker. She released a shuddering sigh. It's hard raising them alone. I can't give them what they deserve. This job means a lot to her. Emotion tightened my throat. I'm looking forward to it. If there is ever a problem, you can call me, she rushed to say. But they are good kids, and there won't be a problem. I'd love you to come by so I can meet you, Irene. I'll be by soon. Lots of crazy hours at the hospital, and I've got to take the work when they offer it. But I'll be by soon. Thank you again. Sure. We exchanged a few more pleasantries, and I rang off. Would I end up like Irene? The single mom working long, crazed hours and grateful for a stranger's help? Jean-Paul announced the move was done and I was grateful to push Irene out of my thoughts. I doled out cash payments to the movers, along with batches of cookies Rachel had baked in her apartment last night for Simon's party, and bottles of wine, and said goodbye to all of them before one. Rachel, Margaret, and I stared at the newly configured kitchen. Rachel scrunched her face. I'm not sure if I like it. Laughter bubbled in me. Really? Well, then let's put it all back. Margaret rolled her eyes. Sarcasm does not become pregnant women, Daisy. Rachel shook her head as she moved to a stainless steel table and trailed her finger along its smooth surface. It's not like I don't think it won't work. It's, well, I don't know this kitchen. You've used every piece of equipment in the joint, Rachel. Margaret said. Yeah, but not in this configuration. What if the flow is off? We'll find a way to love the flow. I pictured the strained red faces of the movers, because this ain't changing. Rachel opened the oven and peered inside as if making sure all the pieces and parts were intact. I'll make it work. Great. My cell phone buzzed, and I glanced at the number. Speak of the devil. It's the delivery guy with the new freezer. I picked up and instructed the guy to come through the front door. Won't be long before we are up and running. Rachel grinned. Thank God. Not baking has been like going through detox. I'm surprised I don't have the shakes. Laughing, Margaret shook her head. Really, Rachel. You need to get laid. Rachel's eyes widened as a ruby blush rose up her cheeks. Talk of sex always sent Rachel skittering, but instead of retreating, she nodded. 
send up a message to those pagan gods you talk about so much and tell them Rachel could use a little love? I laughed. Rachel, you naughty girl. She shook her head. Her cheeks remained red as cherries. It's been over a year and a half. She glanced at my stomach. You two have at least gotten some love in the last year. The new freezer arrived an hour later and slid right into the place Jean-Paul had created. It was massive, and I caught Rachel opening and closing it several times as she marveled at the empty white interior. My office was officially gone. The kitchen had been moved, and the wine cellar was at least partly in place. Now, just a couple of days of finishing work and we'd be back in business. Rachel had to clean her kitchen. The doors had to be rehung. The wine cellar needed a clean and final reorganization. And then there was the minor detail of baking enough goods to fill the front case. Any one of those items could have filled a couple of days each, and we had seven to tackle all of them along with refilling our inventory. Rachel, your sex life is going to have to wait, I said. She laughed as she shook her head. It's been on hold for eighteen months, so a few more days won't make a difference. Margaret shook her head. Eighteen months. No sex. Damn. Rachel nodded. It has had its challenges. Sex with Roger had been very uneventful. The last time I'd had great sex had been with Gordon. Up until my stomach had started acting up recently, I'd been dreaming about more sex with Gordon. I missed how good he could make me feel. Margaret rested her hands on her hips. The definition of hell is no sex and working in the bakery. I shrugged. I could certainly do with more sex, but as far as the bakery is concerned, the place is growing on me. It's official, Rachel said. I have heard it all. Chapter 17 Saturday, 1 p.m. Six days, twelve hours until grand reopening. Income lost, $3,700. I was working in the kitchen, cleaning equipment with Rachel, when the overnight packet of papers arrived. I signed for the thick envelope made out to me. The sender was a Billy J. Hoyt from Fresno, California. His handwriting in blue ballpoint pen was precise and indented, as if the man put weight behind each letter. Margaret! What? she shouted from the basement. I hefted the envelope, and judging by the weight, it was a heavy stack of papers. Noah, Mr. Hoyt? Next came the thumping of her feet up the basement stairs. Is that from Billy? I held out the package to her. That would be correct. He one of your pals? He's the one we wrote to about the dog tags. But you emailed him last night. He must have really hustled the request through. He's got so many connections. She took the package from me and ripped open the back flap. Billy is retired army. He spends his golden years locating information on the men and women who served. It's amazing what he can find. I glanced over her shoulder as she scanned a typed note from Billy. The concise letter detailed what he'd found and ended with a don't worry about the cost, tell Maggie hi, and I'll keep digging. Again, the signature was bold, clear, and direct. I pictured a man with a gray, high and tight haircut, white collared shirt, and khakis. So, Maggie, does Billy have a crush on you? She waggled her eyebrows. I think he does. If I were thirty years older, I'd definitely date him. He's such a sweetie. He served three tours in Vietnam and has more medals than I can count. A real stud in my book. I laughed. Margaret. What? I can admire his service. She shuffled through the papers, and the first sheet was a military form looking as if it had been copied from microfilm, 
At the top of the form it read, Autopsy Report. It's for Walter Jacob. That was the name on the dog tags. I braced. How did he die? Margaret's frown deepened as she read the form. He was hit by artillery fire. His legs were blown off in the initial explosion. He also lost a hand and sustained head trauma. Blowing breath from my lungs, I shoved the image out of my mind and prayed Jenna never receive such details. What's the other paper? As she shuffled, I saw the heading at the top of the next form. It read, Burial Information. The clear, simple words came with a one-two punch, sobering all my humor. Margaret read, her gaze as sharp and serious as when she cataloged artifacts. The form is also for a Walter F. Jacob. He was a sergeant in the Marines. Birth date, 12 June 1920. Date of death, 15 July 1944. He lived to be twenty-four. So young. A silence settled around us, and the weight bore heavy on me. I pressed my hand to my belly, not able to wonder what it would be like to lose a child over twenty. It says, The remains of USMC Walter Jacob were first buried on the island of Saipan. Plot T, grave 1040. Saipan? The invasion of the island was called the D-Day of the Pacific, very strategic bloody battle that lasted several weeks. We won, but the price was very high. So is Walter still on Saipan? So far from home. Margaret flipped through more papers, her frown deepening. There is a Joey Luddenberg listed as next of kin and— She paused for effect. There is a letter here to Mrs. Jenna Davis Jacob, Union Street, Alexandria, Virginia. Our Jenna. What does it say? She tossed me a look as if to say, slow. She read, As requested, the United States Marine Corps is forwarding to you the following personal property belonging to Sergeant Walter F. Jacob, Jr. One carton and contents. One bureau check for $89.12 enclosed. One medal by registered mail. When delivery has been made, I shall appreciate your acknowledging receipt by signing one copy of this letter in the spaces provided below and returning it to this bureau. For your convenience, there is enclosed an addressed envelope which needs no postage. I regret the circumstances prompting this letter, and I extend my deepest sympathies on the loss of your husband. The form letter had all the pertinent information and had been typed correctly, but it was the misalignment of the last word, husband robbing all the heartfelt emotion from the letter. Walter Jacob had become a number, as had Jenna. Inserting husband had been simply another detail to be handled by a clerk in a nameless office. Sadness burrowed deep. The letter sounds so cold and uncaring. But think of how many thousands of remains that office handled, Daisy. So many men died and keeping track of their remains, their belongings, and their loved ones was no easy task. The effects were sent to Jenna Jacob, but according to the article in the paper, her last name was Davis. I glanced at the dates and did a quick calculation. He died about five months before the baby was born, and this letter would have been received about a week before she gave birth. Maybe he listed her as his wife. Maybe he knew about the baby and had every intention of coming back and marrying her. It does say here that his body was interred in the Alexandria Cemetery. Plot A-222. That was the first bit of good news. Really? So we could go see it? Sure. 
I glanced at unfinished work at the bakery yet to be done, and didn't feel like I could leave. An hour won't make a huge difference, Margaret said, reading my expression. This will always be here. You're right. The heat of mid-afternoon had passed, and the air had cooled to a nice temperature. I wanted to get out of the bakery and breathe a little fresh air and walk on the cemetery's green grass. We left Rachel scrubbing and grumbling about bad flow and how every pot and pan was in the wrong place. When she said, Not to worry, I'll figure it out, we knew she was headed to Martyrville, and it probably was best we did leave. The walk to the cemetery was a little over a mile, but given I'd been on my feet all day, it made sense to drive. It was after six when we arrived, and most of the offices had cleared out for the day so we could find street parking. The grassy lands of the Alexandria Cemetery rolled like a park, shading the granite and limestone grave markers. How do we begin to search? I said. There must be thousands of markers. Margaret and I went to the main office, arriving shortly before closing. The woman looked up at me, clearly annoyed by my late arrival. She had dark hair tied back in a bun and wore wire-rimmed glasses. She wore a white shirt and a United States flag pin on her lapel. Can I help you? Margaret sauntered up as if she were expecting to be recognized. My sister and I are looking for a grave. She glanced at the clock. A grave? That's right. Walter F. Jacob, Jr. He was interred here in 1945. The plot is listed as A-222. Some of the strain vanished from her face. It appeared Margaret had asked an easy question. She pulled out a map and spread it out on her desk. This is where we are, and this is the section where you need to search. I don't know the exact location on the map, but this will put you in the neighborhood. Thanks. It took us a half hour to find the stone located at the base of a small rolling hill. The thin granite marker tilted thirty degrees to the left. The deeply etched letters read, Walter F. Jacob, Jr., U.S. Marines, June 12, 1920, July 15, 1944. I knelt by the marker and carefully traced the letters of his name with my fingertips. Twenty-four years old. So young. I touched the granite, wondering if this was the him I was supposed to find. Find him. Jenna, am I on the right track? I waited a beat, hoping for an answer, but not a whisper or even a feeling. Hey, look, Margaret said. I rose and looked at the marker. It read, Jenna Davis Jacob, June 3, 1926, December 31, 1944. She'd been 18 years old. They died within months of each other. They were babies, Margaret said. Is there another marker around here? According to the paper, she was survived by an infant son, but it also said he was ailing. Margaret and I spent the next minutes moving around the spot looking for a child that might have died close to his birth. But we didn't find a marker. If he died, he wasn't buried here. So where is he? Find him. I don't know. Rachel offered the next link in the growing chain to find him. She suggested we talk to Sarah. At ninety-five, she was one of the oldest customers of the bakery. She'd come once a week for the last seventy years, but had broken her hip two years ago and now lived in a nursing home. Rachel didn't know if she'd remember Jenna, but suggested if anyone did, it would be her. Armed with maple cookies, which Rachel had made, I drove to the nursing home located ten miles away in Arlington. It took a U-turn and two missed tries before I spotted the low-lying building off Glebe Road. Shady Acres Retirement Home was nondescript, 
outfitted with tinted windows that didn't open, an entrance covered with a wide awning, and scattered flower planters next to benches. Inside, the place looked clean and well-run, but the antiseptic smell turned my still delicate stomach. I found reception and introduced myself. After showing an ID and explaining whom I was here to see, the receptionist directed me to a visitor's lounge. The tiled floor sparkled with polish, and on the walls hung pictures of what appeared to be smiling older residents. In the corner stood a card table with cards and poker chips still scattered on it, as if the players would soon return. A large, flat screen televised the news. I studied the pictures on the wall and did my best to look relaxed. However, the more I stood there, the sillier my quest seemed. I was going to ask Sarah Morgan if she remembered a woman who worked a bakery counter in 1943 and 1944. What were the chances? Finally, an older woman, leaning heavily on a cane, came to sit in the room. Judging by her appearance, I guessed her age to be mid to late seventies. Squinting, the older woman openly assessed me. Who are you here for? Getting a little late for visitors. I'm here for Sarah, I said. The woman's gaze brightened, as if all conversation was welcome. Sarah doesn't get many visitors. Really? It's hard to hold on to family when you've reached your nineties. I think her last son passed last year. Heart attack. I'm sorry. He was sixty-nine. She smiled. My name is Edith. Sarah and I are friends. Oh. I shifted in my seat, knowing I had a narrow window of opportunity before I had to return to the shop and finish the day's work. The kids would be arriving on Monday, and we were going to begin our first day of employee training. So, are you Sarah's family? I tapped my index finger on the white USB box. No. She's been a customer of our bakery for a long time. I wanted to drop off cookies. And pump her for information about the 1940s. That's so sweet. What did you bring her? Cookies. Maple. My dad tells me that's her favorite. I love sugar cookies. Glancing at the Union Street Bakery box, I hesitated before asking, Would you like a cookie? She beamed. I'd love one. I broke the seal on the box and held it out to her. These are lovely. When I was expecting, I craved sugar all the time. She smiled at me as she nibbled the edge of her cookie. When is your baby due? I stared at the bump. December. A Christmas baby. I was a Christmas baby. My only word of advice is not to wrap the baby's birthday presents in Christmas paper. I hated that. I'll try to remember. And don't take the birthday picture around the tree. The mingling of dates leaves a kid feeling cheated. Got it. Great. I'd not only made a kid by mistake, but I was further traumatizing it with a Christmas birthday clearly loaded with disappointments. I will remember. Before Edith could comment more on my baby's birthday, Sarah arrived in a wheelchair. Though Sarah slumped over in her chair, her eyes were clear and bright. Those Union Street Bakery cookies. Yes, ma'am. I lifted the lid and held it close to her as she peered inside like a child. Dad had always said that cookies were magical, always made people happy. She bit into the cookie. So, who are you? I'm Daisy McCrae. You know my dad. Frank. That's right. Her eyes narrowed. You worked in the bakery as a kid. I did. Moved to Washington, D.C., from what I remember. Big-shot finance person. Here I thought, 
I'd been invisible behind that counter. But the way this woman talked, you'd have thought we were part of the same family. I'm not in finance anymore. I manage the bakery now. Frowning, she nibbled her cookie. Why? Do you want the long version or the short? I quipped. She chuckled. At my age, the short might be best. The company I worked for went out of business. Mom and Dad needed help. It was a perfect match from the get-go. She stared at me as if she didn't believe me but let it go. You didn't come here to talk to me about why you moved back or to give me cookies. Edith leaned over. She's pregnant. Her baby is due at Christmas. Sarah raised a brow. This isn't your conversation, Edith. It's mine. You get lots of visitors, and I don't. Edith's brows rose. I don't see why I can't talk. Sarah glared at the cookie clutched in Edith's hand. Looks like you already had one of my cookies. Now go over there and wait for your son. He's never late. Edith took a big bite out of her cookie and moved several seats over. Sarah grunted, smiling behind her cookie. She always is trying to horn in. She gets visitors all the time, and I don't. And still, she wants a piece of what I have. Sorry to hear that. Don't worry about it. I bet she was a pesky kid on the playground. People don't change. I was looking at a couple of old ladies, and to my shame, I'd not thought much about priorities. I saw old. Sitting here with Sarah, I could now see I'd underestimated her. So, why are you here? I know my memory is bad, but I'm pretty sure we've never formally met. No, ma'am, we've not met. I scooted to the edge of my seat. My sister sent me here to see you. Rachel or Margaret? Rachel. I always liked Rachel. Good woman. Her gaze narrowed as she stared at me. You're the adopted sister. The adopted sister. There was no malice behind the description, but it always needled, made me feel a little less. That's right. So, Daisy, the adopted one, what can I do for you? We're renovating the bakery, knocking out walls. We found a recipe box dating back to the 1940s. Good years. I was in my late twenties, and I was between my first and second husbands. I was full of piss and vinegar during the war. I don't doubt it. She met my gaze, searching for any trace of sarcasm. That's right. Don't you doubt it for one minute. I was a catch back in the day. I could have plowed on with my questions, but sensed she wanted to talk. She'd already said she didn't get many visitors. The clock ticking to return to the bakery, I relaxed back in my chair. So, what were you doing between husbands one and two? Her gaze twinkled. Other than getting into a bit of trouble... I was working at the torpedo factory, making bombs. There were a lot of dames like me working in the factory then. The boys were all off to war. The town was different then. Not the hustle and bustle it is now, but we thought it was mighty fine. The music and the dancing. I was a USO dancer, and I was good. Cut a swing better than anyone. You lived in Old Town. Rented a room near your bakery on Union Street. Old lady had a boarding house. She paused. Old lady. I think Miss Carroll wasn't more than fifty or fifty-five. Here I am forty years past that age. My sister Rachel said you were a regular at the bakery. Every morning I bought a croissant. She scrunched her face in a smile. So... Good. 
the sharpness of her memory gave me hope. I was actually trying to find a gal who worked in the bakery about then. Her name was Jenna. I reached in my pocket and pulled out the picture I'd found and handed it to Sarah. She studied the picture through her thick glasses. Brings back memories, this picture does. What do you remember about the bakery? Well, your daddy wasn't more than one. He was a scrappy little kid who liked cookies. Dad's round belly came to mind. He still eats cookies. And Lord, what a crier he was. If someone wasn't carrying him around, he was fussing. Her eyes glinted. I didn't like him then. He made me swear off kids. Of course, that promise lasted less than a year. Met my second husband, and our son was born in forty-five. I laughed. Dad said my sisters and I were enough to break a man. Don't take any of his belly aching. He was the worst. I tucked the nugget aside, knowing one day I'd use it. Do you remember any of the women who worked in the bakery? She glanced at the picture, the wrinkles in her face deepening. For a moment she didn't speak, and then she tapped her gnarled finger on Jenna's face. I do remember her. She was a firecracker. I studied Jenna's smiling face and thought about the obituary in the paper. What had happened? She met a service man, I think. Slowly Sarah nodded. She did. A fine-looking boy. Not much more than twenty-one or two. He was marine infantry. Was all full of himself. You remember him? I remember the three of them at a USO dance. That's how they met. Three of them? He always traveled with his buddy. They came up on the train from Quantico whenever they could get leave. Memory serves they were training officers. Joey and Walter. Joey. Joey Luddenberg had signed for Walter's belongings after he died. I pulled out the picture of Jenna and the two men. Which one was Walter? She studied the picture, but after a moment shook her head. I couldn't tell you. So many G.I.s then. They ran together. But you remember Jenna at the dance with Joey and Walter. Sure. One of them took her out for a dance and had a devil of a time letting her go to dance with the next soldier. He stared at her all night. Made me realize why I divorced my first husband. He never stared at me with so much lust. I studied the smiling faces of the men in the photo. Both looked so happy, and I could have sworn both were in love with her. So he loved her. Well, he sure did lust after her. She cackled. But he did like her. Saw both those soldier boys a couple of times at the bakery. I read about Jenna in the paper. She died giving birth. For a long moment, Sarah was silent, as if some details escaped her. And finally she said, There were customers who wouldn't speak to her when she was expecting. Called her bad news. Overwhelming sadness washed over me, as if it weren't Jenna who had been hurt, but me. I thought about my kid being diminished because I wasn't married to her father. Homicide came to mind when I thought about anyone hurting my kid. Must have been hard on her. I think it was. Did she have family in the area? She came from the western part of the state. I don't remember where, exactly. But I know Alexandria wasn't her home. Why did she come to Alexandria? Said she wanted to see a real city. Wanted more than the country. She broke off a piece of cookie and ate it. And then her man died in the war, and she didn't want no more parts of the city. She hated it all. But she didn't go home. 
Sarah folded gnarled, thickly veined hands in her lap. Not unmarried, with a baby in her belly. She told me they'd not take her. She and Walter didn't get married. She talked about it. I know she loved him. But if they got married, I never knew it. Single motherhood scared me. I didn't have Gordon, but I had family. I wasn't alone, and I would make it. Jenna had no one. Sarah nodded. I didn't hear about her dying right away. I was working and newly married. But a couple of weeks after the fact, I came by the bakery. Mr. McRae told me what had happened. They were all torn up. What happened to the baby? I suppose he went home with her kin. In the western part of the state. That's what I hear. Frustration had me scooting to the edge of my seat. You've no idea where? Well, west. I heard she was from Frederick County. Maybe. I don't know. Honey... It's been seventy years. I think I'm doing pretty well, considering. You are doing great. I shuffled through the towns in the western part of the state near Frederick County. I wished I'd paid closer attention in fifth-grade geography. Sarah nibbled her cookie, frowning as she dug through her memory. Her daddy owned an apple farm. My sister Rachel buys fresh apples from an orchard out in that area. Jenna came from apple country. Said she'd eaten enough apples to last her a lifetime. Did she ever talk about her family? Sarah frowned. Not much. She was too sweet a gal to say a bad word. She cocked her head. She did get a letter from home once. Made her cry explains why home might be the last place to go with a baby. Chapter 18 Monday, 8 a.m. Five days until grand reopening. Income lost, $3,700. Finding Jenna's baby and her lover had to take a back seat as we really rolled into high gear with reassembling the kitchen and finalizing the wine cellar room. I followed up on my liquor license and found it might be weeks before we could sell wine, but at least it was in the pipeline. Margaret's dig was delayed a day or two, so she remained at the bakery, and my new workers, Meg and Tim, showed up right on time. Tim was grinning and though Meg had a smile on her face, I sensed worry as they came into the shop and inspected the setup. Hi, Meg, I said. Rachel grinned. The cavalry has arrived. The welcome seemed to allay Meg's tension. Her smile widened. She'd been worried the job might not come through. The kid was used to disappointment, which made me all the more determined to make all this work so we could afford to keep them. While Rachel schooled Meg on the finer points of mixing dough, Tim sat on a stool and watched. He seemed content to wait until a job was handed to him. When Jean-Paul asked if he could help move a piece of equipment, I had my doubts. But Tim stood right up, grin broadening, and hurried to help Jean-Paul. The kid was strong as an ox and quickly proved to be a real help. Several times he helped Jean-Paul move equipment impossible otherwise. By the end of Meg and Tim's first day, the kitchen had been fully restored, the basement was cleaned, and Jean-Paul had begun to frame off a corner of the basement for another office for me. Though I didn't love the idea of working in a basement, I really didn't like the idea of working in my apartment. That night, when I crawled upstairs to my room, exhausted, Jenna was not far behind me, dogging me up the stairs, tapping me on my shoulder and reminding me that I'd said I'd find her baby and lover. Find him. Find him. I flopped on my bed, 
and lay back against the pillow. I know what I said, Jenna, and I'll find your men. But right now I can barely see straight. The energy in the room shifted and some of the tension melted away. I wasn't sure if Jenna was chilling or I was too tired to care. My eyes closed as soon as my head hit the pillow and I was swept up into darkness. Sleep came so hard and fast I didn't dream. Blissful blackness washed over me like a wave, which I gladly rode. A year ago I'd have fought the wave, but now understood the kid needed it as much as I did. Somewhere along the way I'd stopped being number one in my life. The kid had nudged to the front of the line. How many times had I seen Rachel put herself second to the girls? I'd thought she was nuts. Now, not so much. When I woke, the room was dark, save for the slash of moonlight cutting the room in half. Drool trickled from my mouth, which I swiped away as embarrassment had me glancing around the darkness. I half expected to see Margaret staring at me, laughing, but she was nowhere in sight. I was alone. Gordon had once said he liked watching me sleep. He liked that I looked so relaxed and didn't have a white-knuckle grip on life 24-7. Shit. I don't have a tight grip on life right now, Gordo. I am an out-of-control mess. I swiped my hand over my mouth one more time and swung my legs over the side of the bed. I stared at the rumpled sheets of Margaret's bed and couldn't tell if she'd come and gone or if she'd not spent the night here. I'd been so out of it when my head hit the pillow that I had no way of knowing. Never had I slept so hard. Mom said as a kid I'd never been a good sleeper. She said she'd had to sneak upstairs on her belly because she knew I'd be in my room, hanging over the baby gate, barricading me in my door, searching for her. But last night I'd slept like the dead. I rose and moved to the bathroom filled a tumbler full of water, and drank. Find him. Jenna might have allowed me to sleep, but she'd not forgotten her request. You're a pushy broad, Jenna, I said. I've feelers out. What more do you want? I refilled the glass and moved to my computer to see if there was any bit of news that might have popped up. I scanned emails from suppliers and spotted one from a friend of mine I'd worked with in D.C., Brenda. She and I had been in tough competition at the company. We both were ambitious, and we both wanted the corner office. Plenty of times we'd gone head to head, and she'd made me so mad I could scream. But knowing she was chasing me in the corporate world had made me better and sharper at what I'd done. Big D. How goes the new Betty Crocker life? Last I heard you couldn't use an easy-bake oven, and now you are churning out cookies and pies. Thought I'd let you know I finally landed on my feet after six months of unemployment. As much as I love sleeping until ten, eating too much, and building a tight relationship with Jerry Springer, we have a date every day at five, I've been called back to the corporate world. I'll be moving to Seattle to take a job with a financial company. I think I'm the last of our core group to get back into the real world. Bill has a gig in San Francisco, Gwen is working in D.C., and Mike moved to Dallas. And, of course, old Roger is in China. From what I hear, he's still a douche. Call me. We'll grab a drink before I load up the wagon train and move west. Bigger B. I sat back in my chair absently smoothing my hand over my belly. Six months since I'd been in the real world, but it might as well have been a lifetime. Each day took me further and further away. And, of course, old Roger is in China. Roger. I'd been avoiding thoughts of him like the plague. I was half hoping he'd vanish from my mind and I'd never think about him again. Gordon. Why couldn't the baby be yours? As much as I wanted to ignore Roger, I couldn't. Roger was my kid's biological father, 
and he needed to know. He'd always been a jerk, and I didn't like him, but none of that mattered. Dear Roger, I thought for a moment as I looked at the line and then deleted, Dear Roger, been a while, but I needed to touch base with you. Remember our last night before I left D.C.? Yeah, well, I don't remember much, but I do remember the basics, and the basics seem to have been enough to make a baby. I'm pregnant, and the kid is yours. Baby is due at Christmas. I'm not looking for money, but I have an obligation to tell you. If you want to contact me and find out more details, I'm here. Daisy. For long, tense seconds, my index finger hovered poised over the send key. The note had to be sent, but I did not want to open this can of worms. I didn't like Roger, and the idea of a lifetime of co-parenting with him made me sick to my stomach. But we had done the deed, and this was not about me, but my kid. She deserved her biological history. Damn it. Closing my eyes, I pressed send, watching as the bar on the send log filled and listened to the whooshing email sound as it was whisked away into cyberspace. No going back now. I smoothed my hand over my belly and imagined Gordon wrapping his arms around me. My heart ached as I thought about losing him. No matter what, you have me, kid. I'm not pulling at Terry. I'm not. We are in this together. I scanned the rest of my emails and almost missed the last, which was from a Teresa Miller. Teresa. Terry. Daisy. I apologize for the delay, but work and the kids have kept me very busy. The kids. The ones she'd kept and loved. Tension built in my chest, and for a moment I had to turn away. I reminded myself she hadn't injected a hidden meaning behind the comment. There was no veiled truth. She was stating the facts of her life. My pregnancies have all been easy. I was never sick, except with my second son, and the morning sickness didn't arrive until about the fourth month. It lasted about six weeks, and then it was gone. My deliveries were all textbook, and my recovery was quick. You look so much like me, I can't help but think you will have the same luck with your pregnancy as I had with mine. I know you want more information about your birth father, and I wish I could give it to you. But the truth is, I was sixteen when I got pregnant with you, and I made a lot of bad choices during that time, including excessive drinking. I'm not proud to admit this, but I don't know your birth father's name. I wish I could give you answers, but I can't. You've a tough road ahead of you, Daisy, but you are a tough gal. You've been a fighter since day one. Here's hoping your baby is a better napper than you were. I found more pictures that I thought you might like, and I've sent them to you priority mail. Knowing your curious nature, I know they will be of interest to you. I wish you the best. Terry I sat back in my chair, feeling as if the wind had been knocked from my lungs. Tears stung, pooled, and trickled like an endlessly leaky water faucet. I didn't bother to stop them. I wish you the best. She was sorry for failing me, but there was no mention of a future or a relationship with her grandchild or me. The kid and I were part of her past. By late afternoon, Jean-Paul had finished the drywall and spackling of my new, albeit tiny, office. As I stood in the rectangular room that measured ten by five, I knew I'd have to be efficient with furnishings. No sprawling or tossing stuff in piles on the floor. The space did not have a window, but it did have a door, and if I pushed my desk against the far wall, I could glance over my shoulder and see the winery and the brick oven with ease. 
I could also hear what was happening in the kitchen. For some reason, the sound traveled right through the ceiling of my office. That was going to be good and bad. Despite the office's shortcomings, it was done, and after I applied a coat of paint, construction could be classified as officially over. I'd considered several colors, but in the end chose the yellow paint left over from the front of the shop. It was enough to cover my walls in two coats, and best of all, it was already paid for. Watching the money going out in the last week and a half had been stressful, and I was looking forward to seeing it come back into the bakery. And so I finished the paint job and tossed out the empty paint can and paint brushes in the dumpster. I headed up to the front of the store to hang what had been on the walls before. In the end, I settled on rehanging the cupcake clock. I didn't want to rehang the posters Mike had liked, and decided to dig through the old bakery pictures and put together a collage. Another project, one I didn't need, but it made sense to celebrate the bakery's history. I pushed through the saloon doors so I could offer my help to Rachel. My sister stood over the large mixer and was dropping in chunks of butter while Meg watched. Meg had tied back her brown hair and wore a frown on her face as she listened to Rachel's explanations about mixing. The girl wanted to learn, and as far as I was concerned, that was more than half the battle. Did Margaret go back to her dig? I said. Rachel unwrapped another pound of butter and dropped it into the mixer. No, she had an errand to run. Annoyance snapped. She says she's here to work, and now she's running an errand? Rachel shrugged. She took the girls with her, which gives me time. That makes her a goddess in my mind. Margaret and the girls. What could those three be up to? My guess is it has to do with chocolate ice cream. I'm fully expecting the girls to come back covered in dirt and hyped on sugar. But at this point, I don't care, as long as it buys me an extra hour to get this dough mixed so Tim can scoop it and we can have cookies baked for Simon's party tonight. She met my gaze, her cheeks flushed. A lock of her hair stuck up and her mascara looked a bit smudged, as if she'd been rubbing her eyes. Take a deep breath, Rachel, I said. A deep breath? We will get it all done. Rachel shook her head and then glanced at Meg. Have you heard curse words before? Meg giggled. Yes. Well, you still might want to cover your ears because I'm about to say one. Meg unwrapped the next pound square of butter. My mom says bad words. A lot. She said she used to be a nice person before she had kids. Rachel nodded. And it's not that she doesn't love you. It's not that I don't love my girls. But I'm about to lose my... Well, you know what, mind. Meg giggled. I saw the signs of my sister's impending breakdown. Rachel, what can I do? I said. Put me to work. She turned on the mixer, and the large paddles creamed the butter. Meg, when it's creamy, then drop in another chunk of butter, one at a time. She nodded. Okay. Rachel wiped her hands on her apron and motioned me toward a rack filled with trays of cookies. These need to be iced, and these need to be dunked in the chocolate, and they all need to be set back on the tray to dry. I can do that. You must be precise. Sloppy does not work. I grinned. I will be careful. I promise. When it comes to the numbers, you are on track, Daisy. What your mind can wander when you ice, I can't have that. I patted her on the shoulder. You are such a bossy little girl. I'm so proud. A half-smile tugged the edge of her lips. Let's get to work. Margaret arrived back at the shop three hours later with the girls, just as we were putting the last of the cookies on the trays. The girls were covered in dirt. Chocolate ice cream stained their clean T-shirts. Their shoes were untied, and Annie was missing a sock. Margaret looked as she always did, 
a bit disheveled but unworried as she slurped the last of a milkshake from a paper cup. Hola, she said. The girls ran up to their mom, their dirty faces beaming. They talked so fast and quick, no one could understand them. Rachel absently plucked a leaf from Anna's hair and smoothed out Ellie's bangs. A year ago, if the girls had marched in here this unkempt, Rachel would have scurried them to the showers and cleaned them right up. Now, she seemed in no rush to reestablish perfection. Ellie's eyes widened. And then we went to the park, and Aunt Margaret bought us ice cream. And then, Anna said, we ate cotton candy and took our shoes off in the park. Ellie smirked and in a stage whisper said, And then Aunt Margaret told a guy to go to hell. And she showed him her finger. Anna held up her index finger. No, Ellie said. It was this finger. She held up her middle finger. Margaret's eyes widened, and she moved to explain when Rachel said, My goodness, it sounds like you had a great day. Rachel slowly lowered Anna's index and Ellie's middle fingers. Can we go with Aunt Margaret again? Ellie said. She said she'd take us swimming, Anna hurried to add. Rachel nodded. Sure. Sounds good. Maybe you could hang out with Aunt Margaret a little longer today. Maybe she could give you dinner while Aunt Daisy and I deliver these cookies. Margaret shrugged. Sure, I can feed the munchkins, and I can hose them off, if you like, and toss them into bed. Rachel brushed a lock of hair from her eyes. Sounds like a plan. Margaret glanced at me. She's not freaking out about the girls being such a mess. I shrugged. I think we broke her. Rachel lifted a tray of cookies. I'll freak out later. Right now, we need to move it. I glanced at the clock. We had a half hour, just enough time. Fifteen minutes later, the bakery van sputtered and stopped in the loading dock of Simon's sleek office building on Duke Street. I snagged a delivery cart from the loading dock and pushed it down the ramp to the van, and we carefully loaded the cookies onto the cart. Rachel glanced up at me. This is a hell of a way to earn a living. Laughter bubbled in me as I hefted a tray. You are telling me. Rachel's eyes didn't reflect humor. No, really. There must be an easier way. Fatigue added brittleness to her tone. If I knew it, I'd do it. We pushed the cookie cart up the ramp to the elevators, and I pressed the button. Seriously, Rachel said. My kids look like vagrants and I don't have time to clean them up. We've been busting our asses the last ten days, and we're how many thousands behind? I don't know. I did, but Rachel didn't need a blow-by-blow -blow of our finances. And the girls are happy, Rachel. That's all that matters. Tears pooled in her eyes. But they weren't having fun with me. In the last two weeks, they've had more fun than they've had in their entire lives and I wasn't there for any of it. I was working. The last two weeks have been a little crazy, and the exception to the rule. The doors dinged open, and we pushed the cart into the elevator. I'm really afraid it's always going to be this way. I was back to work when they were three weeks old. We had a big order, and Mike needed me. When they turned two, I had to get up early to decorate a wedding cake. I didn't have time to ice their birthday cake. They start first grade in six weeks, and I honestly can't tell you where the time has gone. I wanted to assure her there'd be no more missed special days, but I couldn't. You've said it yourself. The bakery takes a chunk out of your life. Anger brightened her blue eyes. Yeah, well, what if I don't want to do it anymore? Shit. Rachel was talking about abandoning the ship. Where she'd go, I didn't know, and I doubted she did either. 
but I did know if she bailed, I couldn't hold it together. And if the bakery went under, where would the kid and me go? And what if I did manage to keep her on board? Did I want her life? Did I want to leave a three-week-old infant to return to work? I glanced in the mirror doors of the elevator and studied my reflection. My hair stuck up, and the buttons on my chef jacket were fastened one loop off. I quickly refastened the jacket and smoothed down my hair. I did my best to keep the panic out of my voice. Let's get through tonight, and then we'll talk. I'll figure it out. She nodded, and for a moment we were both silent. Elevator music hummed above our heads. I had two more orders for frozen dough yesterday, she said as an afterthought. Really? For chocolate chip cookie dough. Seems Mrs. Abley has been talking about us. How much did you charge them? Twenty-five dollars for three dozen. And if we'd baked them, we'd have made thirty-two dollars. But half the labor and electricity. I did quick calculations. The profit is slightly higher when we sell the dough. That's what I thought, but didn't have time to crunch numbers. Have you thought about being more of a mail-order business? Rachel said. We could actually be open for business Friday and Saturday, and the rest of the week we make and sell dough. The idea was different. Our business model would change radically. But the idea had merit. I'm surprised I didn't think of it. Rachel straightened her shoulders as if a little bit of the weight lifted. You've been distracted. I'm going to have to really run the numbers, Rachel. It's not a change we can make overnight. She brushed a lock of hair from her eyes. I don't need overnight, as long as I know there might be a light at the end of the tunnel. Understood. We need to think differently, Daisy. Oh, I'm totally hearing you. I am. And I was. My mind was already spinning in a dozen different directions. The doors opened to Davenport developers, and a very thin and sleek receptionist watched as we pushed the cart into the reception area. I grinned. The Union Street Bakery order has arrived. The receptionist plucked eyebrows raised. In the conference room. We'd delivered here before and knew the drill. As we made our way over the carpeted hallway past the slick development pictures on the walls, an odd sense of disconnect settled on my shoulders. Six months ago, I'd have sold my soul to be readmitted to this sterile corporate world. I liked the air-conditioned air, the windows that did not open and offered a distant view of the Potomac and the distance from life. But as we unloaded the vibrant, rich cookies onto the polished mahogany conference table, I wasn't so sure this was for me anymore. I liked the idea of my kids stumbling into the bakery with Aunt Margaret covered in dirt and ice cream. I liked calling the shots and knowing the risk I took with the business was on me and not some guy at corporate. I liked having my family close. Odd that Rachel would pull away from the business as I moved closer to it. But maybe I could figure a solution workable for us both. Simon appeared in the doorway, as he did before every corporate event we'd catered to inspect what had been delivered. He wore a neatly tailored charcoal gray suit, white shirt, and gold cufflinks. Rachel kept her gaze on the cookies, but I could see her hands now trembled a little, and a faint blush colored her cheeks. Smiling, I turned to Simon, ready to run interference. Simon, thank you again for using Union Street Bakery. His gaze shifted from Rachel's bent head to me, and he smiled. Your work is always a big hit with our employees. We aim to please. Rachel straightened, turned, and faced Simon. She held out her hand and moved to shake his. Thank you for your business. He took her hand. Instead of speaking, he simply stared at her. I'd been around enough to know when a man craved a woman— not merely liked, but craved a woman. Blushing myself, I quickly rearranged already perfect cookies. 
Simon, Rachel said, we got off on a bad foot the last time. I stiffened. Was Rachel taking the bull by the horns? She wasn't scurrying for cover? Crap. I'd seen it all. He didn't smile, but his eyes softened. Instead of answering, he remained quiet. A good negotiator didn't tip his hand, especially when the stakes were high. I'm so far out of practice when it comes to life outside of work or motherhood. I was out of my depth, and I wasn't very entertaining. She drew in a breath. If you're interested, I'd like to take you out to dinner. His head cocked a fraction. I'd done my share of negotiations, and I knew a win when I saw it. Rachel had Simon. Slowly, he nodded. What do you propose? He was going to make her work for it, which told me he really liked my sister. He was a guy who didn't like sweets, and yet had placed six orders with the bakery in the last six months. His employees lost work time and complained about getting fat, and still he ordered baked goods from the Union Street Bakery. From Rachel. Rachel moistened her lips. We've our grand opening on Saturday, so I'm booked solid until then. But maybe Saturday after next. There's an art show in town, and we close at noon. Silent. He seemed to consider her offer, and then slowly he nodded. Sounds intriguing. I'll pick you up, she offered. I pictured Rachel pulling up in front of Simon's sleek building in the Union Street bakery van, or worse, in her old Toyota. That was a scene I'd pay money to see. I'll pick you up, he countered, as if the image skittered through his mind. I don't mind driving, really, Rachel said. A smile tugged at the edge of his lips, as if he seemed to like this assertive version of Rachel. I can manage the drive. She nodded, as if she finally remembered to breathe. Good. Would two o'clock work? It does. I felt like the fairy godmother in Cinderella. Forgetting she was plump and gray, I focused on her sparkly blue dress, which I'd always envied as a kid. When the awkward silence settled between the two, I said, Rachel, we have a bakery to fill? Right. She smiled at Simon. See you next week. I look forward to it. Neither one of us said a word as we left the offices and rode the elevators to the first floor. It wasn't until we were in the van and I fired up the engine that I grinned and said, Who's the brazen hussy now? Her eyes widened with shock. Was I? I laughed as we pulled onto Duke Street. No, you were not. I'm teasing. Really? Really. Shaking my head, I check the rearview mirror for traffic. I think old Simon is shyer than you are. She pressed her palms to her rosy cheeks. I don't think so. He is so in control. It doesn't take a lot to stay in control. It takes balls to put yourself in the game when there are a million reasons not to. She flopped back against the seat. I can't believe I asked him out. I mean, I've been thinking about it, but I never thought the words would come out of my mouth. And then I was asking him out. You did it. She rolled her head to me. What am I going to wear? We are not going to spend the week obsessing over this date, Rachel. We are not. Yeah, I know. She was silent for a moment. Should I wear the blue dress or the green one with the flippy skirt? Grinning, I shifted gears as we moved through a light and then turned the corner that took us to Union Street. So, you are also dating Jean-Paul? Her eyes widened. No. At least I don't think so. Shaking my head, I laughed. There is no law that says you can't date two men. Then maybe I will. You are a wanton woman, Rachel. She smiled, satisfied. 
When we arrived at the bakery, Margaret was waiting for us in the kitchen. Her duffel bag packed, and at her feet, she nibbled on a sugar cookie. Jean-Paul was mixing a batch of dough. He glanced up at us, as if annoyed by the interruption, and then went back to his dough. Is something wrong with the girls? Rachel said, searching for the kids. What? The girls. Where are they? She articulated each word. Oh, with Mom. Zonked out. I ran them ragged. She sounded very pleased with herself. What's up? I nodded to the bag. Bracelets jangled as she swept her hand through her curly, wild hair. Just got a call from the site. I have dead guys waiting for me. The rain has cleared, and the dig resumes tomorrow. As sorry as I was to see her go, I recognized the excitement humming in her body. That is great. She lifted her bag, her bracelets jangling as she hefted the strap on her shoulder. By the way, I found him. Found who? I asked. Joey Luddenberg. At first the name did not register. And he is one of your dead guys? No. He's one of your guys. Joey was mentioned on the burial form as Walter's next of kin. He was in Walter's platoon. He served with him. Excitement buzzed. Is he dead? No. Joey is very much alive. I couldn't believe this bit of news. And he knew Walter? She nodded. He did. And I'll bet you a dollar he knew Jenna. Energy rushed through my body. Where does he live? Satisfaction warmed her gaze. Would you believe about twenty minutes from here? When can we see him? She dug a crumpled piece of paper from her pocket and handed it to me. It will have to be you. I'm back at St. Mary's. Here's the address. I called and told him he could expect you. Good luck. You called? Sure. This is a lead, and the sooner you see him, the better. He is in his nineties. I had the sense of invisible hands pushing me forward. Okay. You're going? Rachel said. It's not very practical, I said. The work's going to be insane this week. Rachel shrugged. We'll live. I searched her face. I won't be gone more than a couple of hours. I know. Just go. She glanced at Margaret. And happy digging to you. Margaret all but shivered with excitement. I'm hearing there are all kinds of goodies waiting for us. I glanced at the scrawled address and name. Do I call this guy? He's expecting you. I spoke to the nursing home, and they said you could visit any time tomorrow afternoon. I barely had time to breathe, and now I had to slip away to chase the mist. Thanks, Margaret. You've worked a miracle. I know, and you're welcome. She hugged Rachel and then me. Good luck. Joey Luddenberg. Was this guy him? Do you think he'll remember... Your guess is as good as mine, but he'll have more answers than you have now. Thank you.
Chapter 19 Friday, 1 p.m. One day until grand reopening. Income lost, $6,000, including $1,500 for the wine. The bakery buzzed with activity by lunch. Rachel was icing cupcakes, the kids were mixing and scooping cookies, and Jean-Paul was baking his bread. We were all moving at a breakneck pace, and we were going to make our deadline of tomorrow morning. But I worried how long we could maintain this pace. Dad had kept it all going for forty years. His father had worked for thirty years. Owning this place was a way of life. And Rachel had said she wasn't sure if this was the life she wanted anymore. I'd promised I'd find another way for us to earn a living, and I would. I just didn't have the answers yet. I'd been trying all week to find time to see Joey, but no time had opened up. And each night when I lay my head on the pillow, exhausted, I felt Jenna standing close, prodding me. So today, when a small opening of time had presented itself, I'd grabbed it. Now as I cut through city traffic toward the Beltway, my mind was not on the bakery, but on the old man who'd served with Walter during World War II. He'd been one of the last people on the planet to see Walter alive, and he very well had heard first-hand information about Jenna. I hurried along the Beltway, the speedometer pushing well past the speed limit. I'd been in charge of cleaning the display cases. Though they were perfect and ready for Rachel's baked goods, the task had taken longer than I'd expected, and I'd been late pushing away from the bakery. Now I was trying to make up time. I took the exit for I-95 South and followed the interstate to the Woodbridge exit. Glancing at Margaret's handwritten notes, I struggled with her scrawl. Damn it, Margaret. Did you write these out with your toes? Hoping the last abbreviation really meant left, I took a left at the third stoplight off Route 1. Three miles later, several U-turns to correct overshooting, and a handful of curses aimed at Margaret's directions, I found the entrance to Sandy Hill Estates. It was a retirement community that honestly wasn't my idea of a dream destination. The sign was missing a brick on the top, and the S in Sandy had snapped at the bottom tip. However, the grass was cut very short in a military, utilitarian way, suggesting efficiency more than curb appeal. I found the main registration sign and parked by a blue awning in the visitor spot. As I grabbed Jenna's trinkets and headed toward the main double doors, I really had to question my sanity. My bakery staff was working like crazy, and I was here, chasing the destiny of a man who died over half a century ago. This quest made no sense, and yet it didn't occur to me to turn back. Inside, my nose wrinkled at the thick scent of antiseptic and metal. It smelled of old people, not dirty or foul, but stale, as if life had been sucked out of the air. Mere feet inside the front door, I followed welcome signs and found the receptionist. She was as simple and unassuming as the desk she sat behind. Dirty blonde hair tied at the nape of her neck accentuated a round face and wide-set eyes. No makeup and a pale yellow shirt robbed her of any features. She glanced up over half-glasses at me. May I help you? Thankfully, her voice wasn't as bland as her face. I'm Daisy McRae. I have an appointment with Joey Luddenberg at two. I was told that was a good time to see him. He's apparently finished his nap and had lunch by now. The woman rose, a pale yellow smock hugged full curbs. You called Monday? Yes. Well, Margaret called, but I didn't want to get into the whole story. And then this morning. Her gaze skimmed over my face, my Union Street Bakery t-shirt, and my rounded belly. Are you family? No, but I knew someone that knew him years ago, and I thought we could talk. 
To get into an explanation of why I needed to see Joey would surely have sunk my chances with this woman. He's in his room. He was a little surprised when someone called asking for him. My fingernails scraped at the bakery box in my hands. Two weeks ago, I'd never have pictured myself here either. She squared her shoulders and pursed her lips. No one ever pictures themselves here, dear. Not a dream location. The bite under her tone had me reassessing her. I sensed steel under the soft exterior. Vivid blue eyes glanced at the box in my hands. What's that? Cookies. I own the Union Street Bakery. I thought Mr. Luddenberg would like a cookie. She arched a brow. I'll have to ask our resident dietitian if he can have a cookie. Many of our guests are on strict diets. I lifted the lid to the Union Street Bakery box, knowing Rachel's cookies could soften the hardest of souls. Would you like a cookie or two? As if pulled by an invisible string, her gaze dropped to the box. The harshness softened, and the hint of a smile tugged at the edge of her mouth. Maybe one or two. I wasn't above using cookies to get what I wanted. Our chocolate chip is made with real chocolate we hand chop, and our sugar cookies are made with the best butter. The maple is our newest cookie. We use real maple syrup. She moistened her lips. Hard to decide. Take one of each. The devil would have been proud of my ability to tempt. She plucked two cookies from the box and bit into the chocolate chip. My God! A conspirator's smile curled the edges of my lips. I know. Heaven. Have one more. She took a maple. Mr. Luddenberg is this way. As I followed her along the very industrial hallway, I wondered why anyone would want to be on a strict diet here. So sugar and fat killed you a little early. There were worse ways to go than death by cupcake. The sunroom was located at the end of the hall, and thankfully really was sunny. It appeared to have been a recent addition, made of glass walls with a sliding glass door leading out onto a patio. The backyard of the home was small and rimmed by a privacy fence separating the property from a housing development butting up to the property line. However, a collection of lush green potted plants softened the hard edges of the fence. The room's soft wall colors created a cheery look and eased the hum of emptiness I'd sensed when I first arrived. If I lived in this facility, I think I'd spend as much time as I could in the sunniest spots of this room. Where is everyone? I said. Seems it would be full of folks enjoying the sunshine. It's a little hot for many this time of day. We have a lot out here in the morning and evening, but not so much about this time. Joey is our exception. He's not fond of crowds. I like Joey already. I'll go get him. She held up the cookies. And thanks for these. My pleasure. She left me standing alone in the sunroom, and I stared at the marigolds, begonias, and pansies contained in the pots. Beyond the fence, I could see the rooftops of several houses, and through an open window heard the laughter of young children. I can push myself. The old man's voice was hoarse and raspy, but he had fired each word like a bullet. I turned to see the receptionist wheel in a man who sat hunched in a chair. His white hair was all but gone, and what remained was cut in a signature Marine's high and tight. Gnarled hands curled inward with arthritis, but he wore a white dress shirt, creased khaki pants, and tennis shoes secured with crisp bows. She leaned closer to his ear. Chief, this is your visitor. Her name is Daisy McCrae. He lifted a watery gaze to me. He studied me a beat before his eyes narrowed. I don't know a Daisy McCrae. 
She's not one of those damn social workers, is she? No, Chief. She's not a social worker. She's here to talk to you about someone you know. All the people I know are dead. My admiration for this crusty old guy grew with each salty glance he tossed my way. He wasn't taking old age lying down. I hoped I barreled into old age kicking and screaming until I skidded into the grave. Mr. Luddenberg, I said. I'm trying to find out about a man who served with you during World War II. You both fought in the Battle of Saipan in June of 1944. He died in July of the same year. Joey's eyes narrowed, and he seemed to turn inward, as if recalling the faces of too many men he'd lost during the battle. That was seventy years ago. There were a lot of good boys that died. And I'm sorry to say I don't remember all the names. I'd been lucky with Sarah Morgan's sharp memory. The chances of me hitting pay dirt twice appeared slim. Yes, sir. I understand. But I hoped if I told you a name it might jog your memory. I moved closer to him and pulled out my paltry collection of pictures. You smell like cinnamon. He lifted his gaze and really met mine for the first time. I was struck by how clear and bright his eyes were. Smiling, I took a seat beside him. I own a bakery. He arched a brow. Did you bring me a cookie? He nodded to the receptionist. She had cookies in her hand. I brought cookies. But the receptionist said you were on a special diet? I'm ninety-five years old, and she cares about me eating sweets. Humor underscored the words. Sooner rather than later I'm gonna die. Rather it be a cookie that kills me. Grinning, I opened the box. Chocolate chip, sugar, or maple? Pick your poison. He sniffed. Grab me a sugar cookie. I chose the most perfect one, and handed it to him. He took a bite, and then a second before nodding. What did you say your name was? Daisy McCray. McCray? The name teased a memory. I own the Union Street Bakery. He cocked his head. Union Street? In Alexandria? That's right. He waved a gnarled finger at my pictures. What you got there? Pictures of three people taken in front of the Union Street Bakery in 1944. I know the woman's name is Jenna, and one of the men is Walter. His brow furrowed, and his head cocked a little as if he didn't trust his hearing. You got a picture of Jenna? Yes, sir. We were knocking out a wall at the bakery, and I found Jenna's recipe box. I found her in the bakery records. This picture was in her file. I handed it over to him, and with a trembling hand he accepted it. For a long moment he didn't look. Finally he lowered his gaze, and through thick glasses he studied the picture. His hands trembled a little as he traced a bent finger over Jenna's face. He'd been transported back to another place long ago. Do you remember them? I said gently. Yeah. His voice, thick with emotion, sounded like rough gravel. He cleared his throat. I met Jenna at the USO dances. She was a peach. And I was half in love with her after that first dance we shared. When I headed out here today, I'd truly believed I was on a fool's errand. I'd never expected him to remember. But I'd underestimated Sarah as well. You said you met her at a USO dance? Yep. A local church sponsored it the first and third Fridays of the month. She was one of the local girls who came to dance with us guys and serve us cookies and punch. Jenna and me, we danced to Glenn Miller's Old Black Magic. I must have stepped on her feet a dozen times, but she 
didn't seem to mind none. He pointed at the picture. The man on the right is Walter. The man on the left is me. You? I studied the picture, and then him. Seventy years had erased most of the resemblances. The only remaining likeness lingered in his eyes. Mr. Luddenberg's eyes were the same as the man's in the picture. Walter and I took the train up from Quantico a couple of times to Alexandria for USO dances. We were both artillery. We both knew we were headed to the Pacific and decided the few weeks we had left stateside, we'd have us a little fun. At the first USO dance, we met Jenna. He traced her face with his finger. I got the first dance, but then Walter cut in. He'd been watching us dance. I think he also loved her from the first time he laid eyes on her. Once he had her in his arms, I never had a chance with her. He closed his eyes, and again silence slipped around him, cocooning him from the present-day world. Did he hear the big band music playing from that long-ago USO party? Did he smell the scent of cinnamon lingering on Jenna's skin, or the scratch of his uniform against his skin? I shifted. She worked for the Union Street Bakery, and I hear she was from Western Virginia. He cocked his head, and I knew he was rifling through old memories to find the answer. Such a small nugget of information. It would be so easy for it to get lost in time and a failing memory. Winchester. Winchester? She talked to me about her hometown when we danced, but I didn't pay much attention to what she said. She felt good in my arms, and I liked holding her. That's all I noticed. Later, I'd think back on the dance and scrounge whatever details I could. A smile twitched the edge of his lips, and I had a very brief glimpse into the man he'd been. Mr. Luddenberg, you were a player, a man about town, I said. His grin widened. I was one of the best. I treated the ladies right, and they treated me good. Was Walter a ladies' man? He chuckled. No. He was a regular Joe. Like I said, it took him all night to get the courage to dance with Jenna. But when he did, she had him hook, line, and sinker. He never stopped talking about her. That's how I remember so much about her. He spent the next couple of weeks talking about her. When did you meet? First dance was in January, 1944. Cold as hell, snowy. In fact, the weather was so bad a lot of the girls didn't come to the dance. Jenna dated Walter after the dance? I knew Jenna was dating someone about that time. She gave birth eleven months later in December. They was like two peas in a pod. Every second he wasn't drilling, he was with her. After a couple of weeks, he talked about marrying her. They never did marry, did they? Was planning to, but we got shipped out faster than we thought. He couldn't get up to Alexandria for a proper goodbye, but had to call her on the phone. He kept telling her he loved her, and he'd be back for her and marry her proper in a church. He wrote to Jenna often. He was always writing that gal. So in love it was enough to curdle your stomach. I kidded him about it a lot, but he didn't care. No, he was going to write his girl. Did she write him back? She surely did. As faithful as he was. When the war turned rough for us, her letters kept him going. Hell, they kept me going. See, he'd read them out loud. Another smile appeared. Her letters smelled like cinnamon. Like you. Can't get away from it when you work in a bakery. 
It's nice. Wholesome. He dropped his gaze to the picture, and again I sensed I'd lost him. He closed his eyes, and I wasn't sure if he nodded off or was giving himself over to the memories. Finally, he sucked in a breath and opened his eyes. Stared at me as if I'd intruded into a world where I didn't belong. You were on the invasion team at Saipan? He cleared his throat. We were. We knew it was going to be a meat grinder. We weren't the first off the boats, but close to it. Fighting got bad. Real bad. But we made it that first day. And then, as we moved inland, the fighting got worse. I lost Walter in the chaos. When the fighting settled, I went looking for him. Found him. Shot up bad. A miracle he was alive. Joey didn't supply the details of Walter's injuries, but I'd remembered the autopsy report. Almost sorry he wasn't killed right off. Would have been kinder. Death took a while. But he never regained consciousness. I couldn't imagine what it must have been like to find him so badly mutilated. I'm sorry. Tears welled in the old man's eyes, and he didn't seem to notice or care that they streamed over his face. I suppose, at his age, seeing all he'd seen, tears didn't matter. What happened to you after he was injured? I kept on going. Kept on fighting. I wanted to go visit him and sit at his bedside, but I couldn't. And when he died, I wanted to give up. Walter was like a brother to me. But there were other kids, Marines, who needed me. And I kept fighting until mid-July when the Japs surrendered. His jaw stiffened as he raised it a fraction. The worst days of my life. There were so many other guys who died, like Walter. So many of them didn't deserve to be blown to bits or torn in two by mortars. Every time I lost one, it felt like Walter all over again. I'm so sorry, Chief. He shrugged. A job had to be done. Were you injured? Shot in the arm. Did they pull you out of the fighting? Hell no. They tried, but I wouldn't let them. My buddies had died on that ground, and I wasn't going to pussy out and go home. Stayed until the final surrender. No missing the deep pride simmering below the words. Did you ever hear from Jenna? I wrote to her first chance I could. I wanted her to have Walter's dog tags. I sent those along. The Marines held his personal belongings for family. There'd have been lots of red tape getting his property sent to a woman not his kin or wife. But I knew a guy who knew a guy. We got it put on the forms she was his wife, so his body was shipped back to Alexandria. She wrote me back, thanked me for sending him home. She said she'd buried him proper in the Alexandria Cemetery. When was that? I got her letter in late December. She'd have been ready to deliver by then. Silent, I let him talk. He shook his head. I went back to Alexandria after the war to find her. I wanted to return the letters she'd written to Walter. I went by the bakery, but they wouldn't tell me about her. Said she was gone. It took me a good two days to find Walter's spot at the cemetery. When I was leaving, I saw another new headstone. It was hers. I bawled like a baby. Sadness burned sharp in his gaze, as if this had happened to him yesterday and not seventy years ago. What happened to her? No one would tell me. She died on December 31, 1944, giving birth. He blinked and shook his head as if the news struck like a fresh blow. He stared at the cookie, looking at it as if he imagined Jenna had given it to him. There was a time when I feared dying. 
figured it was the worst thing. But it's not the worst thing. He'd been a warrior, a man who loved women. And now here he sat, alone in an old folks' home, with a controlling receptionist telling him he couldn't eat cookies. I'd never feared death or worried about it. That might have been because I'm young. Might have been because deep in my soul I didn't think I had much to lose. Terry had left me, and I didn't think I mattered. But now, with the kid on the way, I had an anchor in this world. For my child, I'd move mountains. I feared losing her more than dying. So... What happened to Walter's kid? Joey asked. I don't know. The newspaper said he'd been sick when he was born, but I never found a grave near Jenna's. She was from Winchester. Her kin owned an apple farm. I remember she told Walter she'd moved to Alexandria because the apple crop had gone bad that year. Killed by a frost and she needed to make money. She and her father also got into some kind of fight, but she never said over what. An apple farm in Winchester. Last name Davis. That'll narrow the search. Why are you looking into this? She ain't your kin. I struggled to put into words what I didn't really understand myself. Maybe I feel for a woman alone with a baby on the way. She had to have been scared. He straightened his shoulders. Wheel me back to my room. What? Wheel me back. I got something to give you. I glanced around for the nurse, and seeing no one who said I couldn't, I moved behind his chair. The old lady gonna give us a hard time? I bet she might. But I ain't worried about it. He cackled. What the hell could she do to me? I got two feet in the grave. I unlocked the brake on his wheelchair and turned him around. He sat a little straighter, holding Jenna's picture in his hand, as if he were on a mission. I pushed him out of the sun porch and along a long, cream-colored hallway smelling of bleach and flowers to a room at the very end. As I tried to turn him into the room, I bumped the edge of the wheelchair on the wall. "'Women can't drive worth a damn,' he grumbled. Hey, don't blame me. I've never driven one of these contraptions before. He waggled his finger over his shoulder. Back up and try again. A glance behind, and I pulled the wheelchair back. I'm doing it. Well, you are taking forever. I'll get you there. When? I'm damn old if you haven't noticed. I could be dead by the time you figure out this door. Shut your yap. He grunted and went silent, but I didn't sense any annoyance. This was an adventure for him, and I treated him like a man and not a potted plant to be shuffled around. Finally, I got the angle right and pushed him into his room. It was a very simple room with a hospital bed, dark curtains kept drawn, and a chewed-up lazy boy. No books on the small nightstand by the bed, no extra sundries on the bureau, no pictures on the wall. I had the sense he hated this place so much he wasn't giving it the satisfaction of any kind of decoration. He pointed toward the nightstand. Push me over there. I wheeled him the remaining feet, and he pulled open the drawer. He removed a well-worn Bible from the nightstand and then closed the drawer. This was Walter's Bible. It never made it into his effects because I'd borrowed it the day before we landed on Saipan. I'd put it in my footlocker. My hope was always to give the Bible to Jenna. That's one of the reasons I went back to Alexandria. To give it to her. And when she was gone, I didn't know what to do with it. So I kept it. Of all the death, sadness, and glory he'd witnessed in his life, his had been a rich, full life and he'd saved scant few items, including a change of clothes which hung in the closet and the Bible. I didn't speak, because he really had so little time, and I sensed he'd had a lot to say. He lifted his chin a fraction. 
I wanted to be buried with it. That was the only request I had. But now it don't seem right. I studied the cracked, worn leather and the embossed gold cross. You should keep it. You've guarded it all these years. Seems right you'd keep it. He shook his head as his jaw tightened with determination. No. I don't want it with me no more. I want you to have it. Leaning back, I held up my hands. Chief, I cannot take your Bible. He pushed it toward me. You can take it. And you will. Seeing as you might find Jenna and Walter's baby, you need to have it so you can give it to him. Worry prickled my skin. What if I don't find him? Chief cocked his head, eyeing me as if I were a new recruit. You don't strike me as a quitter. If that kid is out there, you'll find him. That kid will be in his late sixties now. What if he's also passed from old age? I don't believe you'd be here if he were. Jenna wouldn't have sent you. She wants you to find him. Wants him to know about his father. How do you know Jenna sent me? Can't believe death would get in that gal's way. She went after what she wanted. What if he didn't know he'd been adopted? That happened back in the day more often than people realized. Babies were taken in and folded into families without a word ever spoken again about their pasts. Take the Bible and find that kid. Do my heart glad to know I kept Walter's Bible safe for his kid all these years. Do my heart glad. When I returned to the bakery, Rachel was standing behind the display case with Meg and Tim. I checked my watch and realized it was after six. So how did it go? Rachel nodded. I think we are going to make it. I think we will open tomorrow. Though we won't have a full menu. We won't shame ourselves. It's not the end of the world. Less might be more in our case. Rachel rested her hands on her hips. I know we only have the six basic cookies, but I think you're right. Chocolate chip, sugar, peanut butter, pecan, elephant ears, and maple are our best sellers, and I didn't have the energy to bake the rest. I think the basics are fine. Right now we really should stick to what we know. I also got a call from Mrs. Cranston. She heard about the cookie dough and wants to buy enough to make five dozen. She also mentioned her daughter's school is having a fundraiser, and they sell dough to raise money for the school. She thought our dough would be a big draw. Really? I told her we could talk to her on Monday. We needed to get through tomorrow and the reopening. That'll also give you time to crunch the numbers. I grinned. Rachel, you sound like a grown-up businesswoman. She nodded. Maybe not completely grown-up, but I'm getting there. I looked at Meg. So, how was your first real day of baking? Sweet. Tim and I loved it. Where is Tim? He's in the back, scooping the last of the cookie dough to go into the oven. Meg untied her apron. What time do you want me back in the morning? Eight o'clock, Rachel said. She nodded. I'll grab Tim and we'll head out. If we hurry, we can catch the bus. Thanks, Meg, I said. No, thank you. This is totally cool. She vanished into the back and I was left shaking my head. She thinks this is totally cool. That used to be me, Rachel said. It will be again. Rachel shook her head. I'm pretty sure that ship has sailed. Never say never. I pressed my hands into the small of my back and stretched out the kinks. So, they did well? Better to shift to what seemed like a happier topic. The kid is strong. He can operate the scooper for hours and not miss a beat. She smiled. Though I learned very quickly not to leave him alone too long. 
I left him for an hour and came back to fifteen pans full of perfectly scooped cookies. I'd forgotten to tell him to stop at five. I winced, dollar signs dancing in my head as I calculated the waste. You cover them with foil? Yeah, yeah, no real problem, no loss, only a word to the wise. Nodding, I couldn't stifle a grin. Meg and his mom said to be specific with him. Oh, I will be very specific going forward. She whisked a stray curl from her face. So, how did your trip go? I filled her in and told her about the chief. This is Walter's Bible. He's been holding it all these years. Rachel smoothed her hand over the book. That is amazing. We never would have found him if not for Jenna's recipe box. Yeah, she seems to be our little guiding light. Rachel cocked her head. You look tired. My back ached and my feet throbbed as if they'd grown five sizes. I tell you, this kid is kicking my ass. Rachel smiled. Wait until she's born. She's only just getting started. I grimaced. Thanks. She held up her hands in mock surrender. Just keeping it real. I yawned. What can I do for tomorrow? Your winery awaits its liquor license, but the front of the shop will be stocked and ready to go. I'm going to take a nap, and then I'll finish up the wine shop. You really don't have to, Rachel said. It's a bit of a soft opening, and we can't push the wines until we get our license in a couple of weeks. We'll have good traffic tomorrow, and I don't want to miss an opportunity to at least show off our wine room if someone is curious. You think we'll sell that wine? I do. Fat and sugar pair well with wine. You'll see. Chapter 20 Saturday, 7 a.m. Opening day. Income lost, $6,000. Red, white, and blue balloons wafted in a gentle wind as I tied them to a white sandwich board that read, Grand Reopening which we'd borrowed from a shoe store up the street. Nervous energy humming, I flipped the sign on the front door to open and waited for the parade of customers. A half-dozen patrons showed up the first hour, not a grand start by anyone's standards. And so armed with a plate of cookies, I headed out into the street to stir up business. A glance toward Gordon's shop told me he was open, and wanting to stay positive, I turned the other way to greet potential customers. Several times the temptation to turn and look in his direction was so strong, but I held fast. Though several times the hair on the back of my neck rose, and I imagined his gaze on me. Instead of turning, I kept smiling and walking away, unable to endure the sadness vibrating from every muscle in my body. By ten, the trickle of customers had grown stronger and by eleven, we actually had a line in front of the display case. Word had also spread about the frozen dough, and we'd sold four orders. As the cash register dinged with each new purchase, I imagined the debt on our books shrinking. Life was looking up. A little. Finally, at two, I locked the front door and flipped the open sign to closed. Our first day back open had been a hit. We might survive. Rachel grinned. We survived the renovation and the reopening. I told you we would. She laughed. Yeah, you did. I'm smarter than I look. Meg and Tim carried the remaining cookies back behind the swinging doors. They'd been great. Tim had stayed in the back, carefully restocking trays, and Meg had been on the register, smiling brightly at customers while Rachel and I took orders. We'd been a good team today. As Meg reached for an empty tray of sugar cookies, I thought about Joey. On and off all day and most of last night, I'd worried about him alone in his room. I suspected he'd been on his own for a long time, but that didn't make it right. The young man in the picture had been so full of promise. 
and he'd ended up alone in a corner room with no pictures and a crappy view of a privacy fence. After we cleaned the cases and swept the floor, Meg and Tim said their goodbyes, Rachel vanished upstairs, and I boxed up a healthy dose of sugar cookies and headed to see Joey. Saturday traffic on the Beltway was heavy, so it was past three when I parked in front of the retirement home. The receptionist was at her post, but I was ready for her this time. I handed her a box of assorted cookies for her. She beamed and sent me to Joey's room. I found Joey sitting in his room in his well-worn chair, a box resting in his lap. His eyes brightened when he saw me, and he sat a little straighter. I closed the door, reaching in my backpack as I crossed the room to him. I sat on the edge of the bed and pulled out a pink Union Street bakery box. You brought cookies, he said. Not cookies, but Jenna's cookies. I told you we found her recipe box. He took the box and inspected it, as if it were a great treasure. I used to love her cookies. He bit into one and closed his eyes, savoring more than the flavors, but the memories they evoked. I could see him traveling back in time to Old Town Alexandria. He would have been wearing his marine uniform, sporting his cap, and walking with a spring in his step. It's delicious. I made you a couple of dozen and wrapped them in small packages in case you have to hide them from the gatekeeper. His grin turned devilish. She's never admitted to it, but I know she searches my room. She never takes nothing. She just moves my things a little. I'm old, but I know when my stuff has been touched. He'd been a warrior, and he couldn't count on privacy in his own room. We'll hide these all over the room before I leave. It's a date, doll. He offered me a cookie, and I took it. One bite, and I relaxed. Not bad. You couldn't miss one of Jenna's recipes. She had an angel's touch when it came to baking. I glanced at the box in his lap, wanting to ask, but deciding this was his to share, and he would explain when ready. We reopened the bakery today. It was crazy but busy, and busy is good. You're a smart gal. I can see that. And I bet no one can resist you. I laughed. Oh, you'd be surprised. So did you make good money? Not bad. Made about a thousand dollars today, which will put a dent in the debt we racked up while we were closed. I'd not spoken about the debt to anyone. Candid talk about the bakery business stressed out Rachel and Dad, so more and more I kept details to myself. It was good to speak openly. We'll make it work. I hope. Hope ain't part of the equation. It's hard work, elbow grease, and know-how that gets the job done. You're a go-getter, and you don't shy from work, I can tell. You'll make it happen. His confidence bolstered my spirits, and nervous laughter bubbled inside me. I sure hope you are right. There's a lot riding on the bakery. He smoothed his hand over the box. You haven't asked about the box. My gaze flickered quickly over it. I've been waiting for you to tell me. I almost gave it to you yesterday, but then decided to think on it. Parting with the Bible was hard enough. It's in a safe place, and my sister is working to find Jenna's child. She can find anyone. She found you. Through thick glasses, his eyes twinkled. Did she? She's like a ninja historian. She'll find Jenna's family. I nodded. What's in the box, Joey? With a trembling hand, he removed the top. These are Jenna's letters to Walter. A rush of cool air brushed up my spine. What? They was in his effects. They'd meant so much to Walter, and I couldn't let them go. Made me feel like I had them both with me. I figured I'd give them to her in person, like the Bible, but, well, 
You know the rest. Did you read them? I wasn't going to at first. But in the days after Walter's death, I was pretty low. Didn't see much reason to go on, and so I read the first letter. Didn't sit right at first, but then the more I read, the closer they was to me, and the easier it was to pretend she was writing to me. She had a way of speaking that made me feel at home. I read them all except the last. Came after Walter was killed, and it didn't seem right to read what he couldn't. What was she like? The nicest girl, but strong. She worked hard and said one day she wanted to own her own business. His gaze seemed to go out of focus as he seemed to fall back in time. She had a wicked sense of humor, and she loved to dance. He held a yellowed envelope in his hand. Jenna's handwriting, reminiscent of the recipe cards, was bold and clear, and her lines were straight, as if she'd put great care into addressing it. Did she tell Walter about the baby in her letters? Not in the ones I read. But she was always telling him not to worry about her. The folks at the bakery were good to her, and she'd wait for him as long as it took. A half-smile tugged his lips. She was smart not to tell him. He'd have worried. He'd have wanted his baby to have his name. But with thousands of miles between him and Jenna, there was no fixing the problem. She knew that, and that's why she kept quiet. Every time he wrote her, he asked her to marry him. And then he died. He nodded. Walter was like a brother to me. I know he went to his grave kicking and screaming. He wasn't so worried about himself, but Jenna. He shook his head. She was like him. She'd have fought for her life even after losing Walter, for the baby's sake. Would have taken a force of nature to drag her away from this world. I thought of my own baby, and the anguish I would feel if I were forced to leave her behind. I sat straighter, not wanting to travel that dark path. I don't know why she put the recipe box, pitcher, and his dog tags in the wall. Maybe she had a sense something was going to happen. If she left a piece of her and Walter behind, then she figured they'd never be forgotten. He smiled at me. And she was right. How could she have known? Walter said he thought she might have had the sight. She seemed to know when events was going to happen. That could explain the odd energy in the bakery. Jenna hadn't really left. She'd stuck around, waiting. Joey glanced at the letters and then nodded. Seeing as she sent you to me, I think you should have these letters. Rachel had had odd sensations in the bakery while she'd been pregnant. And now I was pregnant, seeing and feeling things always closed to me before. You really think Jenna sent me to you? I know she did. You didn't find me on your own. She sent you. My skin tingled. How can you say that? When you get close to death, the line between the living and the dead thins. You see things. Like Jenna? He grunted and met my gaze direct. It ain't like she strolls in here and we have conversations. No. No, of course not. I smoothed my hand over the letters. Kind of like a whisper? A feeling? He nodded. Yeah. And I feel her presence. Began weeks ago. I wasn't sure why I thought so much about Jenna and Walter, but they've been on my mind. I keep sensing I need to find him. Do you suppose you are that him? No. She liked me well enough, but she loved Walter, and she'd have loved their baby. Knowing Jenna, she'd want you to find her kid. 
I glanced back toward the door, hoping no one was close to hear me. What about Walter? Have you, well, heard a word from him? I could not believe I was having this conversation. He chuckled. That poor slob wasn't much of a talker when he was alive. Great, solid guy. Always a good soldier. Could follow and give orders. But when it came to conversation, he wasn't the best. More of a listener. Jenna was the go-getter. The one that took risks. Knew no strangers. She went her own way, otherwise she'd have lived her life on that apple farm. If we're hearing from anybody, it's gonna be her. The only person alive now to tell the story of Jenna and Walter was Joey. And his days on this earth were very numbered. If I was going to find Jenna's child, I had to hurry. Have you read her letters recently? Not since she died. When I saw her grave, I put them away. Didn't seem right to read them no more. Do you mind if I read them? They might help me find her boy. He nodded. She sent you here to get them. She wants you to find her baby. So you go on and read all you want. I took the box, feeling as if I'd been given a great treasure. I'll take extra good care of these, Joey. A frown furrowed my brow. And if I don't find him, I'll bring the letters back to you. No. Keep them for good. With you, at least, there'll be someone alive to remember them. To remember Walter and Jenna and me. He settled back in his easy chair, as if a great weight had been lifted from his shoulders. He appeared lighter as he nibbled his cookie. So... Can I come see you again? I want to come back. I wouldn't mind a visit. Wouldn't mind it one bit. But I can't promise I'll be here. Where would you go? He winked. Kid, I'm 97. I ain't going to be anywhere for much longer. I laughed. Yeah, but it's not like you're going to die real soon. It's going to be like that, kid. I can go any minute. A deep sadness rose up in me, and I had the sense that I was losing an old friend. I'll be back real soon. You got your bakery to run, and if I ain't lost my touch, you got a kid on the way. You got a full life. And you are a part of it now. His chin trembled a little. That's nice. Real nice. Don't get too attached. I thumbed through the letters, anxious to find a quiet place to read. Too late. He grunted. Now I'm tired, and you gotta go. He didn't sound tired. He sounded energized. But I thought I could stay and visit. Thought we could talk about Jenna and Walter. Nah. I'm not much of a talker. Hell. We covered seventy years' worth of my stored-up thoughts in two conversations. It'll take me another ten years, at least, to come up with more conversation. More laughter bubbled. My dad is like you. Doesn't talk much. Looks like you didn't inherit silence from him. Bet you could talk a man's ears off if you got rolling. Actually, I'm adopted, so I didn't inherit anything from him. Dad and I were wired much the same, but I'd always liken that to luck or chance. He cocked his head. I wasn't adopted, but I was an orphan. Spent my first sixteen years in a home. Behind the faint smile I saw sadness. What happened to your parents? Died, from what I was told. Both caught the fever. Died when I was one or so. I'm sorry. No need to be sorry. The home wasn't so bad, and I got along fine. Then when I had enough, I lied about my age and joined the Marines. I'm guessing that's why Walter and I got on so well. We had each other and the Marines. He'd not been protecting the cherished items of old friends. 
but of his family. They were lucky to have you in their lives. For a moment he pursed his lips, as if he struggled with emotion. He cleared his throat. Nah. I was the lucky one. Fresh tears welled in my eyes. He cleared his throat. Don't you cry, because I don't like a woman's tears. Upsets my day. I sniffed. Sorry. It's the baby's doing. I'm not much of a crier. He looked at me with such tenderness I almost cried. Now, you really do have to beat it. I rose, leaned forward, and kissed him on the cheek. I'll see you soon. He patted my shoulder with his bent hand. Sooner's always better than later with me. The bakery was quiet when I returned. The front end of the shop was clean and ready to receive guests, and the front display case sparkled, waiting for Rachel and Jean-Paul to fill it again. I pushed through the saloon doors and dropped my purse on the counter. As I crossed to go upstairs, there was a fresh loaf of bread. The handwritten note on it read, Daisy, this is for the baby. Eat. J.P. I smiled as I tore a piece of bread and bit into it. The crust was crunchy and the interior soft. A touch of salt brought out the qualities of the wheat, creating a magical blend. The box of letters tucked under my arm, I headed to my new basement office and flipped on the lights. I wouldn't miss running up and down these stairs every day with baked goods. Carrying up bottles of wine was far more preferable than lugging 100-pound sacks of flour and sugar or heavy trays of baked goods. No, I would not miss the old arrangement. In my new basement office, I stared at the receipts piled on my desk. Good to have the paperwork. It meant the bakery was coming back to life. I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was already after eight, but I could squeeze out a little time working. Sitting at the desk, I reviewed receipts that showed we'd had a good day. A good day. Laying the slips of paper down, I leaned back in my chair. Was today good enough? I thought about my earlier conversation with Rachel. She had said she needed a change, that she could no longer keep the pace she'd maintained for the last couple of years. And I also feared, with a baby on the way, I might not be able to balance the life this place required. When I'd first come back to the bakery, I'd been thinking in temporary terms. I thought I'd have this place shipshape by now and be on my way to the next high-powered job. And then the bakery had wormed its way under my skin, proving it was indeed a jealous and selfish master. But I'd expected I could handle the bakery's demands as I had handled so many difficult clients in the financial world. And then Gordon had come waltzing into the bakery, and I thought maybe, just maybe, this wouldn't be such a bad life. No huge paychecks, but satisfaction. Now, with no Gordon and a baby on the way, I wasn't so sure a handful of receipts and satisfaction were going to cut it. I needed more time and money. Suddenly, too tired to work on the accounts, I shut off the lights, leaving the paperwork until tomorrow. Holding the letters close, I climbed the stairs to my room, where I flounced back on my bed and kicked off my shoes and lay very still. My body pulsed with fatigue. Glancing at my feet, I could have sworn they'd grown two sizes since yesterday, and my belly, no longer a letting-yourself-go pouch, was now a full-fledged baby bump. Jenna, how did you do it? I muttered. How did you bury the man you loved and find the strength to bring your baby into the world? By all rights I should have fallen asleep, but thoughts of Jenna's letters to Walter had unwanted energy surging. I didn't need to read letters. I needed to sleep. I needed to block out the world and the worries so I could recharge and find a way to set my sights on tomorrow. But as I glanced at the letters, overwhelming curiosity struck. I swung my legs over the side of the bed and reached for the box of letters. Just one. I'll read just one. 
I thumbed through them and realized Joey had kept them in chronological order, leaving me with the decision of where to begin. I'm one of those people who reads the last page of a book before I buy it. Annoying, I know. Blame it on abandonment and adoption, but I like to know where the path trails before I take it. And so I reached for the last letter. The envelope was yellowed and the paper brittle. Unlike the other envelopes, this one was sealed and had never been opened. I studied the postmark over the stamp. It was dated July 2nd, 1944. July. When this letter had been stamped by the post office, Walter lay critically injured, his body badly mangled. Jenna's pregnancy would have been evident, and she'd have been so afraid. Carefully, I ran my thumbnail under the flap that hadn't been opened in seventy years and pushed it back. The faint scent of cinnamon rose up and greeted me as I peeled back the flap. Joey had said Jenna had always smelled of cinnamon. Removing the letter, the deeply lined folds cracked as I opened the one-page letter to find Jenna's neat script. Without reading a word, I knew she'd taken great care when she'd written this letter. Dearest Walter, It's after two in the morning, and I can't sleep a wink. I've been dreaming about you, about us. That last night you were in town. Remember how we'd walked along the banks of the Potomac, hand in hand, and you'd told me that when you came home we'd marry? I cherish that moment and I hang on to it. I live for the day you return. I've a beautiful secret to share with you. I'd hoped you'd return in time, but now I realize I must take this moment to tell you that I am pregnant with our child. Now please do not worry, because I know how you worry. We are fine. Mr. and Mrs. McRae have been so kind to me, and tell me the baby and I will always have a place here. The baby grows and kicks often. The doctor says the child will arrive in late December or early January. That's a mere six months away. But I confess I cannot wait. I ache to hold my child, our son. Yes, I said son. I am now certain I am going to have a boy. Perhaps I simply want a little version of you for I've often imagined lately you as a little boy. I dare say you were cute. Despite the kindness of Mr. and Mrs. McRae, I've written to my sister Kate and told her about the baby. This is a time for family. She's already promised to smooth the waters between my father and me. She tells me not to worry, and I will take her advice and keep good thoughts. I'm hoping you'll be home by spring, so you and I and our child can enjoy the apple blossoms. There is no lovelier place than the Shenandoah Valley in the spring. Do not worry about us. We will be fine. When you write again, don't send your letter care of the bakery, but to my sister's farm, Kate Davis, Rural Route 10, Winchester, Virginia. I send you all my love and wish you a speedy, safe return. With all my love, Jenna. I sat back on the bed, staring at her neat, clear handwriting. Had she felt his life seeping away on that far-off island as she'd written a letter no one opened? Two o'clock in the morning would have been nine o'clock Pacific time. The fighting remained constant in July on Saipan, and Walter, wherever he lay, would have heard it. I traced Jenna's name with my fingertip. Find him. The feeling rose up in me, and I sensed this wasn't a trick of my mind. It was Jenna. She wanted me to find her son. And now I had an address for her sister Kate. I opened my laptop and typed in Kate Davis Winchester and hit enter. The chance of Kate being in the same location after all these years was slim, but not out of the question. Farms, like bakeries, could stay in families for generations. Several hits popped up. 
Mrs. Kate Davis Simmons of the First Presbyterian Church of Winchester was honored for her service to the church. Mrs. Kate Simmons pays tribute to veterans on Memorial Day. Mrs. Kate Simmons and her oldest son, Walt. Walter. Walt. Chapter 21 Sunday, 8 a.m. One day after grand reopening. Income lost, $5,000. When I pushed out of bed, the sun shone bright in the room. The baby rested heavily on my bladder, and despite the bed's comfort and warmth, I quickly made my way to the bathroom, took care of business, and then jumped into the shower. As I stood under the hot spray, savoring the water beating against my skin, I realized I still wasn't sick to my stomach. I'd become so accustomed to feeling bad, a day or two of feeling good hadn't been enough for me to fully trust I'd turned a corner. The fact that I might really be rejoining the ranks of the living had me feeling hopeful. Opening my eyes, I smoothed my hand over my stomach. It seemed as quickly as the nausea had come, it left. Score one for the home team. Feeling freshened and actually hungry, I toweled off and dressed in my maternity fat pants and a larger size bakery t-shirt. A side profile in the mirror had me wincing. I wouldn't be making the best dressed list anywhere today. In the kitchen I found a coffee pot gurgling, and it smelled surprisingly good. I poured a cup as Rachel pushed through the doors. Morning, she said. Her face glowed with a pink hue, and her smile looked bright and natural. You look chipper. I pulled out the flour, sugar, and maple syrup and lined them up on the counter. The girls and I are headed to the park. It's an all-girl day of fun. Want to join us? No. You enjoy your girls all by yourself. You three deserve a fun day. She beamed. I can't wait. I poured a cup for her, and I sweetened it with sugar and milk. When I'd lived in Washington, I'd given up sugar and milk in my coffee, in lieu of counting calories, but seeing I was officially in fat pants, I decided to treat myself with milk and sugar. The coffee tasted smooth, and after weeks of not being able to stomach it, it tasted really, really good. So what are you going to do today? And please don't say work, she said. Baking? Jenna's maple cookies. Why? I'm taking them as a treat. I've several dozen wrapped up in a bin from yesterday. I know. I wanted to bake these. Why do you need the cookies? Joey gave me the letters Jenna had written to Walter. Her eyebrows rose. Letters? Love letters. Have you read them? Only the last. She smiled. You always did like knowing the ending. I went to the refrigerator and loaded up on butter. What can I say? She picked up her cup, cradled it close, and then took a sip. So, give me the punchline. She told Walter about the baby and said she was going to stay with her sister until the baby was born. And do we have sister's name? We do. Kate Davis of Winchester. I searched her on the internet. I found a Kate Davis Simmons of Winchester. She has a son named Walt. The reference is two years old. Rachel's brows rose. If this Walt is Walter's son, then he'd be about 69 now. I know. That's assuming they are still alive. I have thought about that. But I wasn't worried. Jenna wouldn't have gone to the trouble if he were gone. I need to try. A knock at the front door startled me. With a shrug, I moved through the saloon doors and glanced toward the front door. It was Gordon. He wore jeans, a dark shirt skimming his flat belly, and his blonde hair brushed back and still damp from a shower. He looked so fine I could have melted. Very aware of my fat pants and an oversized T-shirt, hair pulled back tight, the sight of him tugged at locks around my heart as caged feelings struggled to break free. I unlocked the door. 
Gordon. He slid a hand in his pocket. He met my gaze, and for the first time since we'd talked about the baby, I saw no hint of anger. Daisy. I wondered if we could hold the armistice, or if we'd end up fighting within minutes. Rachel pushed through the saloon doors and stood inches behind me. Hey, Gordon. Gordon shifted his attention from me to Rachel and grinned. How's it going, Rachel? Grand reopening go well? Went great. The new kids Daisy hired saved the day. His grin was warm. She's always had a knack for finding talent. Rachel nodded. I'd say so. Rachel? I said. You and the girls have an outing today? She laid her steady hands on my shoulders. It's no rush. I appreciated her acting as my wingman, but Gordon was my issue. I patted her hand. It is. Go and have fun. Sure? Rachel straightened in her mama bear mode. Yes, very sure. Gordon smiled at Rachel as if to assure her he'd behave. I just want a word with Daisy. Her hands slid from my shoulders, but she hovered close. Everybody be nice. I smiled. I'll do the best I can. Gordon shrugged as if to say trouble wouldn't start on his end. Fine, but I'll be close. After Rachel vanished upstairs, I tried to pretend the air didn't snap and crackle between us. Why don't you come through to the kitchen? Great. He followed me to the new kitchen, taking a moment to survey the newly relocated and designed layout. You've been busy. It's been pretty crazy the last week and a half, but we made it. Even installed the wine shop in the basement. I'd heard you bought out Gus's wines. Alexandria was a big, small town. Seemed a good way to grow the business. I shoved open the back door to the alley, knowing out there we'd have real privacy. I waited until Gordon followed before letting the door close. The day's growing heat warmed the sudden chill in my bones. Not sure what to do, I folded my arms and then unfolded them, thinking I should look casual and not tense. I was tense, but it didn't hurt to hide it or the fact that I had no idea what to say to Gordon. None. I'd apologized, explained my position, and still my stomach fluttered as if I weren't much older than a teenager. His gaze darted over my body, taking in my growing belly that could no longer be hidden. I bet you haven't eaten. I did manage coffee this morning, a milestone. No morning, or rather, all day sickness for me right now. His face tensed a little, but he seemed to recover. Good. That's good. So, you and the baby are doing well? The baby. Not our baby. One day, I supposed, it wouldn't be awkward when we talked about this child. We are hanging tough. Little McRae is as hardy as her old lady. An awkward silence settled between us. We were both trying to be adult and mature. We were trying. But it still felt so weird between us. To fill the silence, I said, I emailed Terry and she did get back to me. She said she had morning sickness midway through her pregnancy. Not with me, but with her last boy. Stands to reason, I guess. She would have been about my age when her last child was born. His gaze bore into me. She got back to you. That's good. Yeah, not a gushy, motherly note, but I've the sense she was trying to help, and I appreciated that. He shoved his hands in his pockets. Good. I know you've wanted a connection with her. I thought I was fine without it, but her email really meant a lot. I've read it. She's not mom, but she is my birth mother, and we should be friends, don't you think? Yeah. More silence. The elephant in the alley lumbered around us, and finally I drew in a ragged breath. 
I also emailed Roger. Haven't heard back yet. Gordon's lips flattened into a grim line. That guy is an ass. I know. But there's no changing the past, no matter how much I want to. I really wish I could, but I can't. I wished with all my heart that this baby was yours. But it's not. He glanced at his hands and then tucked them in his pocket. I'm sorry. I cocked my head. For what? You haven't done anything wrong, Gordon. You are a saint for putting up with me for this long. I get that I'm not easy. The lines in his forehead furrowed deeper. I have not been very helpful. All the changes you made to the bakery, being sick, and the news of the baby, you really didn't need me heaping onto the pile. I'm a tough bird, Gordon, and I get that I hurt you. I know if I could turn back the clock, I would. I reached out and took his hand, wondering if he'd flinch and pull away. When he didn't, I rubbed my callous fingers against his. It's okay. I can do this alone. I will figure it out. He tightened his fingers around mine. That's what's digging at me, Daisy. I hate the idea of you having to do it all alone. I'm not the first woman to raise a baby alone, and I won't be the last. It's okay. And I meant it. I loved Gordon enough not to saddle him with guilt because he couldn't accept my mistake. He tipped his head back as if weighing words he might later regret. I miss you. I miss you, too. I cleared my throat. None of this changes my feelings for you. I do love you, Gordon. I do. He met my gaze. I love you, too. You drive me crazy. But I love you. The word sounded so sweet. Stepping away from the loneliness that had dogged me, I leaned in and kissed him gently on the lips. He tasted so good, and it took all my energy not to lean into the kiss. He closed his eyes, and he leaned into me. He rubbed my palm with his thumb. Shots of desire pinged around in me. Sexual desire was a welcome feeling. Couple that with the love I had for Gordon, and this could be very beautiful and explosive. But as much as I dearly wanted to give in to these feelings, I resisted. It wasn't about me anymore. With a great effort, I pulled back. It's not the two of us anymore, Gordon. There is the kid, and we are officially a package deal. He didn't pull back as he met my gaze. His voice sounded rough when he spoke. I know. And I'm still struggling. I'm sorry. Don't be. This is one of those problems that doesn't have an easy fix. He raised his hand as if to touch me and then hesitated. How about we spend the day together? If you can break away from this place. Smiling, I nodded. I'd like that. But... I need to visit this person in Winchester. Winchester? Is he a supplier? Not exactly. He would be in his late sixties. The first hints of amusement danced in his gaze. I explained about Jenna's recipe box and my visit with Joey. So I'm trying to locate this kid, who is now in his late sixties. Exactly. He shrugged. I've bikes to fix this morning, but I'm free after eleven. He was offering an olive branch. He wasn't saying we'd be together forever, but he was trying to be my friend. I wanted his friendship and his love, but to expect both right now was greedy. I can pick you up. Now amusement did spark. In the bakery van? It works, for the most part. I'll pick you up, Daisy. There'd been a time when I would have challenged his need to take the lead. I always had to be first, always had to drive. But I liked this. For the first time in my life, 
I liked not feeling as if I had to control every detail. Sounds good. See you at eleven. He leaned forward, hesitated a split second, as if he'd kiss me. Instead, he smiled and promised to return. The rest of the morning was spent baking Jenna's maple cookies. I knew Rachel had leftovers, but I'd wanted these cookies to be fresh and to be made by me. Rachel always believed we put our energy into the food we made, and though I'd often scoffed and teased her, I had to agree. If Jenna's son ate these cookies today, I wanted him to feel his mother's love. After I'd boxed up the cookies and tied a yellow ribbon around it, I saw I had minutes before Gordon arrived. I dashed up to my room, ran a brush through my hair, and put on lipstick. I practiced smiling in front of the mirror because I wanted to have fun with Gordon today. No sour faces. Hurrying to the main floor, I grabbed my cookie box and stood by the front window. I thought about playing it cool and making Gordon knock for me, but then laughed at the thought. Geez, Daisy, aren't you a little past making the poor man work? When Gordon and I dated the first time around in Washington, our relationship had its share of problems. He worked long, long hours and often left me waiting, annoyed, and feeling very alone. I didn't handle his lack of attention well, and instead of talking to him about it like an adult, I'd sulked and eventually left him because I'd so convinced myself he didn't love me. But he had loved me. He was a crappy communicator, like me. And so when he pulled up in front of the bakery one minute before eleven, a surge of well-being and love filled me. Since our move to Alexandria, we were both trying. It hadn't been all smooth waters, but for a time we'd been doing really well. If not for the teeny-weeny problem of me carrying another man's baby, we'd have been perfect. The devil is in the details, which is a misquote. The actual line has to do with God being in the details. It didn't really matter because the little detail in question wasn't so little. Tossing him a wave, I hurried outside, opened the front door of his truck, and slid into the seat. Weeks ago, it would have been natural to lean over and kiss him. I wanted to kiss him, but wasn't sure if I should. Was I overthinking this? Should I go ahead and kiss him? Good morning again, I said. He studied me a beat. So, what conversation are you having in your head? I laughed. How do you know I was having a conversation in my head? You've that panicked, far-off look. You get that look when you're thinking. What does that look like? He made a face which I was sure did not look like my expression. I laughed. I was thinking I would have kissed you if it were a couple of weeks ago. That I'd be totally comfortable and not tense. His hand rested casually on the steering wheel, but his eyes bored into me. You could kiss me. The rough timbre of his voice had my toes tingling. I could? Sure. But? A brow arched. Has the baby somehow damaged your lips? God bless him, he was trying. I moistened my lips and pretended to inspect them. No, I don't think so. He sat, still as a stone, not moving toward me. If I wanted this, I would have to make the big move. Moistening my lips again, I scooted across the seat, glanced into his steady gaze for any sign of doubt, and when I saw none, I leaned into him and kissed him softly on the lips. The touch was gentle and tentative like a couple of middle school kids, but sweet quickly warmed to hot when Gordon slid his hand to my waist. My pulse throbbed under his fingertips as I leaned into the kiss, hoping to deepen it. And the baby kicked. Hard. So hard, we both felt it. He straightened, but didn't remove his hand. She kicked the last time I touched you. I glanced at his tan, lean fingers lying over my full belly. She seems to be trying to figure you out. He nodded, staring at my belly. 
Looks like she and I are in the same boat. We both love Mommy, but aren't sure if we can love each other. He was being honest, and I appreciated that. But it stung to think the two people I now loved most in the world might not ever like each other. I'm hoping when you two meet you'll find a way to like each other. He nodded. Me too. His honesty stinging. I patted him on the hand and then slid to my seat, clicking the seat belt in place. Ready? Frowning, he studied me. I hurt your feelings. Yeah, a little. I'd vowed my days of pretending problems didn't exist had ended. The phrase, put your money where your mouth is, resonated. But I appreciate the effort you're making today. You could have dumped me and run for the hills. His arm rested on the back of the seat, his fingertips brushing my shoulder. I want to figure this out, Daisy. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I want to try. For today... Let's not worry about the baby or what's next. Let's go to Winchester and see if we can solve a mystery. He nodded, a smile teasing the edge of his lip. You sound like Nancy Drew. A laugh bubbled. If Nancy were as curious about her cases as I am about Jenna, then maybe I finally get old Nancy. As a kid, I read a couple of her books, but she annoyed the hell out of me. Laughing, he pulled into traffic. Why is that? Perfect hair, perfect grades, always had the right answer while I was schlepping around with twenty extra pounds, always angry and without a clue of who I was. You've come a long way. Let's hope. The drive around the Beltway and then out I-66 West was uneventful, though not particularly scenic. But I was grateful there was no traffic and the day was pretty. It took under an hour before Gordon pulled into the city limits of Winchester. I dug my phone out of my purse. I entered her address on my phone before I left the bakery, so here's hoping GPS can find her. Gordon's wrist rested casually over the steering wheel. Dark shades covered his eyes, blonde hair brushed his collar, and he looked as if he had no care in the world. This is your show, Daisy. I'm the driver. He looked so sexy and cool. It would be easy to forget about Jenna, Walter, and Joey and focus on us. But as much as I wanted to toss every bit of my life aside but him, I couldn't. And so I gave him not-so-perfect directions leading us around the outskirts of the town of Winchester, past the rows of strip malls and box stores and farm chemical suppliers. Finally, we looped around and headed out toward a rural route cutting through rolling green hills dotted with apple trees. Gordon seemed content to drive and enjoy the views and the nice weather. I, as always, grew restless without the buzz of conversation and needed to fill the silence. Searching for a neutral topic, I rejected talk of the weather, choosing an equally banal subject. Did you know Winchester is noted for its apples? He kept his gaze ahead, but his lips quirked, as if he'd expected I couldn't take the silence for long. I did not know. Lots of apples. Rachel buys apples from a guy out this way. She makes apple pies at Thanksgiving. Margaret says after last Thanksgiving she never wants to see another apple again. Said her left hand could have passed for Captain Hook's claw by the time she was done last year. His head cocked like it did when he was thinking big picture. So you gonna make the pies this year? I suppose so. It's all hands on deck when the holiday season starts. And now that we have our fancy new freezer in place, we can make the pies ahead and freeze them. That doesn't mess with the taste. He had a knack for sounding interested, no matter what I babbled about. I don't think so, but I know we will be taste testing in the fall. Rachel and I will figure it out. And did I mention we also had a couple of email orders today for the frozen cookie dough? I didn't realize you sold frozen dough. We don't, or didn't. Kind of fell into that one last week, but it seems to be catching on. I shook my head. People like the idea of bringing the bakery home and baking without the work. 
bring our bakery home. Sounds like a slogan. Maybe. His offhand comment had me thinking. What if we not only baked and froze the pies ahead, but cookies and maybe some bread dough, maybe cakes? What if we packaged holiday desserts in a box and sold them before Christmas? I've been worried about what we're going to do this Christmas, in case I'm out of commission earlier than I expected. Tension rippled through him, but he kept his tone light. It's good to be thinking ahead. Sorry I'd taken a wrong turn in the conversation. I glanced at my phone and then at the road ahead. According to the phone, we should be turning up ahead. His gaze followed the direction of my finger, which had zeroed in on a rusted mailbox leaning slightly to the left. By the looks, there'd been a name painted on it, but the lettering had long ago faded and chipped. He slowed, and we both peered up the long, graveled driveway snaking up the hill. By the driveway was a large sign that read, posted. Beside it, another read, No Trespassing. Gordon slid his sunglasses on top of his head and glanced at me. Doesn't look very welcoming. I don't think those signs are for us. Really? What kind of strangers do you think they might be referring to? Bad strangers. We are good strangers. He chuckled. Right. Good strangers from Alexandria bring obscure questions about a woman who may or may not have lived here seventy-plus years ago. Well, if it were me living up on that hill and seventy years had passed and someone had information about my long-dead sister, I sure would want to know, wouldn't you? Maybe. Gordon, you wouldn't want to know? Not necessarily. I was so starved for information about my biological family that his viewpoint was foreign to me. I couldn't imagine anyone not wanting to gather every morsel of information. Not all information adds value. I straightened the yellow bow on the box of cookies. How do you know? He shook his head. You think more than I do. You can trace your line back to the Mayflower. You have all the pieces. True. Again, he tossed me that heart-stopping smile. Let's find out what they say. I relaxed back into the seat. Thank you. You're welcome. He shifted it to first and drove up the hill. Gravel crunched under the tires, and I stared out at the fields covered with tall grass and willowy dandelions reaching toward the hot sun. As the truck rounded a corner, I spotted a dilapidated barn to the right. Ravaged by time, the main support beam had collapsed long ago, pulling the building in on itself. Weeds grew up through the sun-baked beams, covered with faded patches of red paint. But set against the crystal blue sky, it had its own kind of beauty. Old and broken, the barn still had a presence that telegraphed it belonged. Gordon didn't say a word as we climbed the gravel driveway. He played along keeping his good humor, but I knew he thought I'd lost my mind. The Daisy he'd known in Washington, D.C. would never have put herself out like this. Sure, that Daisy was a ballbuster professionally and would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the toughest brokers or bankers, but when it came to personal issues, Daisy never stuck her neck out. That Daisy bristled at the first sign of emotional turmoil. In so many ways, she was so fragile. And here I was, six months out of D.C., with my neck stuck out so far, metaphorically, with Gordon and Jenna's family, a slight chop would sever my head from my body. And I was oddly okay with the risk. These last months, meeting Terry, connecting with my family, had made me stronger. Gordon rounded a second corner, and this time we came upon a white farmhouse. Clay planters filled with tall, full marigolds stood silent and welcoming at the foot of three steps leading up to a deep, tongue-and-groove porch that wrapped around the front of the house. Twin rockers swayed ever so slightly in the breeze on the porch by floor-to-ceiling windows flanking a large black front door. A simple brass knocker hung on the door. Faced with the reality of speaking to perfect strangers about a dead woman, 
had my stomach rolling. The flowers look welcoming. Gordon parked the car. Yeah, and the house looks nice. And there isn't a sign that says, warning. I smiled. So basically the house is saying, it wants us here. As long as Freddy Krueger doesn't answer the front door, we should be good. Right. I slid out of the front seat, box in hand, and met Gordon in front of the truck. Together, the two of us walked up to the front door. I searched for a bell, but when I didn't see one, I opened the screen door and rapped the knocker against the door a couple of times. I slowly closed the screen door, and we both took a step back. With Freddy Krueger still in mind, I wondered how fast I could make it to the truck in a full-on sprint. Gordon smiled as if he'd read my mind. I'd beat you to the truck, but don't worry. I wouldn't drive off until you have at least one foot in the front seat. The tension knotting my back eased. Thanks, but I'd beat you. You're pregnant and a girl. The pregnant reference came easier and easier to both of us. My survival instinct is so honed right now it's as sharp as a razor. You wouldn't stand a chance. He grinned when we both heard footsteps in the entryway. Seconds later, we saw the rustle of curtains to the right of the door and then heard a lock click open. Slowly, the door opened, and instead of finding ourselves face to face with a fictional killer, we were greeted by an elderly woman. She barely stood over five feet. Thinning white hair was tied back in a bun and wrinkles deepened the lines around her eyes and mouth. Laugh lines, I thought as I stared into her clear green eyes. I don't entertain solicitors, the woman said in a crisp voice. We aren't solicitors, ma'am. We're from Alexandria. My name is Daisy McRae. I manage the Union Street Bakery, and this is Gordon Singletary, a... Uh, who was this man standing next to me? A good friend of mine. We came to ask you about a recipe box. A slight cock of the woman's head conveyed annoyance more than curiosity. I don't know about a recipe box. She didn't make a move to open the screen door, and I didn't ask her to. This had to be so weird. I dug in my satchel purse and held it up. We were renovating the bakery and taking out walls last week. We found this box in the wall. It belonged to a woman who used to work at the bakery. Her name was Jenna Davis. The old woman's gaze sharpened as she dropped it from my face to the box. How do you know the box belonged to Jenna? Yes. She looked at me like I was crazy, but I also knew in an instant she recognized Jenna's name. Excitement rushed through me. You knew Jenna? The older woman pursed her lips, but her gaze remained on the box. I didn't say that. A cloud of impatience swirled around, and I could hear the chant, Find him, find him, find him. Annoyed, I swiped a lock of hair away from my eyes, as if I could also brush away the restlessness. Her first name was written inside the box and then I searched bakery records from 1940 onward. I found the name Jenna Davis. From there I traced a picture I found of her and two soldiers, and then I was given a letter Jenna had written that gave this address. I took a chance she still had family living here. The woman stood silent for a long moment. Her hands trembled slightly, and she nibbled her bottom lip. Did you know, Jenna? I asked. The woman looked at me, her sharp eyes now watery. Yes, I knew Jenna. She unlatched the screen door and pushed it open. My name is Kate Simmons. You're Jenna's sister. She swallowed, as if struggling with emotions. Why don't you come in, and I'll fix you a lemonade. I smiled and glanced back at Gordon, very grateful he was there. I wasn't sure why, but I was suddenly unsure of this entire trip. 
I clearly had dug into a deep and painful wound this woman harbored. Understanding what it was like to carry such a wound, I took pity on her. We followed her into the house, lighted by the sunlight streaming in through the large windows. Instead of being dark or dreary, the room had a bright, cheery feel. White lace curtains hung from clean windows, and fresh daisies filled several mason jars and vases in the room. A soft, beige color gave the walls a fresh look, and there were dozens of framed black-and-white photos. A rose floral fabric covered a couple of wing chairs and an overstuffed couch. All old and well-worn, but well cared for. Along the hallway, Gordon and I followed Kate, drawn deeper into the house by the soft, sweet smell of goodies baking in the oven. It reminded me of the maple cookies I'd baked this morning. Jenna's cookies. Kate nodded toward a chrome kitchen table surrounded by six chairs, seats covered in red leather. In the center of the table sat a ceramic bowl filled with oranges and apples. Have a seat. I hovered close to a chair but stood, too nervous to sit. Kate opened a refrigerator that dated to the 1970s and reached for a pitcher full of lemonade. She glanced at my belly. Go on. Have a seat. You shouldn't be standing too much. I took a seat at the table but couldn't relax back into it. Carefully I let my purse fall to the floor as I set the recipe box on the table. Thanks. Can I help you with that? Gordon said. She glanced toward him, surprised, as if she wasn't accustomed to help. I expected her to refuse, but she said, Thanks. That would be real nice. Gordon took the pitcher and carried it to the table. I glanced up at him, and he looked at me as if to say, Speak. The lemonade looks great, I said. Gordon cocked an eyebrow. Really? That's the best you've got? I shrugged. Kate retrieved three glasses from a whitewashed cabinet. Gordon took the glasses from her and filled them before replacing the lemonade in the refrigerator. Kate carried a platter of cookies to the table. Have a seat. Gordon pulled out a chair for her, and when she sat, he took the chair beside me. I shouldn't have been nervous. I offered information to Kate. This wasn't like searching for my birth mother. The moments and seconds shouldn't have been loaded with emotion, but every ticking second was charged with a nervous energy I didn't understand. I held up my bakery box, wrapped in yellow ribbon. I baked cookies today, too. Maple cookies. Kate stared at the box, but didn't reach for it. I haven't baked them in years, I sipped, needing a task more than I needed refreshment. The lemonade blended sweet and tart. I'm sorry to drop in on you like this. Instead of reaching for one of my cookies, she opened the recipe box. Her thickly veined, bent fingers trembled a little when she fingered the first card. I traced the rim of my glass as I watched her thumb through the cards. Carefully, I picked up one of her warm cookies. When we found the recipe box, we couldn't resist baking some of Jenna's recipes. These cookies are Jenna's maple cookies. Jenna always had a knack for baking. Her head cocked as she removed a card and studied it. I haven't seen her handwriting in so long. We had a mini grand reopening yesterday and sold cookies like this. We sold out in an hour. Kate nodded. That would have made Jenna happy. She liked to watch people eat what she baked. I searched the old woman's face for similarities to the pictures I had of Jenna. There seemed little resemblance except for the eyes. They were Jenna's eyes. The cookie recipe was our mother's. We grew up making these cookies every Saturday to have with Sunday dinner. Like I said, I've not baked them in years. But today, I had a hankering for the sweet taste. I made them by memory and wasn't sure if I'd get them right. I took a bite. They are perfect. She smiled and nodded. 
How did you say you found this? We were taking out a wall in the bakery, and I found this wedged between the beams. I reached in my purse and pulled out the photos I had found. Gently, I slid them toward her. I found these pictures of Jenna. Kate picked up the picture of Jenna, Walter, and Joey, standing arm in arm, smiling in front of the bakery. She was so full of energy in life. She was two years older than me, and I followed her around everywhere. I cried fiercely when she left for the city. Why did she leave? She wanted to see the city. It was the fall of 1943. Daddy wanted her to get married, but she'd have none of it. They fought something fierce. But he couldn't sway her. She was supposed to be gone six months. Daddy wouldn't speak her name after she left, but I know he missed her. We all figured she'd come back within the year. By the fall of 1944, Jenna would have been noticeably pregnant. She didn't come home, did she? No. I wrote her in October of 1944 and told her I was getting married at Christmas. She wrote me back right away and told me about her young man. After 70 years, Kate still protected Jenna. Did she tell you about the baby? Tears welled in Kate's eyes. She did. Said she'd met Walter, and she'd received word he'd died in the Pacific. He wanted to marry her, but never got the chance. She was afraid and alone. She traced the line of Jenna's young and smiling face with gnarled fingers. I had the sense she'd cut through the years and had landed in the past. I told Mama. She shook her head as if she'd known all along Jenna was in trouble. She told me not to tell Daddy. Said Jenna needed time to find a husband or a home for a baby he'd not want. A baby he didn't want. My throat tightened, and for a moment I couldn't speak. Gordon cleared his throat. What did your mother do? Kate swiped a tear from her lined cheek. I told Mama she had to tell him. And finally she did. He was furious. Said he didn't want to talk about Jenna ever again, because she'd disgraced her family. Mama wasn't one to argue with Daddy, but she did that night. Said she'd send him to the barn to live before she turned her back on her girl. A faint smile tugged at the edge of Kate's mouth. I told my Billy what was happening, and that I wanted to take the baby. No one needed to know where it came from. We could make up a story that hid the truth. And he agreed. Tears again filled her eyes. Lord, but I love that man. The image of Jenna's headstone darkened my thoughts. Did you and your mother go to Alexandria? No. It was my Billy that went with me. We arrived after the new year in January. Went to the bakery, and they sent us to the hospital. Jenna had died the day before. And there was the baby lying in this crib, crying and sucking on his hand, so hungry for his mama. Billy and I buried Jenna there in Alexandria. She told me she'd never leave the city until her Walter came back from the war. And seeing as he never came back, it seemed she should stay. We wrapped the baby in blankets and left the day she was buried. There was a small mention of Jenna on the death notices page. The piece described Jenna's baby as ailing, Kate nodded. He was sickly, could barely stomach any milk. Billy and I didn't have any idea what we were supposed to do. We were so young and didn't know the first thing about being married, let alone being parents. Baby cried all the way home. We was at his parents' place, spinning our tale of how we'd come to find the baby, the orphan of a married couple who'd passed. Billy's parents and grandmother were listening. Grandmother was old and bent and gray-haired, like me now. I thought she was ancient, and I didn't think she could help that baby. 
but she sent my father-in-law out to the barn and told him to fetch some goat's milk. He did, and she put it right in our one baby bottle. The boy suckled hard because he was so hungry. The minute he took his first taste, he settled right into Grandma Simmons's arms and ate his fill. After that day, he got stronger and stronger. So the baby survived. That he did, grew into a fine man, a fine son. Turned out he was the only child the Lord gave Billy and me, but we couldn't have asked for better. Where is he now? Out in the field. Walt oversees the orchards. Walt. Walter. Who chose that name? Jenna. She named him in the hospital before she died. It didn't seem right to change it. She named him after his father, Walter. Yes. From my purse, I pulled out the Bible Joey had given me as well as the letters. These belonged to Walter. He had a friend who kept his Bible all these years. Kate's hand hovered over the Bible, but she didn't touch it. I always knew I'd never carried Walter inside me. But it wasn't more than a minute or two he was in my care that he was mine. Seeing all this now reminds me that I wasn't his mother. Sounds like what you did for him was what any real mother would do. Don't ever doubt that. Terry had brought me into the world, but Sheila McRae was my mother. Tears glistened. Thank you for saying that. For a moment we sat in silence as she opened the Bible and studied the family tree scribbled on the first page. I scooted to the edge of my seat. You said waltz in the fields? She didn't look up and her voice sounded far away. Won't be home until dinner. I inherited my family land. And Billy got his family's land. Our son Walt manages both lands. Our son. She said it with such pride and love. A part of me envied her. Her husband had taken in her sister's child and loved him as his own. It was a wish I had for my child and Gordon. But then Kate and Billy had both been Walt's adoptive parents. They'd been on equal footing. Gordon and I weren't on a level playing field when it came to my baby. I'd like to meet him, I said. Would that be possible? Kate shook her head and glanced away from the Bible. I'd like to have a word with my boy alone first. There's a lot Billy and I didn't tell him over the years. A lot. Secrets. Did Walt know about Jenna? A shot of anger rose up in me as I sat there. I nodded toward the oven. The cookies still in the oven smell done. I suppose they do. Kate rose, her hands trembling a bit more. She grabbed a dish towel, opened the oven, and pulled out the cookies that had been on the verge of burning. I'll see you to the door. I wanted to meet Walt. I wanted to personally give him the Bible and tell him about all I'd found. I wanted to push, but I didn't. This was their family matter. And no matter what I wanted or what Jenna wanted, this was between Kate and her son. I rose and laid my business card on the table. He can find me here if he wants to know more. She didn't look at the card as she tucked it in her apron. I'll tell him. Gordon placed his hand on the small of my back as if to say, let's go. And so we left. I settled in the front seat of his truck, my chilled bones soaking in the warmth from the leather seats. Out of the house and away from Kate and the Bible, a rush of doubts chased after me. I shook my head. What if she doesn't tell him? He started the engine and put on his sunglasses. I think she will. Fear niggled at me. Trust would never come easy to me. She doesn't want to share him. Daisy, she will tell him. How do you know? I just do. I have an image of her throwing all of Walter's belongings in the trash. 
He shook his head. It's clear she loves her son. She wouldn't hurt him like that. She wouldn't be the first adoptive parent to lie to her child. Your parents never lied to you. I know. But that didn't calm the fears. What if he doesn't know he's adopted? What if the family kept his truth from him? He dropped his voice a notch. You are borrowing trouble, Daisy. My head dropped back against the warm leather seat. That's because I don't have enough trouble in my own life. He grinned as the truck rumbled along the driveway, a cloud of dust kicking up behind the back tires. Give her time, Daisy. She's old. This was one hell of a shock. I closed my eyes. I feel like I failed, Jenna. Chapter 22 Thursday Five days after grand reopening Income lost? $1,000 The bakery was finding a new rhythm, Rachel thought, as she opened the back of the display cabinet and transferred freshly baked bread from a tray into the case. Jean-Paul had baked his bread early this morning before he'd selected a loaf for himself, winked at her as she'd iced a cake, and left until his shift began again at midnight. The bakery had been officially open for five days, and so far business was brisk and profits were on the rise. Daisy talked more and more about changing their business model, and the girls spent most of their days with their grandmother. Rachel could concede that life was on the upswing. The bakery phone rang, and she wiped icing from her hands as she snapped up the receiver and said, Union Street Bakery. Rachel, it's Simon. Warm energy flowed up her spine as she nestled closer to the phone. Hi. Just checking in. We're still on for Saturday at 2 p.m.? Yes. She'd been too busy to think about the date, but the sound of his voice churned nervous energy in her belly. I'm looking forward to it. Great. She cleared her throat. If the weather is nice, I can make us a picnic lunch. Sounds good. A silence settled, and she scrambled for a question or statement that didn't pertain to the time, weather, or food. The words wouldn't gel, and her panic grew as the saloon doors swooshed open. Daisy, carrying a tray of freshly iced cupcakes, moved to the display case, opened the glass, and began to line up the cupcakes in single file. Rachel turned from Daisy back to the phone and said, I've got to get back to work, but I'll see you on Saturday. Sure, he said. See you then. Rachel hung up the phone, relieved but disappointed she'd been so tongue-tied. You are frowning. Daisy closed the display case and set the tray on the counter. Rachel imagined Simon in his office, blushing as he sat back in his executive chair. She glanced up at Daisy. Simon was making arrangements for our date. He likes me. So why the frown? I'm not good with conversation, especially with him. All I know are kids and baking, and I just can't imagine those topics interest him. Conversation will come in time. And all the talking doesn't rest with you. Daisy's knowing grin sent a fresh wave of nervous energy racing through Rachel's body. How do you feel about him? Rachel moistened her lips and wondered how different his kisses would be from Jean-Paul's. I like him. But beyond that, it's hard to say. She frowned. I could read every one of Mike's moods and expressions. With Simon, I'm starting from scratch. And Jean-Paul? color warmed her face. We have reached an accord. I leave his breads alone and he leaves my baked goods alone. I'm not talking about the working relationship. I'm talking about whatever it is that snaps and crackles when you two are close. She nibbled her lip, remembering the kiss. He's very exciting. Which means? She laughed. It means I don't know where I stand with either one of them. Who's to say I'm not just a passing amusement for both? I wouldn't say that. I'm not so sure. 
Daisy waved away her concern. If you were trapped on a desert island with one or the other, which would it be? And don't think or analyze, just give me your gut reaction. Jean-Paul. She blurted the name out before she could censor her thoughts. She lowered her voice a notch. The sex and food would be amazing, and I could talk shop with him when the conversation lagged. Is it because Jean-Paul reminds you of Mike? She glanced at her ring finger and the groove where the gold band had rested for thirteen years. He's not like Mike. Not at all. He's a free spirit. Simon is stability. He plans, like me. Between the two of them I have the best of Mike. Excitement and fear collided. I don't know where I'll end up. Or with whom. But I can accept that I'm not married anymore. I'm single. And I'm not as afraid as I was a year ago. That's a good thing. It's very good. Daisy pressed her hand into her back. You can date both men, because we aren't on a desert island, and you do have choices. A sly smile curved the edges of Rachel's lips. Images of Simon and Jean-Paul marched in and out of her thoughts. For the first time in her life, she had the chance to explore, to take the unknown road, and just the thought made her heart beat faster. Listening to Rachel talk about her budding love life had made me very aware that my love life had fallen apart. I'd not seen Gordon since Sunday, and that bothered me. I understood I couldn't rightfully claim him and the baby. I had to choose, and I had. My kid came first, but that didn't stop me from missing Gordon. Missing his touch, his smell. During the renovation, the crazy pace had been enough to push him from my mind. But now that we'd returned to our normal dull roar, there was too much time in the day to let my mind go to him. The front bells rang, and I glanced up hoping it was Gordon, all the while admonishing myself for wanting to see him. And, of course, it was not Gordon. It was an older gentleman, nicely dressed in khakis and a polo shirt, his white hair brushed back, accentuated a deeply tanned and lined face. Welcome to the Union Street Bakery. He nodded. Thanks. He glanced at the display case, a bit lost, like most new customers who were trying to scan the array of goodies. So what do you have a taste for? A frown furrowed his head. In all honesty, I didn't come to buy baked goods. He lifted his eyes, and a curious, doleful gaze met mine. I'm here to see Daisy. When people came looking for me by name, my suspicions tend to rise. Surprises. Never good. You found her. He studied my face as if trying to read my thoughts. Just then the doors jingled and a young woman entered the shop. Blonde hair framed an oval face and large expressive eyes. Her bobbed hair grazed a strong jaw and she wore jeans and a purple t-shirt. But as I stared at her, I could have easily imagined her in a calf-length skirt, bobby socks, or saddle oxfords. There was no mistaking her connection to this place. She was Jenna. Grandad, she said. I found a parking spot. Two spaces from here. Great, Del. Great. The man looked at me. My name is Walter. Walter Simmons? This is my granddaughter, Del Johnson. My mom told me you visited. Realization dawning, I studied his face for traces of Jenna's eyes and smile. Kate is your mother? That's right, and Del's great-grandmother. I wasn't sure Kate would tell Walter about my visit. How's she doing? I'm afraid I might have upset her the other day. You did, Dell said. I thought about the sweet old woman who'd baked Jenna's cookies. I'm sorry. That was not my intention. Walter drew in a deep breath and glanced around the bakery. Mom told me her sister lived in Alexandria, 
but she never said what she did while she lived here. You mean Jenna? I chose my words carefully, not sure what Kate had told her son or great-granddaughter. I didn't want to trip over any family secrets. Yes. He pulled an envelope from his breast pocket and from that removed photos. My photos. The ones that I'd given Kate. I found this on her kitchen table. I'd never seen them before. We only found them. I thought it should be returned to her family. Wiping my hands, I came around the counter. According to her employee file, she worked here between 1943 and 1944. She made a name for herself while she was here. Dell grinned. There's no missing the resemblance. I look like her. Yes, you do, I said. The family doesn't talk about her much, Walt said. Sadness coated each of the words. I'm sorry to hear that. I heard she was a vibrant woman. You heard? Dell said. There's a man in a nursing home not far from here. His name is Joey. He knew Jenna. Walt's gaze sharpened. He knew my aunt. He also knew her fiancé, Walter. Joey and Walter served together during World War II. Joey was one of the last people to see Walter alive. How did you find Joey? Walt said. I hated dancing around a truth that was so much a part of this man's history. I wanted to say clearly and directly, we are talking about your birth parents. But I didn't. I dropped enough grenades for the week. For the next fifteen minutes, I talked about how we'd found Jenna's recipe box during our renovation and detailed my winding route to Winchester. I could introduce you to Joey if you'd like. Walter listened, his face stoic and stern. I wasn't sure how much of this he wanted to hear and half expected him to thank me for my time and leave. But he surprised me when he said, I'd like to meet Joey. My heart skipped a beat. I would suggest sooner than later. He's ninety-seven. Walt cleared his throat. Today would work for me. Sure. Does now work? Yes, he said. Let me grab a box of maple cookies for him. I moved around the counter, my growing belly leading the way. The recipe was Jenna's, and it's a hit with our customers. I thought I recognized them. My mother used to bake them when I was a kid. They are my favorite. I wrapped one in paper and handed it to him. Compliments of the Union Street Bakery. He took a bite, and for a moment I sensed he was transported somewhere. Why did you do this? Do what? Find me. I edged closer to the facts. I'm adopted. I found my birth mother this spring, and I've had no luck finding my birth father. If someone had information about him, it would have been nice if they'd try to find me and tell me about him. Walt glanced at the cookie. Mom and Dad never told me I was adopted. For a long moment a heavy silence hung between us. I found out from a relative at a family reunion when I was fifteen. It slipped out. I pretended not to hear, but it made so much sense. My parents loved me, and I loved them. But there was a missing piece. A critical piece to a puzzle. Maybe. I never said a word to my folks, but I did do a little digging. I learned of her older sister, Jenna. Mom didn't talk about her much. But when I learned she died the day after I was born, it wasn't hard to wonder. You know she's buried here in Alexandria. I do. I've been to the grave. They wrote about her in a local paper when she passed. You know Walter Jacob is also buried near her. I did not. I'd be happy to show you his place. He stared at the cookie and then took another bite as if he needed another second or two to process. 
I also saw the article you left with Mom. Your mom told you all this? In Kate, I sensed a woman who'd guarded a secret for nearly seventy years, and to think she'd release it so easily didn't jive. No, not a word. But I guess you could say she told me in her own way. She left your package out on the kitchen table. It was there when Dell and I came in from the orchards. She's my farm manager. Dell grinned. The apple air. It would have been easy enough for Kate to hide the recipe box and the photos or destroy them. But she left them out. She wanted you to find it. Maybe. She won't go as far as to talk but I give her credit for trying. So much emotion. Love, sadness, loss, and more love. Adoption brought with it a complicated blend of feelings. Let's go see Joey. I'd like that. And so I made excuses to Rachel, grabbed my purse, and drove to Woodbridge. Jenna's cookies on the seat beside me. Dell and Walt followed in their car. It was after three when we arrived, and I greeted the receptionist with a smile and a box of cookies. She accepted them and nodded for me to go back. When Walt hesitated, Dell nudged him forward. We've got to do this, Grandad. He cleared his throat. Right. I knocked on Joey's door, and when I heard a gruff, What? I pushed it open. Joey, it's Daisy. He sat up a little straighter and actually smiled. What are you doing back? Afraid I might die on you? I grinned. I actually have a couple of visitors for you. His eyes narrowed. I ain't one for visitors. His gruffness had grown endearing and didn't deter me in the least. Well, you might like these two visitors. Two? He scrunched his face as if he'd eaten a sour apple. I laid his box of cookies on his bedside table. Buck up, Joey, and stop whining. He grunted and fussed with the cuff of his long sleeve shirt. I'm not whining. I patted him gently on his shoulder. You sound like a little girl. He glared up at me but didn't complain. I motioned for Walt and Dell to come into the room. Walt hesitated by the door, but a firm shove from Dell had him moving into the room. Joey stared at Walt with annoyance and a mild hint of curiosity. I half hoped he'd look at Walt and see hints of his old friend, but I got nothing. And then Dell stepped into the room. Joey sat up straighter as his gaze settled on her face. His sour expression softened, and he blinked hard behind his thick glasses. Jenna? No, Joey, this is Dell Johnson. She's a relative of Jenna's. I'd let Walt and Dell define the relationship as I looked at them. Joey was good friends with Jenna and her fiancé, Walter. Walter and he served in the Marines together in Quantico and later in the South Pacific. They met Jenna at a USO dance in Alexandria. Walt looked stunned as if a hundred-pound sack of flour had fallen on his head. I knew the look and the sense of being hit by an emotional tsunami. I'd been there, been hit by the same rush of thoughts and feelings. Joey, why don't you tell Walt about the first time you met Jenna? I think he is very curious about her. Joey tore his gaze from Dell and zeroed in on Walt. How did you know Jenna? I never knew her. She died when I was a day old. He hesitated. She was my mother. Walt's voice broke under the weight of words he must have thought a million times but had never been able to say out loud. Dell smiled and laid a hand on his shoulder. My great-grandmother. Walt laid his hand over hers. And so Dell and Walt sat on chairs by Joey's wheelchair as I quietly backed out of the room to the sound of Joey saying, Walter and Jenna. 
would have loved you so much. By the time I returned to the bakery, I felt pretty good about myself. Jenna had to be pleased with me. She and Walt could rest in peace, knowing the loop between past and present had been closed. Their son knew he'd been loved and wanted even before he'd been born. Karma should have been grinning like a circus clown over the good deed I'd done. Karma should have been tossing a break my way. But, as my mom often said, karma could be a bitch. When I entered the bakery, I saw a man talking to Rachel. His dark hair brushed the collar of a worn leather jacket, and his worn jeans hugged well-muscled legs. However, Italian loafers gave him away as a man of means. Rachel's smile strained with tension as she glanced over his shoulder at me. Do you ever read your texts? No missing the frustration sharpening her words. I was busy. This gentleman is asking for you, but he won't tell me why. The man turned, and I recognized his angled, lean face and gray-blue eyes immediately. My appearance may have downgraded over the last five months, but his had improved. Roger. His gaze wandered from my face to my belly. So, it is true. The sense of goodwill I enjoyed seconds ago vanished. Outrage chainsawed into my composure. Do you think I send random emails out telling men they are the father of my baby for giggles? Rachel's mouth dropped open and her eyes widened. Her gaze shifted to Roger, as if seeing him for the first time, and then back to me. She cocked her head and mouthed, Really? I shrugged. One matter to talk about mistakes. It was another, to have one walk around. Unaware of Rachel, Roger shoved a hand in his pocket and rattled change. I'll expect a DNA test before I fork over a dime. I rubbed the tension banding the muscles at the base of my skull. Why aren't you in China? I've been back in New York for a couple of weeks. When I received your email, I thought I should see you myself so we could deal with this. Deal with this? Anger, sharp and hot, surged in my chest. How do you propose we deal with this? The steel reinforcing my words tugged Rachel out from behind the counter. If you attack from the front, I'll take the rear. Roger's head whipped around as if he'd forgotten Rachel. I came here in good faith. Good faith? I said. Sounds like you're worried. Roger stiffened. That won't be necessary. The thought of Roger having my baby on alternate weekends sent a chill through my veins, and I realized if I didn't get a handle on my temper, Roger would demand visitation out of spite. I shook my head. I told you about the baby because I thought you had a right to know. Beyond that, I don't want anything from you. Consider yourself off the hook. You don't want anything. Suspicion coupled with hope. Not a damn thing. I said, jaw clenched. Roger's stance relaxed, and he glanced toward the door. Unless, of course, the baby asks questions one day? Rachel added. Let's face it, Daisy. The baby is going to ask questions if she's like you. I'd been ready to toss Roger out of our lives forever. But Rachel was right. I could eject him out of my life, but I didn't have the right to make that decision for the baby. One day she might have questions, and she deserved answers. Roger shook his head. Once I have DNA confirmation, I will provide the genetic information you need so the child can answer whatever medical forms come its way. But I don't want a relationship with the child. I shook my head. I wasn't thinking you'd have a relationship with her. But one day, she might like to set eyes on you for her own peace of mind. He tugged at a monogrammed white cuff that peeked out from the leather jacket. I don't want any surprise visits. That could be unpleasant for all of us. 
He reached in the breast pocket of his jacket and pulled out neatly folded papers, extending them as if wielding a knife. My fingers curled into fists. What's this? I've had papers drawn up. I've agreed to terminate parental rights in exchange for a cash payout. Outrage curdled in my belly. You said you wanted DNA testing. He hesitated. He was a jerk, but he knew me well enough that I didn't cry wolf. I want this over and done with. I don't want your money. He jabbed the papers toward me. Don't you want to see how much I'm offering? No. He arched a brow. Money is your driving force, Daisy. That might have been true for the Daisy he'd known. Now it was the kid and the bakery that drove me. I sign the papers and you go away. Like I never happened. So tempting to wash away an old mistake that still made me cringe when I remembered. His lips curled, a conspirator's smirk. Sign them, Daisy. It's what you want. Signing would clear the way for Gordon. Without Roger in the picture, we could forge our own lives with the baby. Oh, but that vision tempted. However, as much as I wanted Roger to vanish, I didn't have the right to rewrite the kid's history. Rachel huffed in a breath. I can kill him now if you want me to, Daisy. We can cut him up and bake him in a pie. Her protective fire jostled loose a smile. Not necessary, Rachel. I'm used to Roger. I understand his tactics. I snatched the papers from him, moved to the counter and grabbed a pen. A scan of the document revealed a cut-and-dry, bloodless agreement. So, Roger. I crossed out the cash settlement paragraph and wrote in a paragraph that demanded he supply all family medical history and meet with the child at a meeting to be determined by the child. I signed my name and handed him the duplicate copy. He glanced at my changes. Initial, and we are done, I said. He removed a Mont Blanc pen from his jacket pocket, initialed the changes, and handed me back my copy. We are done. We are done. But I can't and won't make promises for the future kid. If he or she wants a meet and greet, you will honor it. He frowned. I don't want any nasty surprises. It won't be up to me. It's up to the kid. I clutched the pen in my fingers and resisted the urge to throw it after him. His jaw ticked as it did when he was angry, but he didn't say another word. He realized he was off the hook for a couple of decades and opted to leave. Italian loafers clicked against the floor as he crossed the room, jerked open the door, and left. What an ass! Rachel said, coming around the counter. How could you ever have slept with that? I smoothed a trembling hand over my head. We're all capable of stupid behavior, if you dial up the right combination. In my case, the perfect combination included too many glasses of wine, job loss, and thoughts of moving back here. Rachel's brow furrowed. I don't think the last bit really made you have sex with that. It was the wine. I wished I could have blamed it all on the wine. Coming back here felt like the ultimate failure, Rachel. I was back at ground zero, and it scared the hell out of me. She cocked her head, her eyes sharp with worry. It's not such a scary place anymore. A sigh shuddered past my lips. No, not so scary. She leaned a little closer to me and nudged me with her elbow. And you must admit the bakery has its moments? A smile tugged at the corner of my lips. There were one, two, okay, maybe three good moments. Laughing, she punched me in the shoulder. You love us. Admit it. You would be lost without us. Six months ago, I could have denied the claim easily, honestly. Now, I couldn't. Maybe. Maybe my ass. 
Rachel, I said, laughing, you said a bad word. Yeah, we'll get used to it. The nice Rachel is on vacation. What happened to her? I sent her away. Not forever. Don't be looking for her anymore. She glanced past me through the window toward Gordon's shop. Trouble. What? We hurried to the window in time to see Gordon throwing Roger out of his bike shop. Roger stumbled and fell to the curb. We hustled outside, the front doorbells jangling like an early warning system. Why would Roger go to Gordon's shop? Rachel said. There was a time when they were best pals. They had a falling out about two years ago. I never found out why, but knew they shared bad blood. He must have heard about the bike shop and stopped by to gloat. As I saw Gordon advance on Roger, his fists clenched, I hurried toward the bike shop. Gordon, what are you doing? Gordon glanced up at me, his face flushed with rage, throwing out the trash. Roger scrambled to his feet, scuffing his Italian loafers. What the hell is wrong with you, Gordon? Gordon glared at Roger, his teeth bearing a smile reminiscent of a lion right before he pounced. Remember what I said, Roger. Remember. Roger paled as he hustled to his feet. Shit. I don't know why you were defending her. I thought you finished with her months ago. Gordon advanced another step toward Roger, who quickly hustled back several steps. Stay away, Gordon. I don't want trouble. Of course you do, Gordon said. If you didn't, you'd have handled this long distance. I'm trying to be civil, Roger shouted. I'm trying not to rip your damn head off, Roger. Roger cursed and then, digging keys from his pocket, turned and jogged toward a black BMW. The engine fired and seconds later the car zoomed off. Roger's wheels squealed as he rounded a corner and I went to Gordon. What did you say to him? Gordon, a bit breathless, puffed out his chest like a lion defending his territory. It doesn't matter. Looking at Gordon, so angry and huffy at this moment, made me weak in the knees with love. Unshed tears burned in my throat, and it took all my self-control not to hug him close. He glared at me. Damn, Daisy! What did you see in that guy? That's what I said, Rachel offered. I'd been so distracted by Roger and Gordon, she'd slipped from my mind. It was a very, very bad call, I shouted, throwing my arms up in the air. I get Roger is an ass, I get that. But my kid has his DNA, so I'm stuck with his biological history. A few folks on the street stopped to stare. I glared back at them, knowing full well it made me look all the more crazed. When they turned and kept walking... I shifted all my attention back to Gordon. I'm sorry. He's not going to throw any trouble your way, Gordon said. He signed away parental rights, I said. Gordon frowned, just like that. He came with the papers in hand. I explained about my contract revisions. Gordon shook his head. If he falls short on the biological history crap, I want to know about it. Understood? I didn't know what kind of threat Gordon had made to Roger, but suspected it was a whopper. Roger didn't scare easily. And it was kind of Neanderthal for Gordon to insinuate himself into my mess, but it was also so sweet and hot. I'd hardly seen Gordon in the last week and barely touched him in the last couple of weeks, but I couldn't resist any more. I closed the distance between us, and without a thought to right or wrong, good or bad, or appropriate or inappropriate, I cupped his face in my hands and I kissed him on the lips. His hand went to my waist and he kissed me back. That was hot, I said. He grinned. I like to think I still have the moves. Oh, you do. I kissed him again. Thanks. 
He drew in a breath. For a long moment he stared into my eyes. He traced my jawline with a calloused finger. Daisy, will you marry me? My heart stopped, somersaulted, before resuming a racing pace. What? Will you marry me? he said. I'd always been careful never to want too much. I understood the danger of hope. I come with baggage. He squeezed my hand. Don't we all? Don't we all? His energy pulled me toward a breathless yes, but still I resisted. What about the baby? I'll legally adopt her so all she'll ever need from Cheese Dick is DNA information. Are you sure, Gordon? I still didn't understand the ramifications of parenthood, which meant Gordon sure did not. This is a game-changer. I know. No hesitation blinked warnings from his gaze. He had the determination of a cyclist barreling down a hill at thirty miles an hour, excitement thrumming in his veins but it's a change I want. Warmth spread up through me, and I couldn't stem the tide of emotions rushing. Yes, Gordon Singletary, I will marry you. Rachel clapped her hands. This is so cool. Epilogue December 20 Last day before end-of-the-year closing Income profit, $19,243. Jingle bells chimed on the radio, but I wasn't feeling very festive. The kid rested heavy and low in my belly, and Rachel and I had at least a couple more hours of packaging frozen cookie dough and pie orders that had come in from our website last night. The frozen dough had become more popular than we'd ever expected. The pies were a sensation. A good problem to have, as my mother said over and over. And yes, it was a good problem. The bakery had been running in the black for two months straight, and we'd set up a rainy day fund. All good. And it would be perfect if the kid would get off my bladder. She'd been doing somersaults on it for the last hour, and I spent half my days now in the bathroom. My back also ached as if a herd of mules had kicked it. Daisy, Rachel called out as she loaded another mail package in the bin that Dad would take to the post office in thirty minutes. You need to get off your feet. That kid is practically waving at me. I pressed my fist into my back. If we could finish this load, we will be done for the holidays. Years ago, Dad had closed the bakery between Christmas and New Year's using the time to regroup with the family and for him to clean the bakery from top to bottom. If I could hold on another hour, I'd have reached the finish line, and I could deliver this kid in peace. The front doorbells jingled, and I glanced over my shoulder. We are closed. I locked the door, I grumbled. It's Gordon, Rachel said. I glared at Rachel as I placed a USB sticker on a frozen dough order and loaded it into a box. You called him. On cue, Gordon pushed through the swinging saloon door. I told her to call me if you stayed on your feet. Before I could grumble, he kissed me on the lips. We are almost done, I said. He smelled of soap and bike oil and being close to him soothed my seething blood pressure. No, you are now done. He blocked me from reaching for the next bag of dough and roll of stickers. Gordon and I had married in mid-October, on a sunny afternoon under a tree by the Potomac River. My sisters had been there, Mom and Dad and the girls. Gordon's parents had also been present, as well as his brother Scott. I'd worn a simple white dress with an empire waist and carried a bouquet of red roses. Rachel had made a stunning wedding cake we'd cut back at the bakery and enjoyed with a toast of ginger ale. I'd moved into the small apartment above Gordon's bike shop, trading one attic apartment for a second-floor loft apartment. As I'd cut back in the last week, 
Rachel had really stepped up. She'd done preliminary site visits to several locations where we'd consider moving our dough-making operation. We'd had several good offers to rent, but she'd insisted we hold out for better prices. She turned into one tough negotiator. As I opened my mouth to argue, my stomach cramped and water trickled down my legs. My first thought wasn't for the kid, but the health department. Spilling amniotic fluid had to be a code violation. Gordon froze and blinked. Like most men, he realized he had tripped into the dark and scary world of the feminine and the unknown. Rachel, however, knew exactly what to do. Gordon, where is your car? He hesitated for a moment as we looked at each other, stunned and unsure. In the alley, right where you told me to keep it. Good. Daisy, where is your bag? She tugged off her apron and reached for the cell clipped to her waistband. My gaze darted to the puddle at my feet and back up to Gordon's face. Damn. Oh, my God. Daisy! Rachel snapped as she opened the phone. Bag. In the car, I muttered. Rachel snapped her fingers and pointed to the back door. Gordon, put Daisy in the car. Go to the hospital. She treated us like errant puppies. Go, stop, sit. But we were grateful for the direction. In this area, Rachel was the expert. Mom, Rachel said into the phone. Baby's coming. Is Margaret headed back to town? Good. Tell her to go straight to the hospital. Gordon and I remained rooted in our spots when Rachel glared at us. Go. Now. And so Gordon and I stumbled out of the back door of the bakery kitchen and into his waiting truck. I didn't remember the drive to the hospital. I did remember the back labor, which grew in intensity with each passing moment. I remembered how the car bumped on the city's ancient cobblestone roads. We arrived at the emergency room in the late afternoon, and I was put in a room where I changed out of my apron, jeans, and T-shirt and into a gown. The nurse gave Gordon a green scrub that read Dad on the back. When I read the letters, tears welled in my eyes. Gordon had already officially adopted the baby, and as far as I was concerned, we were a family. We would one day explain to our child about genetics and bloodlines and what makes a parent. Terry had sent me an email two weeks ago. It had been brief and to the point. Thinking of you and your baby. I'd taken them as gushing words of love from Terry, who was offering what she could. She was trying. And that was enough. As my parents, nieces, and sisters gathered in the lobby, a nurse did a quick exam and determined that the baby was breech, stuck, ass first, my kid. A C-section was ordered, and within an hour I lay on a table, my belly curtained off, with Gordon sitting by my head. He stroked my hair as he clutched the video camera, ready to stand and film the birth. You don't like blood, I said. He smiled and turned on his camera. It shouldn't be too bad. I was about to launch into a description of a YouTube video I'd seen on C-sections when the doctor entered the room and moved to the table, gowned, gloved, and masked. I hear baby Singletary is being difficult. Just like her mother, I said. Walter Gordon Singletary arrived into the world twenty-one minutes later. Wailing and highly insulted, we disturbed his routine. He was perfect. This concludes Sweet Expectations by Mary Ellen Taylor. Narrated by Susan Boyce.